Section 1. The Handy Cyclopedia of Things Worth Knowing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Handy Cyclopedia of Things Worth Knowing by Joseph Trenans. A Manual of Ready Reference covering especially such information of everyday use as is often hardest to find when most needed. Inquire within about everything. For Alphabetical Index, see page 277. Chicago, Albert J. Dubois, 1911. Copyright 1911 by Joseph Trenans. To Our Patrons. This little book is presented to you to evidence our appreciation of your patronage. We trust you will examine its contents closely, for you will find within its covers many things that will prove entertaining, instructive, and useful. It is new and up-to-date, and has been expressly compiled for our patrons. Only matter of real interest and value has been included in its pages. It is a general experience that answers to those questions which arise most often in everyday life are hardest to find. Information on practical subjects is usually just beyond your reach when it is most desired. You will use this little book every day when you want to know. It is equally valuable to all classes, men as well as women, to workers generally as well as people of leisure. It is the book for the busy housekeeper as well as the woman of fashion. We shall feel amply repaid for the painstaking labor, care, and expense which we have bestowed upon this little volume, if its constant utility to you more firmly cements your good will to our establishment. Just a few words about the advertisements. They are from concerns of established reputation, whose products we freely recommend with full confidence that they are the best of their respective kinds. The index to the advertising section is on pages 5 and 6. Sincerely yours, The Central Drug Company. Index to Advertisements Abilena Mineral Water Albany Chemical Company Alita Hair Tonic Alexander's Asthma Remedy Allen's Cough Balsam Ankle Supports Arch Cushions Astyptodyne Athlophorus Australian Eucalyptus Globulus Oil Bath Cabinets Blair's Pills Bloodberry Gum Bloom of Youth Blue Ribbon Gum Blush of Roses Bonheim's Shaving Cream Borax Pacific Coast Borden's Malted Milk Brown's Asthma Remedy Brown's Liquid Dressing Brown's Wonder Face Cream Brown's Wonder Salve Brian's Asthma Remedy Buffalo Lithia Springs Water Buffers Nail Burnishine Byron's Corn Cure Byron's Instant Relief Cabler's W.P. Root Juice Calder's Dentine Carmichael's Gray Hair Restorer Carmichael's Hair Tonic Celery Vess Chavit Diphtheria Preventative Shavit Solus Chocolates and Bonbons Coe's Cough Balsam Consumer's Company Corsets Coupons Crane's Lotion Crown Headache Powders Daisy Fly Killer Dead Stuck for Bugs Delatone Denos Food Digesto Dissolving Rubber Garments Down's Obesity Reducer Drosis DuPont's Hair Restorative Dyspepsia Remedy, Grams Elastic Stockings El Perfecto Vida Rose Rouge Empress Hair Color Restorer Empress Shampoo Soap Yucca Centol Femiform Cones Golden Remedy for Epilepsy Golden Rule Hair Restorative Goodwin's Corn Salve Goodwin's Foot Powder Gowan's Pneumonia Preparation Graves Doctor Tooth Powder Gray's Ointment Great Western Champagne Groob's Corn Remover Guild's Asthma Cure 
Harvard Athletic Supports. Heel Cushions. Hegemon's Camphor Ice. Hill's Chloride of Gold Tablets. Hoig's Doctor, Cell Tissue Tonic. Hollister's Rocky Mountain Tea. Hot Water Bottles. Hydrox Chemical Company. Hygia Nursing Bottles. I. D. Light. Irondequat Port Wine. Jetum. Juckets, Doctor, Salve. Carath. Kellogg's Asthma Remedy. Knickerbocker Spray Brushes. Condon's Catarrhal Jelly. Cumis, Arend Adamic. Lemke's, Doctor, Golden Electric Liniment. Lemke's, Doctor, Laxative Herb Tea. Lemke's, Doctor, St. Johannes Drops. Leslie Safety Razors. Louisenbad Reduction Salt. Lune de Miel Perfume. Lusterite Toilet Specialties. Luxtone Toilet Preparations. Mando Depilatory. Manicure Goods. Mare's Cough Balsam. Martell's Doctor Female Pills. Marvel Syringes. Mare's Stomach Remedy. Meehan's Razor Stropper. May's Poultice. Mixer Medicine Company. Mount Clemens Bitter Water. Musterol. Nardine. New Bachelor Cigars. Noblesse Toilet Preparations. Obesity Gavic Tablets. Obesity Reducer Downs. Olive Oil. Orange Blossom. Orangine. Ordway Dr. D.P. Plasters. Oriental Cream. Orthopedic Apparatus. Palmer's Perfumes. Paracamp. Peckham's Croup Remedy. Perry Davis Painkiller. Physiological Tonicum. Pinus Medicine Company. Piso's Remedy. Plantons Capsules. Plexo Toilet Cream. Poland Water. Pozoni's Complexion Powder. Queen Bess Perfume. Rat Knox. Razor Stropper Means. Razors. Rex Bitters. Riker's Tooth Powder. Rochine. Rossman's Pile Cure. Saliodin. Salted Peanuts. Salubrin. Samurai Perfumes. Sandholm Skin Lotion. Sanford's Inks. Sanita's Disinfectant. Scheffler's Hair Chlorine. Seguin et C. Sharp and Smith. Shoes for the Lame. Shoulder Braces. Simplex Vaporizers. Skidoo Soap. Soaps Stifles Medicinal. Solo Rye. Sorority Girl Toilet Requisites. Sponges. Stifles Medicinal Soaps. St. Jacob's Oil. Strong's Arnica Jelly. Strong's Arnica Tooth Soap. Sweet Babi Nursing Bottle. Tailoring for Men. Tanglefoot Fly Paper. Toilet Paper. Toilet Brushes. Typewriters. Tyrell's Hygienic Institute. Via Capras Mineral Water. Virgin Oil of Pine. Whittemore's Polishes. Wright's Catarrhal Balm. Wright's Rheumatic Remedy. Young's Victoria Cream. End of section one. Section two of The Handy Cyclopedia of Things Worth Knowing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. The Handy Cyclopedia of Things Worth Knowing by Joseph Trainens, published in 1911. Section 2. Social Forms. Manners and Customs of Good Society. Etiquette of Courtship and Marriage. It is a growing custom in America not to announce an engagement until the date of the marriage is approximately settled. Long engagements are irksome to both man and woman, and a man is generally not supposed to ask a girl to marry him 
until he is able to provide a home for her. This, however, does not prevent long friendships between young couples, or a sentimental understanding growing up between them, and it is during this period that they learn to know each other, and find out if they are suited for a life's partnership. When a young man goes a-courting, it generally means that he has some particular girl in mind whom he has singled out as the object of his devotion. A man a-courting is generally on his best behaviour, and many a happily married wife looks back on her courting days as the most delightful of her life. At that time the woman is the object of a devotion to which she has as yet conceded nothing. She is still at liberty to weigh and choose, to compare her lover to other men, while the knowledge that she is the ultimate girl that some man is trying to win gives her a pretty sense of self-importance, and a feeling that she has come into the heritage of womanhood. Whether it is one of the fictions about courtship or not, it is generally assumed that a young woman is longer in making up her mind than is the young man. When a man finds the right girl he is pretty apt to know it, and it is his business then to start out and persuade her to his point of view. Neither willing nor reluctant is the attitude of the young girl. GIFTS AND ATTENTION just what attention a man is privileged to show a young woman to whom he is not engaged, and yet to whom he wishes to express his devotion, is a point a little difficult to define. If she is a bookish girl, she will be pleased with gifts of books, or the suggestion that they may read the same books, so they may talk them over together. She will probably feel complimented if a man discusses with her his business affairs, and the problems that are interesting men in their life-work. When a man begins to call often and regularly on a girl, it is best to have some topic of conversation, aside from personalities. When a man is led to spend more money than he can afford in entertaining a girl, it is a bad preparation for matrimony. Courtship is a time when a man desires to bring gifts, and it is quite right and fitting that he should do so within reasonable limits. A girl of refined feelings does not like to accept valuable presents from a man at this period of their acquaintance. Flowers, books, music, if the girl plays or sings, and boxes of candy are always permissible offerings which neither engage the man who offers them, nor the girl who receives them. This is the time when a man invites a girl to the theatre, to concerts and lectures, and may offer to escort her to church. The pleasure of her society is supposed to be a full return for the trouble and expense incurred in showing these small attentions. THE CLAIMS OF COMPANIONSHIP A man cannot justly complain if a girl accepts similar favours from other men, for until he has proposed and been accepted, he has no claim on her undivided companionship. An attitude of proprietorship on his part, particularly if it is exercised in public, is as bad manners as it is unwise, and a high-spirited girl, although she may find her feelings becoming engaged, is prone to resent it. It should be remembered that a man is free to cease his attentions, and until he has finally surrendered his liberty, he should not expect her to devote all her time to him. At this period it is a wise man who makes a friend of a girl's mother, and if he does this he will generally be repaid in a twofold manner. No matter how willful a girl may be, her mother's opinion of her friends always has weight with her. Moreover, what the mother is, the girl will in all probability become, and a man has no better opportunity of learning a girl's mental and moral qualities than by knowing the woman who bore and reared her. ENGAGEMENT AND WEDDING RINGS The form and material of the mystic ring of marriage change but little, and innovations on the plain gold band are rarely successful. The very broad flat band is now out of date, and replaced by a much narrower ring, sufficiently thick, however, to stand the usage of a lifetime. 
it is generally engraved on the concealed side with the initials of the giver and the date of the marriage the gold in the ring should be as pure as possible and the colour which depends on the alloy used should be unobtrusive the pale gold being better liked now than the red gold many women never remove their wedding ring after it has been put on and believe it is bad luck to do so there is but one choice for an engagement ring a solitaire diamond and clusters or coloured stones are not considered in this connection as after the wedding the engagement ring is used as a guard to the wedding ring it should be as handsome as possible and a small pure stone is a far better choice than a more showy one that may be a little off in colour or possess a flaw correct form in jewellery on the wedding day the groom often makes the bride a wedding present of some piece of jewellery and if this is to be worn during the ceremony it should consist of white stones in a thin gold or platinum setting such as a pendant bracelet or pin of pearls and diamonds if a coloured stone is preferred and a turquoise for instance adds the touch of blue which is supposed to bring a bride good luck it should be concealed inside the dress during the services as a memento of the event a groom often presents his ushers with a scarf pin or watch or cigarette case ornamented with the initials of the bride and groom and the bride generally makes a similar present to her bridesmaids of some dainty piece of jewellery whether this takes the form of a pin bracelet or one of the novelties that up-to-date jewellers are always showing it should be the best of its kind imitation stones or silver gilt have no place as wedding gifts wedding customs there is no time in a woman's life when ceremonies seem so important as when a wedding in the family is imminent whether the wedding is to be a simple home ceremony or an elaborate church affair followed by a reception the formalities which etiquette prescribes for these functions should be carefully studied and followed only by doing so can there be the proper dignity and above all the absence of confusion that should mark the most important episode in the life of a man or a woman wedding customs have undergone some changes of late years mostly in the direction of simplicity meaningless display and ostentation should be avoided and if a girl is marrying into a family much better endowed in worldly goods than her own she should have no false pride in insisting on simple festivities and in preventing her family from incurring expense that they cannot afford the entire expenses of a wedding with the exception of the clergyman's fee and the carriage which takes the bride and groom away for their honeymoon are met by the bride's family and there is no worse impropriety than in allowing the groom to meet or share any of these obligations rather than allow this a girl would show more self-respect in choosing to do away with the social side of the function and be content with the marriage ceremony read by her clergyman under his own roof invitations and announcements in the case of a private wedding announcement cards should be mailed the following day to all relatives and acquaintances of both the contracting parties evening weddings are no longer the custom and the fashionable hour is now high noon although in many cases three o'clock in the afternoon is the hour chosen whether the wedding is to be followed by a reception or not the invitations to it should be sent out not less than two weeks before the event and these should be promptly accepted or declined by those receiving them the acceptance of a wedding invitation by no means implies that the recipient is obliged to give a present these are only expected of relatives and near friends of the bride and groom and in all cases the presents should be addressed and sent to the bride who should acknowledge them by a prettily worded note of thanks as soon as the gifts are received or at the latest a few days after the marriage ceremony silver and linen the usual rule followed in the engraving of silver or the marking of linen is to use the initials of the bride's maiden name 
the question of duplicate gifts is as annoying to the sender as it is to the young couple who are ultimately to enjoy the gifts. Theoretically, it is bad form to exchange a gift after it has been received, but, in truth, this is often done when a great deal of silver is given by close friends or members of the family. It is a comparatively easy matter to find out what has already been sent, and to learn the bride's wishes in this matter. Prenuptial Functions After the wedding invitations are out, it is not customary for a girl to attend any social functions, or to be much seen in public. This gives her the necessary time to devote to the finishing of her trousseau, and for making any necessary arrangements for the new life she is to take up after the honeymoon is over. Family dinners are quite proper at this time, and it is expected of her to give a lunch to her bridesmaids. The wedding presents may be shown at this occasion, but any more public and general display of them is now rarely indulged in, and is, in fact, not considered in good taste. The groom, as a prenuptial celebration, is supposed to give a supper to his intimate bachelor friends, and the men who are to act as ushers at the marriage ceremony. The ushers are generally recruited from the friends of the groom, rather than those of the bride, but if she has a grown brother he is always asked to act in this capacity. Ushers, like bridesmaids, are chosen among the unmarried friends of the young couple, although a matron of honour is often included in the bridal party. THE BRIDE'S TROUSSEAU The bride's trousseau should be finished well before the fortnight preceding the wedding. Fashions change so quickly now that it is rarely advisable for a bride to provide gowns for more than a season ahead. If the cheque her father furnishes her for her trousseau is a generous one, it is a wise provision to put a part of it aside for later use, and in so doing she has the equivalent of a wardrobe that will last her for a year or more. Custom has decreed that the bride's wedding dress shall be of pure white, and, as the marriage ceremony is a religious one, whether it takes place in a church or in a private house, that it shall be made high in the neck and with long sleeves. Orange blossoms, the natural flowers, form the trimming to the corsage and a coronet to fasten the veil. A bride's ornaments include only one gift of white jewellery, pearls or diamonds, from her future husband, and the bouquet he presents her. So many awkward moments have been occasioned in wedding ceremonies by removing the glove that brides are dispensing with wearing gloves at this time. The bride's appearance is by no means affected by this custom, and the slipping of the ring on the third finger of the left hand is made simpler, and thereby more graceful. The engagement ring, which up to the time of the wedding ceremony has been worn on this finger, afterwards serves as a guard for the wedding ring. THE BRIDESMAIDS Millinery is a most important question in discussing a wedding, and we cannot dismiss the question with the gown worn by the bride. A most serious consideration is what the bridesmaids are to wear, and this is generally only settled after long and serious consultation with the bride. It is generally agreed that all of these gowns shall be made by the same dressmaker, so that they may conform to the colours and styles decided on, the gown of the maid or matron of honour differing slightly from the general scheme. At a church wedding bridesmaids wear hats and carry baskets or bouquets of flowers, but if bouquets are carried they should be quite unlike the one borne by the bride. It is customary for the bride to give her bridesmaids some souvenir of the occasion, and it is expected that the groom provide the gloves and ties for the ushers. DUTIES OF THE BEST MAN The duties of the best man are arduous, and it is indeed wise, as it is general, for a man to ask his best and most devoted friend to serve in this capacity. The best man is supposed to relieve the groom of all the details of the ceremony, and to take on his shoulders all the worry incident to its success as a social function. 
It is he who purchases the gloves and ties for the other ushers, and sees that they are coached in their duties. He procures the marriage license, if that is necessary, and has the ring ready for the groom at the critical moment. After the ceremony he is supposed to hand the clergyman his fee, and at the same time be in readiness to conduct the line of bridesmaids and ushers to their carriages. He must be at the bride's home, in case there is a wedding reception, before the principal actors in the ceremony are there. It is he who sends the notices of the event to the newspapers, and, if there is a formal breakfast with speech-making, it is the best man who proposes the health of the newly married pair, and replies to the toast in behalf of the bridesmaids. He is the one member of the wedding party who sees the happy couple off at the station, and bids them the last farewell as they depart on their honeymoon. This is perhaps the time and moment when his good sense and social tact is the most needed. The foolish custom of decorating bridal baggage with white ribbon, and of throwing a superabundance of old shoes and a rain of rice after the departing pair, may be mitigated by a little care on his part. End of section two. Read by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org, on January 5th, 2007, in Oceanside, California. Section 3 of The Handy Cyclopedia of Things Worth Knowing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Handy Cyclopedia of Things Worth Knowing by Joseph Trenans. Published in 1911. Section 3. Morning Customs There has been of late years a healthy revolt against the excessive use of crepe or the wearing of mourning for an undue period. Mourning is first of all a protection, for in these busy days and in a large city a death affecting our acquaintances is not always known to us. If we meet a friend wearing black we are instantly apprised that she has suffered the loss of a near member of her family. It is easy to say under such circumstances, I am very sorry to see you in black, or I am afraid I have not heard of your loss. For a father or mother, full mourning, that is, black unrelieved by any touch of white, is worn for a year, and at the end of that period, half mourning, consisting first of white with black, and then violet and grey, is worn for the second year. For a brother or sister or grandparent, black is worn for six months, and then half mourning for the six months preceding the wearing of ordinary colours. What is called complementary mourning, put on at the death of a relative by marriage, consists of the wearing of black for a period of from six weeks to a year, depending on the closeness of the personal relationship. For instance, in the case of the death of a mother-in-law residing in a distant city, it would only be necessary for a woman to wear black for a few weeks following the funeral. If, on the other hand, she resides in the same place, and is a great deal in the company of her husband's family, it would show more tact and affection on her part to refrain from wearing colours for a longer period. Crepe is no longer obligatory in even first mourning. Many widows only wear the crepe-bordered veil hanging from the conventional bonnet for the funeral services and for a few weeks afterward, when it is replaced by an ordinary hat and veil of plain black net bordered with thin black silk. Widows wear neck and cuff bands of unstarched white book muslin, this being the only sort of white permitted during the first period of mourning. Young widows, especially those who must lead an active life, often lighten their mourning during the second year and discard it at the end of the second year. 
Of course, the conventional period of mourning for a widow is three years, but if there should be any indication that a second marriage is contemplated, black should gradually be put aside. However, the discarding of mourning is no indication that a woman is about to change her name, and the wearing of black is so much a matter of personal feeling that a woman should not be criticised for curtailing the conventional period. In this country it is not the custom for young children to wear mourning, and with men the wearing of a black band about the hat or on the left arm is all that is deemed necessary. A woman wearing full mourning refrains from attending the theatre or any large functions. She may properly be seen at concerts, club meetings or lectures, and she may receive and visit her friends informally. Etiquette of the visiting card. The prevailing shape for a woman's card is nearly square, about two and one half by three inches, while the correct form for a man's card is slightly smaller. The colour should be pure white with a dull finish, while the engraving, plain script or more elaborate text, is a matter of choice and fashion varying from time to time. It is safe to trust the opinion of a first-class stationer in this matter, for styles fluctuate and he should be constantly informed of what polite usage demands. A woman's card should always bear the prefix Miss or Mrs. There is no exception to this rule save in the case of women who have regularly graduated in medicine or theology, and who are allowed, therefore, the use of doctor or reverend before the name. Miss or Mrs. should not be used in addition to either of these titles. The card of a married woman is engraved with her husband's full name, such as Mrs. William Eaton Brown, but she has no right to any titles he may bear. If he is a judge or colonel, she is still Mrs. James Eaton Brown, and not Mrs. Judge or Mrs. Colonel Brown. A widow may, with propriety, retain the same visiting card that she used during the lifetime of her husband, especially if she has no grown son who bears his father's name. In that case, she generally has her cards engraved with a part of her full maiden name before her husband's name, such as Mrs. Mary Baker Brown. In this country, a divorced woman, if she has children, does not discard her husband's family name, neither does she retain his given name. For social purposes, she becomes Mrs. Mary Baker Brown, or, if she wishes, Mrs. Baker Brown. The address is engraved in the lower right corner of the visiting card, and, if a woman has any particular day for receiving her friends, that fact is announced in the lower left corner. As a rule, even informal notes should not be written on a visiting card, although when a card accompanies a gift it is quite proper to write best wishes or greetings on it. This is even done when a card does not accompany a gift, but it should be borne in mind that a card message should not take the place of a note of thanks or be used when a more formal letter is necessary. A man's visiting card should bear his full name with the prefix Mr, unless he has a military title above the grade of lieutenant or is a doctor or clergyman. In these cases, the proper title should be used in place of Mr. Courtesy titles, although they may be common usage in conversation and a man may be known by them, are best abandoned on the visiting card. During the first year of marriage, cards are engraved thus, Mr. and Mrs. William Eaton Brown, and this card may be used in sending presents, returning wedding civilities, or making calls, even when the bride is not accompanied by her husband. After the first year, these cards are discarded, and husband and wife have separate visiting cards. In some communities, it is not the custom for a young girl to make formal calls without her mother. To meet this requirement, the girl's name, with the prefix Miss, is engraved on her mother's card below her mother's name. It is no longer considered necessary to leave a number of cards at the same house when calling in person or sending cards. If there are several women members of the family, one card suffices. If a woman wishes to leave her husband's card, she should leave two, one for the mistress and one for the man of the house. 
A woman never leaves a card for a man unless she has called on him on a matter of business and wishes him to be reminded of the fact. At a tea or large afternoon reception, a card should be left in the hall as a guest departs so as to enable the hostess to preserve a record of those who have called on her. If she is not able to attend, she should send her visiting card so that it may arrive on the day of the function. After a dinner, or any formal function, she should make a personal call or leave her card in person. When making an ordinary call, it is not necessary to send one's visiting card to the hostess by the servant who opens the door. Pronouncing the name distinctly is sufficient, but if it is a first call and there is danger that the hostess may not be familiar with the caller's address, it is best to leave a card on the hall table when leaving, no matter if the hostess herself conducts her visitor to the door. When one is invited but unable to attend a church wedding, it is necessary to send, on the day of the ceremony, cards to those who issue the invitations. An invitation to a wedding reception or breakfast demands a more formal acceptance sent immediately on receipt of the invitation and couched in the same manner in which the invitation reads. A newcomer in town, or a young married woman, may receive a card from an older woman, indicating her receiving days and hours. This is a polite invitation to call, and if she is unable to make a call at the time indicated, she should send a card on that day. Cards of condolence are left as soon as possible after learning of the affliction. It is not necessary to write anything on the card. In fact, it is better not to do so, for, if the acquaintance warrants a personal message, it should take the form of a letter. On the other hand, it is quite proper in felicitating a friend on a happy event, such as the announcement of an engagement in the family, or the arrival of a new baby, to send a visiting card with congratulations written on it. There are times when it seems necessary to send cards to practically all one's acquaintances. This is wise after a long absence or a change of residence, and when one is leaving town for a long period it is proper to send cards with the French expression pour prendre congé. Formalities in dress and etiquette. Costly thy habit as thy purse can buy, was old Polonius's address to his son, and he counselled suitability as well. It is this question of suitability that is the hallmark of correct dressing. A safe rule to follow, especially in the case of a young woman, is not to be conspicuous in attire, and to conform to the standards of dress as set down by older women of recognised standing in the town in which she lives and the community in which her social or business life is spent. A young girl needs little adorning. Her school or college dresses should be characterised by their neatness, freshness, correctness of cut and utility rather than by elaborate trimmings or costly materials. Her party gowns are simpler than those of a girl who has left school, and she wears less jewellery. The end of school life, if her parents are able and willing to give her a coming out party, she begins her social career under the pleasantest auspices, and this is the opportunity for her first elaborate gown. The debutante. The character of this gown depends largely on the nature of the entertainment given her. It most commonly takes the form of an afternoon tea or reception to which her mother invites all of her friends as well as the younger set. The debutante receives with her mother and wears an elaborate frock of light material and colour made high in the neck and with elbow sleeves. Long white gloves are worn and her hair is more elaborately arranged than it was during her schoolgirl period. In fact, she is now a full-fledged young lady and is dressed accordingly. Such a gown may serve later as an informal evening gown or, if it is made with a detachable yoke, it may be worn as a dancing frock or for any evening occasion for which a full evening gown is expected. The receiving party at an afternoon function generally includes near relatives of the debutante and a number of her intimate girlfriends are asked to assist in various ways. 
these receive with her and her mother in the early part of the afternoon, and later assist at the tea-table, or mingle among the guests. The ladies assisting do not wear hats, and the young girls in the party are gowned much like the debutante, except that their gowns may be less elaborate if they choose, and they do not carry flowers. A popular girl, or one with many family connections, may count on a good many floral offerings on the occasion of her coming out party. These are scattered about the room, either left in bunches or arranged in vases. One large bunch she generally carries in her left hand, and it is a wise girl who avoids singling out any one of her men friends by carrying his flowers. A gift from her father or brother, or the flowers sent by some friend of the family, is the better choice. The success a girl makes during her first year in society depends more on her general popularity than on the devotion of any one man. Afternoon Reception For an afternoon reception, light refreshments, consisting of tea, coffee, chocolate, perhaps a light claret cup, with cakes and delicate sandwiches, are sufficient, and these are set out on a long table in a room adjoining the reception parlours. If a large number of guests are expected, it is necessary to have a maid or two in attendance to remove cups and saucers, keep the tea urn replenished with hot water, and bring additional cakes and sandwiches if the supply on the table is in danger of running short. Two women friends are generally asked to preside at the refreshment table, one at each end to pour tea and chocolate, and, as this task is an arduous one, and much of the success of the entertainment depends on its being well done, it is advisable to relieve the ladies in charge during the afternoon. This, however, like every other feature of the entertainment, should be arranged beforehand. The charm of an afternoon reception lies in its apparent informality but every detail should be considered in advance, and all contingencies provided for. The debutante, and especially her mother, should be relieved from all such responsibilities before the guests begin to come. The mother's duties consist in welcoming her guests and presenting her daughter to them. If many people are arriving, the guests are quickly passed on to some one of the ladies assisting, whose duty it is to see that they meet some of those who are already in the room and are eventually asked to the tea-table. A part of the receiving party, and certainly the hostess and her daughter, should remain together in a place where they may be easily found as the guests enter the room. No more sympathetic act of friendship can be shown a debutante than to contribute toward the success of her party. Girls who are asked to assist should remember that their first duty is not to entertain their own friends, who may happen to be present, but to see that everyone is welcome, and that especially those who are not acquainted with many in the room have an opportunity to become so. Anyone asked to assist at a function of this sort is, in a sense, a hostess, and it is quite within her province to enter into conversation with any unoccupied guest, whether she has been introduced or not. The usual hours for an afternoon tea are from four to six, but in the case of a coming-out reception the hour is often prolonged to seven so as to allow more men to be present than would be the case if the time were restricted to the early afternoon. In these busy days few men are at liberty to make afternoon calls, and it is always a compliment to a girl if her tea includes a sprinkling of black coats. Whatever hours are decided on, they should be engraved on the cards sent out two weeks before the tea. These are of the form and size of an ordinary visiting card, and include the daughter's name below that of her mother's. If she is the eldest unmarried daughter, or the only girl in the family, the card reads as follows. Mrs. George Baker Blank, Miss Blank, December 9th, 1911, 4 to 7 o'clock. The daughter's given name is only used in case she has an older unmarried sister. Ball and Evening Reception A more elaborate form of coming out party consists of a ball or of an evening reception followed by dancing, and in this case the card contains the word dancing below the date of the entertainment and the hours at which it is given. 
Few homes are large enough to provide for even a small dance, and so a party of this sort is generally given at a hotel. The guests, as well as the receiving party, wear evening gowns without hats, and men are expected to come in full evening clothes, which means the long-tailed coats and not the popular tuxedo, white gloves, and, although this is not obligatory, white waistcoats. After a girl has been introduced into society, she has her individual visiting cards, makes her own calls, and is allowed to receive her own friends. Social customs differ with locality, and the chaperon is less customary in the West than in the East. In many cities, girls are allowed to go to the theatre and to evening parties with a man friend without a married woman being included in the party. A wise girl, however, is careful that any man she meets shall be introduced as soon as possible to some older member of her family, and to introduce a young man calling for the first time to either her mother or her father. Also, when she accepts an invitation to an evening's entertainment, she insists that her escort shall call for her at her own home and bring her directly home at the close of it. Dining or supping at a restaurant alone with a young man is sure to expose a girl to criticism. A woman's lunch. There are many pleasant forms of entertainment offered to a young girl entering society in which men are not included, and the most popular of these is a woman's lunch. This is a favourite form of entertainment for a young married woman to give in honour of some girlfriend who has just come out in society or whose engagement has just been announced. One o'clock or half after is the usual hour, and the meal is served in courses and is as elaborate as the household resources may allow. The decorations of the table are important, and three courses are sufficient if they are carefully arranged. Handsome street costumes are worn for a function of this sort, and the guest of honour, if there is one, dresses as the others do. Outer wraps are left in the hall or in a room put aside for this purpose, and, as a rule, hats are retained and gloves removed when the guests sit down at table. The custom of wearing a hat during lunch is not an arbitrary one, and is not universal. In France, for example, where social customs are most carefully observed, it is the custom to wear handsome afternoon gowns if invited for the noon meal, and to remove hats. The noon meal there is a social function, and certain formalities are observed. In London, on the contrary, no matter if a number of guests are expected, lunch is an informal occasion, and women dress for lunch as they would for an afternoon tea. Hats are worn, and women are prepared to rush off afterwards to meet other engagements. The English custom prevails now in the large cities in America, and, moreover, women seem disinclined to remove their hats after they are once dressed for the round of the day's social obligations. It is simpler and really quite conventional to leave the wearing of hats to the individual. The hostess should ask her guest if she wishes to take her hat off or to retain it, and she can at the same time intimate to her guest, if she is a stranger in the town, what the others will probably do in this connection. True hospitality on the part of the hostess is to make her guests at ease, and true politeness on the part of the visitor is to conform to the rules governing the community that she is visiting. Proper apparel for men. American gentlemen are no longer dependent on English tailors or on English fashions as they were some years ago. The American type of physique is a distinct one, and London tailors have never been able to fit American men as well as they do their own clients. Moreover, social life is so different in the United States from what it is in England that men really need different clothes. Practically all the American men are businessmen for the working hours of the day, and few of them have any time or inclination for anything save business clothes while daylight lasts. For dinner, or for the evening, what are generally called evening clothes are permissible and in fact obligatory in large cities for anything beyond the most informal home functions. For the evening there is the informal and formal dress suit. 
The former consists of the long-tailed coat worn with either a white or black waistcoat. For a dancing party or formal dinner, the white waistcoat is generally preferred and, if it is worn, it must be accompanied by a white lawn tie. A made-up bow is considered incorrect. The accompaniments to a suit of this sort are patent leather shoes and white kid gloves if dancing is a part of the evening programme. The informal evening suit includes a shorter dinner jacket or tuxedo, as it was formerly called, and, strictly speaking, this is only considered proper for the club or for parties where ladies are not expected to be present. However, men who commonly dress for dinner in the home circle generally prefer the dinner jacket to the long coat, and well-dressed men are often seen wearing it at small dinner parties, at the theatre, or at any informal evening event. This coat is always worn with a black tie and waistcoat, and it is not a suitable apparel for a dance or any large formal evening affair. The correct dress for a daytime wedding is a black frock coat with light trousers, light fancy waistcoat, and grey gloves and grey ascot or four-in-hand tie, and the frock coat with black waistcoat is proper for church or when making afternoon calls. Many young men are adopting for afternoon wear the English morning suit, which consists of a cutaway coat with trousers and waistcoat to match, and made of some other colour save black. Wedding Anniversaries First Anniversary – Cotton Wedding Second Anniversary – Paper Wedding Third Anniversary – Leather Wedding Fifth Anniversary – Wooden Wedding Seventh Anniversary – Woolen Wedding Tenth Anniversary – Tin Wedding Twelfth Anniversary – Silk and Fine Linen Wedding Fifteenth Anniversary – Crystal Wedding Twentieth Anniversary – China Wedding Twenty-fifth Anniversary – Silver Wedding Thirtieth Anniversary – Pearl Wedding Fortieth Anniversary – Ruby Wedding Fiftieth Anniversary – Golden Wedding, 75th Anniversary, Diamond Wedding. End of Section 3 Section 4 of The Handy Cyclopedia of Things Worth Knowing This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Handy Cyclopedia of Things Worth Knowing by Joseph Trenans How to Select Colors The Natural Laws of Tints, Tones, Shades, and Hues Some combinations of color are pleasing to the eye, and some are discordant. The reasons for this are based on natural laws, and are explained in a very simple manner in a learned article by Dr. W. K. Carr, which originally appeared in Shop Notes Quarterly. Impressions continue upon the retina of the eye, says Dr. Carr, about one-sixth of a second after the object has been moved. For this reason a point of light or flame whirled swiftly around appears as a continuous ring. Or take a piece of red ribbon place it on white paper, look intently at it for thirty seconds, and suddenly remove the ribbon. The portion of the paper which was covered by the ribbon will then appear green. The explanation is that the color sensation in the eye is caused by the almost unthinkably rapid whirling of electrons around their atoms, and that the retina, becoming fatigued by the vibration of the red, is therefore less sensitive to them. When the ribbon is suddenly removed, the eye sees, not the blue, yellow, and red, which produce the white surface of the paper, but, because of the fatigue of the eye to the red, it sees only the blue and yellow constituents of the white light, but blue and yellow produce green, hence the tendency at the eye to see the complementary of a color. 
This may be referred to as the successive contrast of colors. Colors for blondes and brunettes. Now for a practical application of this knowledge. The hair of the blonde is a mixture of red, yellow, and brown. As a rule the skin is lighter, that is, it contains not so much orange, and the tinges of red are lighter. Nature, therefore, very properly made the blonde's eyes blue, since the blue is complementary to the orange of her hair. The brunette's skin, on the other hand, has more orange in it, and hence a color favorable to one would not be becoming to the other. What would be the effect of green upon a complexion deficient in red? It would certainly heighten the rose tints in the cheeks, but the greatest care should be exercised in the selection of the proper shade of green, because the brunette's complexion contains a great deal of orange, and the green, acting upon the red of the orange, could readily produce a brick-dust appearance. Green, therefore, is a risky color for a brunette, and so is violet, which would neutralize the yellow of the orange and heighten the red. But if the orange complexion had more yellow than red, then the association of violet would produce pallor. Yellow, of course, is her color, since its complementary violet neutralizes the yellow of the orange complexion and leaves the red. But with the yellow-haired blonde the conditions are very different. The complementary of blue is orange, which improves the hair and freshens the light fresh tints. A blonde, therefore, can wear blue, just as a brunette can wear yellow. In arranging flowers the same law holds. Complementary colors should be placed side by side, blue with orange, yellow with violet, red and rose with green leaves. And any one who successfully selects his wallpaper and house furnishings is drawing unconsciously, perhaps, on an intuitive knowledge of these fundamental facts. Dark papers are bad, especially in rooms with a northern exposure, because they absorb too much light. The complementaries of red and violet are exceedingly trying to most complexions, and orange and orange-yellow are fatiguing to the eye. The most pleasing effects are to be had with yellow, light blue, and light green, for the latter freshens the red in pale skins, and the blue heightens blonde complexions, and goes well with gilding and with mahogany and cherry furniture. Color Contrast and Harmony the following tables will be found useful in selecting colors for dress, decoration, or any other purpose in which the proper application of the true laws of contrast and harmony in color is desirable. Contrasts in color Yellow contrasts with purple, russet, and auburn. Red contrasts with green, olive, and drab. Blue contrasts with orange, citrine, and buff. Harmonies in color. Yellow harmonizes with orange, green, citrine, russet, buff, and drab. Red harmonizes with orange, purple, russet, citrine, auburn, and buff. Blue harmonizes with purple, green, olive, citrine, drab, and auburn. The care of the teeth. Decay of the teeth, or caries, commences externally, appearing upon the enamel or bony structure of the teeth. Usually it is the result of chemical action produced by decomposition of food. Acids found in some fruits will cause decay if allowed to remain in contact with the teeth. Then there are the natural mouth acids, which, although not strong, are none the less effective if allowed to remain long enough around the teeth. Microscopical examinations have shown that the secretions of almost every person's mouth contain more or less vegetable and animal life that will withstand the application of acids and astringents, and will only succumb to alkalis. A dentifrice, or mouthwash, should be alkaline. Toothache Toothache is not always due to an exposed nerve, for in the majority of teeth extracted because they are painful, the nerve is dead. Inflammation is often the cause of the trouble. A toothache due to inflammation is a steady, aggravating pain, overspreading the affected side of the face, sometimes even the neck and shoulder. 
as there is no nerve to kill in a case of this kind, the tooth should be treated until cured, or removed upon the first symptom of trouble. Its extraction would be unattended by any danger, and would afford welcome relief. Tartar, a creamy, calcareous deposit, supposed to be from saliva, will sometimes cause toothache. It accumulates around the necks of the teeth, and eventually becomes hard and dark-coloured. It also causes foul breath, and loosens the gums from the teeth, causing them to present an unsightly appearance. THE TEETH OF CHILDREN Children have about twenty temporary teeth, which begin making their appearance about the sixth or seventh month. The time varies in different children. This is the most dangerous and troublesome period of the child's existence, and every parent will do well to consult a reputable dentist. About the second or third year the temporary teeth are fully developed. They require the same care to preserve them as is exercised toward the permanent set. About the sixth year, or soon after, four permanent molars, or double teeth, make their appearance. Some parents mistakenly suppose these belong to the first set. It is a serious error. They are permanent teeth, and if lost, will be lost for ever. No teeth that come after the sixth year are ever shed. Let every parent remember this. At twelve years the second set is usually complete, with the exception of the wisdom teeth, which appear anywhere from the eighteenth to the twenty-fourth year. When the second set is coming in, the beauty and character of the child's countenance is completed or for ever spoiled. Everything depends upon proper care at this time to see that the teeth come with regularity and are not crowded together. The teeth cannot have too much room. When a little separated, they are less liable to decay. Dentifrices, Useful and Injurious the habit of caring for the teeth daily, and if possible after each meal, should be established early in life. Those who have neglected to do so should lose no time in consulting a reputable dentist, and then persistently caring for their teeth day by day. Children especially should be taught to use the toothbrush and some reliable dentifrice. The more pleasant the preparation, the easier it will be to teach them its daily use. A fragrant, refreshing liquid is recommended, as it is a mouthwash as well as a tooth-cleanser. The habit thus formed, neglected for even a single day, will make the mouth feel decidedly uncomfortable. CLEANSING THE TEETH Preparations for cleansing the teeth and purifying the mouth should be free from all acids, and should be saponaceous or soapy containing as one of the principal ingredients an alkali to neutralize the acids, and destroy the animal and vegetable parasites which, as the microscope would show us, are in the secretions of almost every person's mouth. A finely triturated powder, having slight abrasive properties, but free from dangerous grit, should be used as the complement of a liquid. One way to use both is to pour on the wet brush or into the palm of the hand a sufficient quantity of powder and moisten it with the liquid. Occasionally the powder or the liquid alone could be employed. Be careful to use a liquid and powder of established reputation. Beware of thy teeth, take good care of thy teeth, and they will take good care of thee. THE PERFECT FEMALE FIGURE According to the Chicago Tribune, Miss Helen Lowe, a student at the Chicago Art Institute, is credited by art critics with closely approaching the standard of physical perfection set by statues of the goddess Venus. Miss Lowe was posed as a model for a series of photographs issued for the benefit of the playground fund of Oak Park. Aside from the artistic nature of Miss Lowe, a comparison of measurements with those of the typically perfect figure explains part of the success of these photographic studies. Height Miss Lowe, 5 feet 7 inches Perfect figure, 5 feet 8 inches Weight Miss Lowe, 138 Perfect figure, 140 Neck Miss Lowe, 13 and one half, Perfect figure, 13 Chest, Miss Lowe, 32, perfect figure, 33. Bust, Miss Lowe, 
36. Perfect figure, 37. Waist. Miss Lowe, 22. Perfect figure, 23. Hips. Miss Lowe, 36. Perfect figure, 39. Thigh. Miss Lowe, 22. Perfect figure, 24. Upper arm. Miss Lowe, 10. Perfect figure, 11. Forearm. Miss Lowe, 8 and 1 half. Perfect figure, 9. Calf. Miss Lowe, 14. Perfect figure, 15. Men and Complexions Dr. Catherine Blackford of Boston, speaking of men's complexions, arrives at the following conclusions. There are, of course, exceptions to all rules. As a general rule, the blondes are inconstant. They change their minds too often. They get angry one moment and forgive the next. They are impulsive, and when they do commit crimes, they are done on the impulse of the moment. A blonde radiates his personality about him. The brunette, on the other hand, as a rule, likes to concentrate on one subject. He is a specialist. He prefers his home and family, and his pleasures are more often lectures and kindred entertainments than those of a lighter order. He learns slowly, but he retains what he knows far better than does the blonde. End of section 4、section、five. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Root. The Handy Cyclopedia of Things Worth Knowing by Joseph Trenons. Published in 1911, Section 5. How the Baby's Mind Develops. In his book on The Development of the Intellect, Mr. H. W. Brown presents a conspectus of the observations of Professor Pryor on the mind of the child, which shows, chronologically, the gradual development of the senses, intellect, and will of the growing child, and presents in condensed form the results of a great number of careful observations. It is recorded that sensibility to light, touch, temperature, smell, and taste are present on the first day of infant life. Hearing, therefore, is the only special sense which is not active at this time. The child hears by the third or fourth day. Taste and smell are senses at the first most active, but they are differentiated. General organic sensations of well being or discomfiture are felt from the first, but pain and pleasure as mental states are not noted till at or near the second month. The first sign of speech in the shape of utterance of consonant sounds is heard about the end of the second month. These consonants being generally M, R, G, or T. All the movements of the eyes become coordinate by the fourth month, and by this time the child begins to have the feeling of self. That is, he looks at his own hands and looks at himself in the mirror. The study of the child's mind during the first year shows conclusively that ideas develop and reasoning processes occur before there is any knowledge of words or of language. Though it may be assumed that the child thinks in symbols, visual or auditory, which are clumsy equivalents for words. By the end of the year, the child begins to express itself by sound. That is, speech begins. The development of this speech capacity is, according to Pryor, in accordance with the development of the intellectual powers. By the end of the second year, the child's power of speech is practically acquired. The Wonderful Human Brain. According to the novel computations of a renowned histologist who has been calculating the aggregate cell forces of the human brain, the cerebral mass is composed of at least 300 million of nerve cells, each an independent body, organism, and microscopic brain so far as concerns its vital functions, but subordinate to a higher purpose in relation to the functions of the organ, each living a separate life individually. Though socially subject to a higher law of function. The lifetime of a nerve cell he estimates to be about 60 days. So 5 million die every day, about 200,000 every hour, and nearly 3,500 every minute, to be succeeded by an equal number of their progeny, while once in every 60 days a man has a new brain. 
Morning colors the world over. Black is by no means the only color used by men to express grief or mourning for the dead. In the South Sea Islands, the native express sorrow and hope by stripes of black and white. Grayish brown, the color of earth to which the dead return, is used in Ethiopia. Pale brown, the color of withered leaves, is the mourning of Persia. Sky blue, to express the assured hope that the deceased has gone to heaven, is the mourning of Syria, Cappadocia, and Armenia. Deep blue in Baccarat, purple and violet, to express kings and queens to God, was the color of mourning for cardinals and kings of France. The color of mourning in Turkey is violet. White, emblem of hope, is the color of mourning in China. Henry the Eighth wore white for Anne Boleyn. The ladies of ancient Rome and Sparta wore white. It was the color of mourning in Spain till 1948. Yellow is the color of mourning in Egypt and in Burma. Anne Boleyn wore yellow mourning for Catherine of Aragon. Curious Facts About Hair The hair of men is finer than that of women. The average weight of a head of hair is from 5 to 12 ounces. On an average head, there are about 1,000 hairs to the square inch. Hair will stretch about one-fourth of its length and retract nearly to its original length. Four hairs of good strength will hold suspended a one-pound weight. A single head of hair of average growth would therefore hold suspended an entire audience of 200 people. Things that are misnamed. Cat gut is gut of sheep. Baffin's Bay is no bay at all. Arabic figures were invented by the Indians. Turkish baths are not of Turkish origin. Black lead is a compound of carbon and iron. Slave, by derivation, should mean noble, illustrious. Turkeys do not come from Turkey, but from North America. Titmouse is not a mouse, but a little hedge sparrow. Dutch clocks are of German, Deutsch, not Dutch, manufacture. Salt, that is table salt, is not a salt at all, but chloride of sodium. Galvanized iron is not galvanized, simply iron coated with zinc. Ventriloquism is not voice from the stomach, but from the mouth. Kid gloves are not kid at all but are made of lambskin or sheepskin. Pompey's pillar in Alexandria was erected neither by nor to Pompey. Tonquin beans come from Tonka in Guinea, not Tonquin in Asia. Fire, air, earth, and water called the four elements are not elements at all. Rice paper is not made from rice, but from the pith of tungstow or hollow plant. Japan lacquer contains no lac at all, but is made from the resin of a kind of a nut tree. Pen means a feather, Latin penna, a wing. A steel pen is therefore an anomaly. Jerusalem artichoke has no connection with Jerusalem, but with the sunflower girasol. Humble pie for humble pie. The umbles of venison were served to inferiors and servants. Lunar caustic is simply nitrate of silver, and silver is the astrological symbol of the moon. Bridegroom has nothing to do with groom. It is the old English guma, a man, brid guma. Mother of pearl is the inner layer of several sorts of shell, and in some cases the matrix of the pearl. Sealing wax is not wax at all, nor does it contain wax. It is made of shellac, Venice turpentine, and cinnabar. Cleopatra's needles were not erected by Cleopatra, nor in honor of that queen, but by Thothmes III. German silver is not silver at all, but a metallic mixture which has been in use in China since time out of mind. Cuttlebone is not bone, but a structure of pure chalk embedded loosely in the substance of a species of cuttlefish. America was named after Amerigo Vespucci a naval astronomer of Florence, but he did not discover the New World. Prussian blue does not come from Prussia. It is the precipitate of the salt of protoxide of iron with red prussiate of potass.
wormwood has nothing to do with worms or wood it is the anglo-saxon wermod man inspiriting being a strong tonic honeydew is neither honey nor dew but an animal substance given off by certain insects especially when hunted by ants gothic architecture is not that of the goths but the ecclesiastical style employed in england and france before the renaissance sperm oil properly means seed oil from the notion that it was spawn or milt of a whale it is chiefly taken however from the head not the spawn of the spermaceti whale whalebone is not bone nor does it possess any properties of bone it is a substance attached to the upper jaw of the whale and serves to strain the water which the creature takes up the language of the flag to strike a flag is to lower the national colors in token of submission flags are used as the symbol of rank and command the officers using them being called flag officers such flags are square to distinguish them from other banners a flag of truce is a white flag displayed to an enemy to indicate a desire to parley or for consultation the white flag is a sign of peace after a battle parties from both sides often go out to the field to rescue the wounded or bury the dead under the protection of a white flag the red flag is a sign of defiance and is often used by revolutionists in the naval service it is a mark of danger and shows a vessel to be receiving or discharging her powder the black flag is a sign of piracy the yellow flag shows a vessel to be at quarantine or is the sign of a contagious disease a flag at half-mast means mourning fishing and other vessels return with a flag at half-mast to announce the loss or death of some of the men dipping the flag is lowering it slightly and then hoisting it again to salute a vessel or fort if the president of the united states goes afloat the american flag is carried in the bows of his barge or hoisted at the main of the vessel on board of which he is death sentence of the savior the following is said to be the sentence of death word for word pronounced against jesus christ sentence pronounced by pontius pilate intendant of the lower province of galilee that jesus of nazareth shall suffer death by the cross in the seventeenth year of the reign of emperor tiberius and on the twenty-fourth day of the month in the most holy city of jerusalem during the pontificate of annas and caiaphas pontius pilate intendant of the province of lower galilee sitting to judgment in the presidential seat of the praetors sentences jesus of nazareth to death on a cross between robbers as the numerous and notorious testimonies of the people prove one jesus is a misleader two he has excited the people to sedition three he is an enemy to the laws four he calls himself the son of god five he calls himself falsely the king of israel six he went to the temple followed by a multitude carrying palms in their hands orders from the first centurion quirilius cornelius to bring him to the place of execution forbids all persons rich or poor to prevent the execution of jesus the witnesses who have signed the execution of jesus are one daniel robani pharisee two john sorababic three raphael robani four capet Jesus is to be taken out of Jerusalem through the gate of Torns. The Horse's Prayer To thee, my master, I offer my prayer. Feed, water, and care for me. And when the day's work is done, provide me with shelter and a clean, dry bed. Always be kind to me. Pet me sometimes that I may serve you the more gladly and learn to love you. Do not jerk the reins, and do not whip me when going uphill. Never strike, beat, or kick me when I do not understand what you want, but give me a chance to understand you. Watch me, and if I fail to do your bidding, see if something is not wrong with my harness or feet. Do not overload me or hitch me where water will drip on me. Keep me well shod. Examine my teeth when I do not eat. I may have an ulcerated tooth, and that, you know, is painful. Do not tie or check my head in an unnatural position or take away my best defense against flies and mosquitoes 
by cutting off my mane or tail. I cannot tell you when I am thirsty, so give me clean, cool water often. I cannot tell you in words when I am sick, so watch me, and by signs you may know my condition. Give me all possible shelter from the hot sun, and put a blanket on me, not when I am working, but when I am standing in the cold. Never put a frosty bit in my mouth. First warm it by holding it in your hands. I try to carry you and your burdens without a murmur, and wait patiently for you long hours of the day or night. Without the power to choose my shoes or path, I sometimes fall on the hard pavements, and must be ready at any moment to lose my life in your service. And finally, O oh my master, when my useful strength is gone, do not turn me out to starve or freeze, nor sell me to some human brute to be slowly tortured and starved to death. But do thou, my master, take my life in the kindest way, and your God will reward you here and hereafter. Amen. A Lady's Chance of Marrying Every woman has some chance to marry. It may be one to fifty, or it may be ten to one that she will, representing her entire chance at one hundred and certain points of her progress in time, it is found to be in the following ratio. Between the ages of fifteen and twenty years, fourteen and one-half percent. Between the ages of twenty and twenty-five years, fifty-two percent. Between the ages of twenty-five and thirty years, eighteen percent. Between the ages of thirty and thirty-five years, fifteen and one-half percent. Between the ages of thirty-five and forty years, three and three-quarters percent. Between the ages of forty and forty-five, two and one-half percent. Between the ages of forty-five and fifty years, three-quarters of one percent. Between the ages of fifty and fifty-six years, one-eighth of one percent. After sixty, it is one-tenth of one percent, or one chance in a thousand. Some have meat and cannot eat, and some wad eat who want it. But we have meat, and we can eat, so let the Lord be thank it. End of section 5。Section 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. The Handy Cyclopedia of Things Worth Knowing by Joseph Tremens, published in 1911, Section 6. Hints on Shaving Learn to shave right. Don't shave in a hurry. Have the water hot enough so that it won't cool too quickly. Wash the face with soap and hot water before lathering, especially if the beard is hard. Have the lather very soapy, thin enough to spread easily, yet thick enough so it won't drop. Rub well into the face with a brush, then with the fingers. The longer you lather and the more you rub, the easier the shave. The hair usually grows downward. Shave with the grain, not against it. Use a sliding motion as well as downward. If you get a nick, wash with cold water. Rubbing the cut with a piece of lump alum will stop the bleeding at once and help to heal. Hold the razor properly. Lay it as flat as possible, the back of the razor nearly touching the skin. Have it under easy control. Don't grab it. An easy position means an easy shave. A poor strop will spoil the best razor ever made. To buy a good razor and a cheap strop is poor economy. If you prefer a swing strop, pull it as tightly as you can. Better use a stiff strop, cushion or solid, if in doubt. A serious mistake made by a number of self-shavers is to hold the strop loose. This bends the invisible teeth and rounds the edge. Strop your razor before and after shaving. This keeps the edge free from rust. Dip your razor in hot water before stropping and shaving. This dissolves the accumulation in the invisible teeth. Press as hard as you like on the back of the blade.
but very lightly on the edge. As you reach the end of the strop, turn the razor on the back of the blade to strop the other side, pulling toward you. Keep rust away from your strop, and remember that a cut in the strop will ruin your razor. Don't use a strop that is cut. Facts to Settle Arguments Telephone Invented, 1861 There are 2,750 languages. Sound moves 743 miles per hour. Hawks can fly 150 miles per hour. Chinese invented paper, 170 B.C. A hand, horse measure, is four inches. German Empire re-established, 1871. Storm clouds move 36 miles an hour. The first steel pen was made in 1830. Phonographs invented by Edison, 1877. Light moves 187,000 miles per second. Watches were first constructed in 1476. First steamer crossed the Atlantic, 1819. Rome was founded by Romulus, 752 B.C. First musical notes used, 1338. Printed, 1502. The first Atlantic cable was operated in 1858. The first balloon ascended from Lyon, France, 1783. Slow rivers flow at the rate of seven-tenths of a mile per hour. Napoleon I, crowned emperor, 1804, died at St. Helena, 1820. Harvard, the oldest college in the United States, was founded 1638. The first steam engine on this continent was brought from England, 1753. The most extensive park is Deer Park in Denmark. It contains 4,200 acres. Measure 209 feet on each side, and you will have a square acre to an inch. Albert Durer gave the world a prophecy of future wood engraving in 1527. The first iron ore discovered in this country was found in Virginia in 1715. Bravest of the Brave was the title given to Marshal Ney at Friedland, 1807. The highest bridge in the world, 360 feet from the surface of the water, is over a gorge at Constantine in Algiers. The first volunteer fire company in the United States was at Philadelphia, 1736. St. Augustine, oldest city in the United States, founded by the Spaniards, 1565. Jamestown, Virginia, founded 1607, first permanent English settlement in America. Books, in their present form, were invented by Attalus, king of Pergamos, 198 B.C. Robert Rakes established the first Sunday school at Gloucester, England, 1781. Oberlin College, Ohio, was the first in the United States that admitted female students. The first knives were used in England, and the first wheeled carriages in France in 1559. The largest park in the United States is Fairmont at Philadelphia, and contains 2.740 acres. The highest natural bridge in the world is at Rockbridge, Virginia, being 200 feet high to the bottom of the arch. The largest empire in the world is that of Great Britain, being 8,557,658 square miles, and more than a sixth part of the globe. The first electrical signal ever transmitted between Europe and America passed over the field submarine cable on August 5, 1858. Paris was known as Lutetia until 1184, 
when the name of the great French capital was changed to that which it has borne ever since. The longest tunnel in the world is St. Gothard, on the line of the railroad between Lucerne and Milan, being nine and one-half miles in length. Burnt brick were known to have been used in building the Tower of Babel. They were introduced into England by the Romans. The loftiest active volcano is Popocatapetl. It is 17,784 feet high, and has a crater three miles in circumference and 1,000 feet deep. The largest insurance company in the world is the Mutual Life of New York City, having cash and real estate assets of over $350 million. The Latin tongue became obsolete about 580. The value of a ton of pure gold is $602,799.21. First authentic use of organs, 755. In England, 951. Ether was first used for surgical purposes in 1844. Ignatius Loyola founded the Order of Jesuits, 1541. The first newspaper advertisement appeared in 1652. Benjamin Franklin used the first lightning rods, 1752. Glass windows, colored, were used in the 8th century. The largest desert is Sahara, in northern Africa. Its length is 3,000 miles, and breadth 900 miles, having an area of 2 million square miles. The most remarkable echo known is that in the castle of Simonetta, two miles from Milan. It repeats the echo of a pistol shot sixty times. The first deaf and dumb asylum was founded in England by Thomas Braidwood, 1760, and the first in the United States was at Hartford, 1817. The largest diamond in the world is the Braganza, being part of the Portuguese jewels. It weighs 1,880 carats. It was found in Brazil in 1741. The Valley of Death, in the island of Java, is simply the crater of an extinct volcano filled with carbonic acid gas. It is half a mile in circumference. The grade of titles in Great Britain stands in the following order from the highest. A prince, Duke, Marquis, Earl, Viscount, Baron, Baronet, Knight. The city of Amsterdam, Holland, is built upon piles driven into the ground. It is intersected by numerous canals, crossed by nearly three hundred bridges. Coal was used as fuel in England as early as 852 and in 1234 the first charter to dig it was granted by Henry the Third to the inhabitants of Newcastle-on-Tyne. The present national colors of the United States were not adopted by Congress until 1777. The flag was first used by Washington at Cambridge, January 1, 1776. Tobacco was discovered in San Domingo in 1496 afterwards by the Spaniards in Yucatan in 1520. It was introduced into France in 1560 and into England in 1583. Kerosene was first used for illuminating in 1826. Cork is the bark taken from a species of the oak tree. National banks first established in the United States, 1816. Introduction of Homeopathy into the United States, 1825. Egyptian pottery is the oldest known, dates from 2000 BC. Authentic history of China commenced 3000 years BC. The largest free territorial government is the United States. The Chaldeans were the first people who worked in metals. Spectacles were invented by an Italian in the 13th century. 
soap was first manufactured in England in the sixteenth century. Julius Caesar invaded Britain 55 B.C., assassinated 44 B.C. Medicine was introduced into Rome from Greece 200 B.C. The first electric telegraph, Paddington to Brayton, England, 1835. First photographs produced in England, 1802, perfected, 1841. First life insurance, in London, 1772, in America, Philadelphia, 1812. Slavery in the United States was begun at Jamestown, Virginia, in 1619. The highest denomination of legal tender notes in the United States is $10,000. Postage stamps first came into use in England in the year 1840, and the United States in 1847. The highest range of mountains are the Himalayas, the mean elevation being from 16,000 to 18,000 feet. The term Almighty Dollar originated with Washington Irving as a satire on the American love for gain. The largest inland sea is the Caspian, between Europe and Asia, being 700 miles long and 270 miles wide. A span is 10 and 7 eighths inches. First watches made in Nuremberg, 1476. Pianoforte, invented in Italy, about 1710. The value of a ton of silver is $37,704.84. French and Indian War in America, 1754. A hurricane moves 80 miles per hour. Coaches were first used in England in 1569. The first horse railroad was built in 1826-1827. Electricity moves 288,000 miles per second. Modern needles first came into use in 1545. The average human life is 33 years. French Revolution, 1789. Reign of Terror, 1793. One million dollar gold coin weighs 3,685.8 pounds of Wardupois. Mormons arrived at Salt Lake Valley, Utah, July 24, 1847. The largest cavern in the world is the Mammoth Cave, Kentucky. Experiments in Electric Lighting by Thomas A. Edison, 1878-80. Daguerre and Nieper invented the process of daguerreotype, 1839. First American Library, founded at Harvard College, Cambridge, 1638. First cotton raised in the United States was in Virginia in 1621. First exported, 1747. First sugar cane cultivated in the United States near New Orleans, 1751. First sugar mill, 1758. First telegraph in operation in America was between Washington and Baltimore, May 27, 1844. The largest university is Oxford in England. It consists of 21 colleges and five halls. The first illumination with gas was in Cornwall, England, 1792, in the United States, at Boston, 1822. Printing was known in China in the 6th century, introduced into England about 1474, America, 1516. The Great Wall of China, built 200 BC, is 1,250 miles in length, 20 feet high and 25 feet thick at the base. Glass mirrors first made by Venetians in the 13th century. Polished metal was used before that time. Meerschaum means froth of the sea. 
It is white and soft when dug from the earth, but soon hardens. In round numbers, the weight of one million dollars in standard gold coin is one and three quarters tons, standard silver coin twenty six and three quarters tons, subsidiary silver coin twenty five tons, minor coin five cent nickel one hundred tons. The highest monument in the world is the Washington Monument, being 555 feet. The highest structure of any kind is the Eiffel Tower, Paris, finished in 1889 and 989 feet high. There has been no irregularity in the recurrence of leap year every four years since 1800, except in 1900, which was a common year, although it came forth after the preceding leap year. It is claimed that crows, eagles, ravens, and swans live to be one hundred years old, herons fifty-nine, parrots sixty, pelicans and geese fifty, skylarks thirty, sparrowhawks forty, peacocks, canaries, and cranes twenty-four. The greatest cataract in the world is Niagara the height of the American Falls being 165 feet. The highest fall of water in the world is that of the Yosemite in California, being 2,550 feet. The most ancient catacombs are those of the Theban kings, begun 4,000 years ago. The catacombs of Rome contain the remains of about 6 million human beings, those of Paris 3 million. The first English newspaper was the English Mercury, issued in the reign of Queen Elizabeth, and was issued in the shape of a pamphlet. The Gazette of Venice was the original model of the modern newspaper. The Great Eastern, at one time the greatest steamer afloat, and twice as long as any other vessel at the time of her launching in 1858, was 692 feet in length and 118 feet in breadth. She was too large to be handled profitably with the motive power then available, but proved indispensable in the laying of the Atlantic cable. She was broken up and sold as junk, although the Isherwood system, on which she was built, has since been revived, and is now successfully employed in shipbuilding. The Seven Sages flourished in Greece in the 6th century BC. They were renowned for their maxims of life, and as the authors of the mottoes described in the Delphian temple. Their names are Solon, Gilo, Pittacus, Bias, Periander, Cleobolus, and Thales. A monkey wrench is not so named because it is a handy thing to monkey with, or for any kindred reason. Monkey is not its name at all, but Monkey. Charles Monkey, the inventor of it, sold his patent for two thousand dollars and invested the money in a house in williamsburg kings county new york the seven wonders of the world are seven most remarkable objects of the ancient world they are the pyramids of egypt pharaohs of alexandria walls and hanging gardens of babylon temple of diana at ephesus the statue of the olympian jupiter mausoleum of artemisia and Colossus of Rhodes. In 1775, there were only 27 newspapers published in the United States. Ten years later, in 1785, there were seven published in the English language in Philadelphia alone, of which one was a daily. The oldest newspaper published in Philadelphia at the time of the Federal Convention was the Pennsylvania Gazette, established by Samuel Keemer in 1728. The second newspaper, in point of age, was the Pennsylvania Journal, established in 1742 by William Bradford, whose uncle, Andrew Bradford, established the first newspaper in Pennsylvania, the American Weekly Mercury, in 1719. Next in age, but the first in importance, was the Pennsylvania Packet, established by John Dunlop in 1771. In 1784, it became a daily, being the first daily newspaper printed on this continent. 
Liberty, Bartholdi's statue, presented to the United States by the French people in 1885, is the largest statue ever built. Its conception is due to the great French sculptor whose name it bears. It is said to be a likeness of his mother. Eight years of time were consumed in the construction of this gigantic brazen image. Its weight is 440,000 pounds, of which 146,000 pounds are copper, the remainder iron and steel. The major part of the iron and steel was used in constructing the skeleton framework for the inside. The mammoth electric light held in the hands of the giantess is 305 feet above tide water. The height of the figure is 152 and a half feet the pedestal ninety-one feet, and the foundation fifty-two feet and ten inches. Forty persons can find standing room within the mighty head, which is fourteen and a half feet in diameter. A six-foot man standing on the lower lip could hardly reach the eyes. The index finger is eight feet in length, and the nose three and three-quarters feet. The Colossus of Rhodes was a pygmy compared with this latter-day wonder. The largest and grandest temple of worship in the world is St. Peter's Cathedral at Rome. It stands on the site of Nero's Circus, in the northwest part of the city, and is built in form of a Latin cross. The total length of the interior is 612 and a half English feet, transept 446 and a half feet. Height of nave, 152 and a half feet. Diameter of cupola, 193 feet. Height of dome, from pavement to top of cross, 448 feet. The great bell alone, without the hammer or clapper, weighs 18,600 pounds, or over nine and a quarter tons. The foundation was laid in 1450 A.D., Forty-three popes lived and died during the time the work was in progress. It was dedicated in the year 1826, but not entirely finished until the year 1880. The cost, in round numbers, is set down at seventy million dollars. The Great Pyramid of Cheops is the largest structure of any kind ever erected by the hand of man. Its original dimensions at the base were 764 feet square, and its perpendicular height in the highest point 488 feet. It covers four acres, one rood and twenty-two perches of ground, and has been estimated by an eminent English architect to have cost not less than thirty million pounds, which in United States currency would be about one hundred and forty-five million two hundred thousand dollars. Internal evidence proves that the Great Pyramid was begun around the year 2170 B.C., about the time of the birth of Abraham. It is estimated that about five million tons of hewn stone were used in its construction, and the evidence points to the fact that these stones were brought a distance of about 700 miles from quarries in Arabia. The largest body of fresh water in the world is Lake Superior. It is 400 miles long and 180 miles wide. Its circumference, including the winding of its various bays, has been estimated at 1,800 miles. Its area in square miles is 32,000, which is greater than the whole of New England, leaving out Maine. The greatest depth of this inland sea is 200 fathoms, or 1,200 feet. Its average depth is about 160 fathoms. It is 636 feet above the sea level. The cornerstone of the Washington Monument, the highest in the United States, and until 1889 the highest structure in the world, was laid July 4, 1848. Robert E. Winthrop, then Speaker of the House, delivered the oration. Work progressed steadily for about six years, until the funds of the Monumental Society became exhausted. At that time the monument was about 175 feet high. 
From 1854 until 1879, nothing to speak of was done on the building. In the year last above named, Congress voted an appropriation of $200,000 to complete the work. From that time forward, work progressed at a rapid rate until December 6, 1884, when the aluminum apex was set at 555 feet 5 and a half inches from the foundation, and the work declared finished. The foundation is 146 and a half feet square. Number of stones used above the 130 foot level, 19,163. Total weight stone used in work, 81,120 tons. The largest state in our Grand Republic is Texas, which contains 274,350 square miles, capable of sustaining 20 million people, and then it would not be more crowded than Scotland is at present. It has been estimated that the entire population of the globe could be seated upon chairs within the boundary of Texas, and each have four feet of elbow room. The Mississippi River from the source of the Missouri to the Eads Jetties is the longest river in the world. It is 4,300 miles in length and drains an area of 1,726,000 square miles. The Amazon, which is without doubt the widest river in the world, including the Beni, is 4,000 miles in length and drains 2,330,000 square miles of territory. End of section six. Recorded by Andrew Lebrun, Boston, Massachusetts. Section seven. The Handy Cyclopedia of Things Worth Knowing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Dunabier. The Handy Cyclopedia of Things Worth Knowing by Joseph Trenins. Published in 1911. Section 7. The Single Tax. This idea was first formulated by Mr. Henry George in 1879 and has grown steadily in favor. Single tax men assert as a fundamental principle that all men are equally entitled to the use of the earth, therefore no one should be allowed to hold valuable land without paying to the community the value of the privilege. They hold that this is the only rightful source of public revenue, and they would therefore abolish all taxation, local, state, and national, except a tax upon the rental value of land exclusive of its improvements the revenue thus raised to be divided among local, state, and general governments, as the revenue from certain direct taxes is now divided between local and state governments. The single tax would not fall on all land, but only on valuable land, and on that in proportion to its value. It would thus be a tax not on use or improvements, but on ownership of land, taking what would otherwise go to the landlord as owner. In accordance with the principle that all men are equally entitled to the use of the earth, they would solve the transportation problem by public ownership and control of all highways, including the roadbeds of railroads, leaving their use equally free to all. The single tax system would, they claim, dispense with a horde of tax gatherers, simplify government, and greatly reduce its cost give us with all the world that absolute free trade which now exists between the states of the Union, abolish all taxes on private issues of money, take the weight of taxation from agricultural districts where land has little or no value apart from improvements, and put it upon valuable land such as city lots and mineral deposits. It would call upon men to contribute for public expenses in proportion to the natural opportunities they monopolize, and make it unprofitable for speculators to hold land unused or only partly used, thus opening to labor unlimited fields of employment, solving the labor problem and abolishing involuntary poverty. The Mysteries of Hypnotism 
a compend of the general claims made by professional hypnotists. Animal magnetism is the nerve force of all human and animal bodies, and is common to every person in a greater or less degree. It may be transmitted from one person to another. The transmitting force is the concentrated effort of willpower, which sends the magnetic current through the nerves of the operator to the different parts of the body of his subject. It may be transmitted by and through the eyes, as well as the fingertips and the application of the whole open hands to different regions of the bodies of the subject, as well as to the mind. The effect of this force upon the subject will depend very much upon the health, mental capacity, and general character of the operator. Its action, in general, should be soothing and quieting upon the nervous system stimulating to the circulation of the blood, the brain, and other vital organs of the body of the subject. It is the use and application of this power or force that constitutes hypnotism. Magnetism is a quality that inheres in every human being, and it may be cultivated like any other physical or mental force of which men and women are constituted. From the intelligent operator using it to overcome disease, a patient experiences a soothing influence that causes a relaxation of the muscles, followed by a pleasant, drowsy feeling which soon terminates in refreshing sleep. On waking, the patient feels rested, all his troubles have vanished from consciousness, and he is as if he had a new lease on life. In the true hypnotic condition, when a patient voluntarily submits to the operator, any attempt to make suggestions against the interests of the patient can invariably be frustrated by the patient. Self-preservation is the first law of nature, and some of the best-known operators who have recorded their experiments assert that suggestions not in accord with the best interest of the patient could not be carried out. No one was ever induced to commit any crime under hypnosis that could not have been induced to do the same thing much easier without hypnosis. The hypnotic state is a condition of mind that extends from a comparatively wakeful state with slight drowsiness to complete somnambulism, no two subjects as a rule ever presenting the same characteristics. The operator, to be successful, must have control of his own mind, be in perfect health, and have the ability to keep his mind concentrated upon the object he desires to accomplish with his subject. How to Care for a Piano by William H. Damon The most important thing in the preservation of a piano is to avoid atmospheric changes and extremes and sudden changes of temperature. Where the summer condition of the atmosphere is damp, all precautions possible should be taken to avoid an entirely dry condition in winter, such as that given by steam or furnace heat. In all cases should the air in the home contain moisture enough to permit a heavy frost on the windows in zero weather. The absence of frost under such conditions is positive proof of an entirely dry atmosphere and this is the piano's most dangerous enemy, causing the sounding board to crack, shrinking up the bridges, and consequently putting the piano seriously out of tune, also causing an undue dryness in all the action parts and often a loosening of the glue joints, thus producing clicks and rattles. To obviate this difficulty is by no means an easy task and will require considerable attention. Permit all the fresh air possible during the winter, being careful to keep the piano out of cold drafts, as this will cause sudden contraction of the varnish and cause it to check and crack. Plants in the room are desirable, and vessels of water of any kind will be of assistance. The most potent means of avoiding extreme dryness is to place a single loaf bread pan, half full of water, in the lower part of the piano, taking out the lower panel and placing it on either side of the pedals inside. This should be refilled about once a month during the artificial heat, care being taken to remove the vessel as soon as the heat is discontinued in the spring. In cases where a stove heat is used, these precautions are not necessary. The action of a piano 
like any other delicate piece of machinery, should be carefully examined and, if necessary, adjusted each time it is tuned. The hammers need occasional and careful attention to preserve original tone quality and elasticity. Never allow the piano to be beaten or played hard upon. This is ruinous to both the action and tuning. When not in use, the music rack and top should be closed to exclude dust. The keyboard need never be closed, as the ivory needs both light and ventilation and will eventually turn yellow unless left open. The case demands careful treatment to preserve its beauty and polish. Never use anything other than a soft piece of cotton cloth or cheesecloth to dust it with. Never wipe it with a dry chamois skin or silk cloth. Silk is not as soft as cotton and will scratch. A dry chamois skin picks up the dust and grit and gradually scours off the fine finish. In dusting, never use a feather duster, nor rub the piano hard with anything. The dust should be whipped off and not rubbed into the varnish. If the piano is dingy, smoky, or dirty looking, it should be washed carefully with lukewarm water with a little ammonia in it to soften it. Never use soap. Use nothing but a small, soft sponge and a chamois skin. Wipe over a small part at a time with the sponge, following quickly with the wet chamois skin wrung out of the same water. This will dry it immediately and leave it as beautiful and clean as new. Never use patent polishes. If your piano needs polishing, employ a competent polisher to give it a hand-rubbing friction polish. The highest mountain on the globe is not, as is generally supposed, Mount Everest. That honor belongs to a lofty peak named Mount Hercules on the Isle of Papua New Guinea, discovered by Captain Lawson in 1881. According to Lawson, this monster is 32,763 feet in height, being 3,781 feet higher than Mount Everest, which is only 29,002 feet above the level of the Indian Ocean. Transcriber's Note The highest point in New Guinea is Punkak Jaya, Mount Karstens, or the Karstens Pyramid, at 16,000 23 feet. Salt Rising Bread The real formula for making salt rising bread, as set down by the daughter of Governor Stubbs of Kansas, and by him communicated to Theodore Roosevelt, is as follows, according to the Saturday Evening Post. On the night before you contemplate this masterpiece of baking, take a half a cupful of cornmeal and a pinch of salt and sugar, Scald this with new milk heated to the boiling point and mixed to the thickness of mush. This can be made in a cup. Wrap in a clean cloth and put in a warm place overnight. In the morning, when all is ready, take a one-gallon stone jar and into this put one scant cupful of new milk. Add a level teaspoonful of salt and one of sugar. Scald this with three cupfuls of water heated to the boiling point. Reduce to a temperature of 108 degrees with cold water, using a milk thermometer to enable you to get exactly the right temperature. Then add flour and mix to a good batter. After the batter is made, mix in with your starter that was made the night before. Cover the stone jar with a plate and put the jar into a large kettle of water and keep this water at a temperature of 108 degrees until the sponge rises. It should rise at least an inch and a half. When it has raised, mix to a stiff dough, make into loaves, and put into pans. Do not let the heat get out of the dough while working. Grease the loaves well on top and set your bread where it will be warm and rise. After the loaves rise, bake in a medium oven for one hour and ten minutes. When you take the loaves from the oven, Wrap them in a bread cloth. A cure for love. Take 12 ounces of dislike, 1 pound of resolution, 2 grains of common sense, 2 ounces of experience, a large sprig of thyme, and 3 quarts of cooling water of consideration. 
set them over a gentle fire of love, sweeten it with sugar of forgetfulness, skim it with the spoon of melancholy, put it in the bottom of your heart, cork it with the cork of clean conscience. Let it remain, and you will quickly find ease and be restored to your senses again. These things can be had of the apothecary at the House of Understanding, next door to reason, on Prudence Street. End of Section 7 Section 8 of the Handy Cyclopedia of Things Worth Knowing This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Dunabier. The Handy Cyclopedia of Things Worth Knowing by Joseph Trinans, published in 1911. Section 8. Doing Business with a Bank. In opening your account with a bank, it is proper that you should first be introduced to the cashier or some other official. If you are engaged in business, that officer will inquire as to your particular business or calling, your address, etc. And unless he is already satisfied on this point, he may make inquiries as to your business standing. This being satisfactory, he will hand you a passbook and some deposit tickets, whereupon you make your first deposit, entering the amount on the ticket. You will then be asked to write your signature in a book provided for that purpose or upon a card to be filed away for reference. The Signature this signature should be just as you intend to use it on all your dealings with the bank. If, for instance, your name is John Henry Smith, you may write it as J. H. Smith, J. Henry Smith, John H. Smith, or John Henry Smith. But whatever form you adopt should be used all the time. Once having adopted the form, it should be maintained in exactly that way. The only excuse for variation from your usual signature is when presenting checks or other paper made payable to you. In that case, supposing you had adopted the form J. Henry Smith for your regular signature, and the check is made payable to John H. Smith, you should first write on the back of that check John H. Smith, and immediately under this you should place your regular signature. Depositing Money When making a deposit, Always use the deposit ticket provided by the bank filling it out yourself in ink. From this ticket, which is first checked up by the receiving teller, the amount of your deposit is placed to your credit. Do not ask the teller to fill out your deposit ticket. No doubt he would be glad to accommodate you, but to do so would violate a rule which protects both the bank and the depositor. Deposit tickets are preserved by the bank, and often serve to correct mistakes. How to avoid mistakes? Consider for a moment the vast aggregate of bank transactions, and you will see that perfect system on the part of the bank and bank officials is required to ensure accuracy and avoid mistakes. Sometimes the requirements of the banks may seem arbitrary and troublesome, but reflection will show that they safeguard the depositor as well as the bank. The simple rules here laid down will enable anyone who has business with a bank to do so with the least trouble and with absolute safety. How to make out a check. Checks are the most satisfactory and the most convenient method of paying a debt or making any ordinary remittance. The stub of your checkbook will furnish a permanent memorandum, and when the check is cancelled and returned to you by the bank, it is an indisputable evidence that the debt has been paid or that the remittance has been made. The making of a check is a simple matter, but even the best businessmen make mistakes sometimes which are as difficult to remedy as they are to avoid. The hints here given and the facsimiles of checks printed in illustration will repay careful study. Illustration A check properly drawn. The name and amount are against the left side of their fields. The first facsimile shows a check properly made. It will be seen in the first place that this check is written very plainly 
and that there is no room for the insertion of extra figures or words. The writing of the amount commences as nearly as possible to the extreme left of the check. The figures are written close together, and there is no space between the first figure and the dollar mark. All erasures in checks should be avoided. If you have made a mistake, tear a blank check from the back of your checkbook and use that in place of the one spoiled. Some businessmen allow their clerks to fill out checks on the typewriter. This is ill-advised for two reasons. First, it is much easier to alter a typewritten check than one filled in with a pen. In the second place, a teller, in passing on the genuineness of a check, takes into consideration the character of the handwriting in the body of the check as well as in the signature. The typewritten characters offer no clue to individuality. Never mail a check drawn to bearer. Remember that if your check is made payable to bearer or to John Smith or bearer, it may be cashed by anybody who happens to have it. Unless it is for a large amount, the paying teller of your bank will look only to see whether your signature is correct and, that being right, the bank cannot be held responsible if this check should have come into the wrong hands. A check drawn to order can be cashed only when the person to whose order it has been drawn has endorsed it by writing his or her name on the back, and the bank will be responsible for the correctness of the endorsement. If you make your check payable, say, to William Armstrong or order, nobody but William Armstrong or someone to whom he endorses the check can collect the amount. And if, through fraud or otherwise, someone not entitled to it gets the money which the check calls for, the responsibility is not yours, but the bank's. It is for that reason that bankers and businessmen use such great care in accepting checks. Illustration A check carelessly drawn. The text and numbers for the amount is in the center of their fields leaving of space for extra text. Illustration. The same check raised. The amount has been changed from 100, 100.00, 000, to 8100, 8100.00. 000. For the same reason, you should never accept a check from anybody whom you do not know as responsible, and you should not be surprised or angered if someone else should hesitate to take a check from you. Checks or drafts received by you should be deposited as soon as possible. Should you receive a check for a considerable amount and have no convenient bank account, you should go to the bank on which the check is drawn and have the cashier certify it by stamping accepted or certified across the face over his signature. That formality makes the paper as good as money so long as the bank accepting it is solvent. It sometimes happens that a check drawn in good faith by a responsible party is withheld so long by the person receiving it that there is no money to the account when the check is finally presented. Paying Notes and Acceptances Make your notes and accepted drafts payable to the bank where you do business. Whether it or other banks hold them for collection, they will be presented to your bank when due. Pay your notes, etc., on the day they fall due, and early in the day if convenient, or leave a check for the amount with your bank on the day before the paper matures. Banks will not pay notes or drafts without instructions. Keep a careful account of the days of maturity of all your paper. Banks usually notify all payers a few days beforehand when their paper matures, but this is only a courtesy on their part and not an obligation. Exchange. Exchange means funds in other cities made available by bankers' drafts on such places. These drafts afford the safest and cheapest means for remitting money. 
Drafts on New York are worth their face value practically all over the United States in settlement of accounts. Collections A draft is sometimes the most convenient form for collecting an account. The prevalence of the custom is due to the fact that most men will wait to be asked to pay a debt. If a draft is a time draft, it is accepted by the person on whom it is drawn by writing his name and date across the face. This makes it practically a note to be paid at maturity. Notes or drafts that you desire to have collected for you by your bank should be left at the bank several days before they are due so as to give ample time to notify the payers. Borrowing Banks are always willing to loan their funds to responsible persons within reasonable limits. That is what they exist for. There is, of course, a limit to the amount a bank may loan, even on the best-known security. But the customer of the bank is entitled to and will receive the first consideration. The customer should not hesitate, when occasion requires, to offer to the bank for a discount such paper as may come into his hands in the course of business if, in his opinion, the paper is good. At the same time, he should not be offended if his bank refuses to take it, even without giving reasons. Endorsing checks, etc. When depositing checks, drafts, etc., see that they are dated properly and that the written amounts and figures correspond. The proper way to endorse a check or draft, this also applies to notes and other negotiable paper, is to write your name upon the back about one inch from the top. The proper end may be determined in this way. As you read the check, hold one end in each hand, draw the right hand toward you, and turn the check over. The end which is then farthest from you is the top. If, however, the check, draft, or note has already been endorsed by another person, you should write your name directly under the other endorsement, even if that is on the wrong end. If your own name on the face of the check, draft, or note is misspelled or has the wrong initials, but if the paper is clearly intended for you, you should first write your name as it appears on the face and under it your regular signature. You should endorse every check you deposit, even though it be payable to bearer. Mistakes in Banking Mr. Samuel Woods, a member of the American Institute of Bank Clerks, recently contributed to Muncie's magazine an interesting article on the subject of Mistakes in Banking. From this, we are permitted by the courtesy of the publishers of Muncie's to reproduce two of the facsimiles shown. One wrong word or figure or letter, the right thing in the wrong way or the wrong place, the scratch of an eraser or the alteration of a word, or any one of these things in the making or cashing of a check is liable to become as expensive as a racing automobile. The paying teller of a bank, says Mr. Woods, must keep his eyes open for new dangers as well as old ones. The cleverest crooks in the country are pitting their brains against his. After he has learned the proper guard for all the well-known tricks and forgeries, it is still possible that an entirely new combination may leave him minus cash and plus experience. But it is not the unique and novel swindle that is most dangerous either to a bank or an individual. It is the simple, ordinary mistake or the time-worn trick that makes continuous trouble. Apparently, every new generation contains a number of dishonest people who lay the same traps and a number of careless people who fall into these traps in the same old way. Check-raising made easy. One of the first lessons, for instance, that a depositor should learn before he is qualified to own a checkbook is to commence writing the amount as near as possible to the extreme left of the check. Those who forget this are often reminded of it in a costly way. Someone raises their checks by writing another figure in front of the proper amount. Five hundred might be raised to twenty-five hundred in this way. 
even by an unskilled forger. The highest court has recently decided that a bank cannot be held responsible when it pays a raised check, if the maker of the check failed in the first place to write it out correctly. The treasurer of the Bath Electric Company of Bath, Maine, had written a check for $100, which was raised to $8,100 and cashed. The court held that the company, not the bank, should lose the $8,000 because of the gross carelessness in drawing up the check. Facsimiles showing the check as originally written and as it looked when paid are here reproduced. Altered Words and Figures The altered check is the bane of the paying teller's profession, and it is the general practice in conservative banks to accept no checks or other paper which shows signs of erasure or alteration in either words or figures. End of Section 8 Section 9 of the Handy Cyclopedia of Things Worth Knowing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Roop. The Handy Cyclopedia of Things Worth Knowing by Joseph Trenens, published in 1911. Section 9. The Names of the States Alabama, Indian, meaning here we rest. Arkansas, Kansas, the Indian name for smoky water with the French prefix arc, bow, or bend in the principal river. California, caliente fornala, Spanish for hot furnace, in allusion to the climate. Colorado, Spanish, meaning colored, from the red color of the Colorado River. Connecticut, Indian, meaning long river. Delaware, named in honor of Lord Delaware. Florida, named by Ponce de Leon, who discovered it in 1512 on Easter Day, the Spanish Pascua de Flores, or Feast of Flowers. Georgia, in honor of George II of England. Illinois, from the Indian Eleni, men, and the French suffix wa, together signifying tribe of men. Indiana, Indian land. Iowa, Indian meaning beautiful land. Kansas, Indian meaning smoky water. Kentucky, Indian for at the head of the river or the dark and bloody ground. Louisiana, in honor of Louis the Fourteenth of France. Maine, from the province of Maine in France. Maryland, in honor of Henrietta Maria, Queen of Charles I of England. Massachusetts, the place of the Great Hills, the Blue Hills southwest of Boston. Michigan, the Indian name for a fish weir. The lake was so called from the fancied resemblance of the lake to a fish trap. Minnesota, Indian meaning sky-tinted water. Mississippi, Indian, meaning great father of waters. Missouri, Indian, meaning muddy. Nebraska, Indian, meaning water valley. Nevada, Spanish, meaning snow-covered, alluding to the mountains. New Hampshire, from Hampshire County, England. New Jersey, in honor of Sir George Carteret, one of the original grantees who had previously been governor of Jersey Island. New York, in honor of the Duke of York. North and South Carolina, originally called Carolina, in honor of Charles the Ninth of France. Ohio, Indian meaning beautiful river. Oregon, from the Spanish oregano, wild marjoram, which grows abundantly on the coast. Pennsylvania, Latin meaning Penn's woody land. Rhode Island, from a fancied resemblance to the island of Rhodes in the Mediterranean. Tennessee, Indian meaning river with a great bend. Texas, origin of this name is unknown. Vermont, French meaning green mountain. Virginia, in honor of Elizabeth the Virgin Queen. Wisconsin, Indian meaning 
gathering of the waters or wild rushing channel. Mottos of the states. Arkansas, Regnant Populi, the people's rule. California, Eureka, I have found it. Colorado, Nil sine numine, nothing without the divinity. Connecticut, qui trans tulit sustinet, he who has transferred sustains. Delaware, liberty and independence. Florida, in God is our trust. Georgia, wisdom, justice, moderation. Illinois, state sovereignty and national union. Iowa, our liberties we prize and our rights we will maintain. Kansas, ad astra per aspera, to the stars through rugged ways. Kentucky, united we stand, divided we fall. Louisiana, union and confidence. Maine, de rigo, I direct. Maryland, crescite et multiplicamini, increase and multiply. Massachusetts, and spedit lasadiam sub libertate quietam. By her sword, she seeks under liberty a calm repose. Michigan, si quaderis peninsulam a monanum circumspice. If thou seekest a beautiful peninsula, look around. Minnesota, l'etoile d'Inar, the star of the north. Missouri, salus populi suprema lex esto. Let the welfare of the people be the supreme law. Nebraska, popular sovereignty. Nevada, volens et potens, willing and able. New Jersey, liberty and independence. New York, excelsior, higher. Ohio, imperium in imperio, an empire within an empire. Oregon, alis volat propriais. She flies with her own wings. Pennsylvania, virtue, liberty, independence. Rhode Island, hope. South Carolina, animus opibus que parati, ready with our lives and property. Tennessee, agriculture, commerce. Vermont, freedom and unity. Virginia, sic semper tyrannis, so be it ever to tyrants. West Virginia, Montani Semper Liberi, the mountaineers are always free. Wisconsin, forward. United States, E Pluribus Unum, from many, one. Anuit Coiptis, God has favored the undertaking. Wous Ordo Seclorum, a new order of the ages. The first named on one side of the great seal, the other two on the reverse. Geographical nicknames, states and territories. Alabama, Cotton State. Arkansas, Toothpick and Bear State. California, Eureka and Golden State. Colorado, Centennial State. Connecticut, Land of Steady Habits, Freestone State and Nutmeg State. Dakota, Sioux State. Delaware, Uncle Sam's Pocket Handkerchief and Blue Hen State. Florida, Everglade and Flowery State. Georgia, Empire State of the South. Idaho, Gem of the Mountains. Illinois, Prairie and Sucker State. Indiana, Hoosier State. Iowa, Hawkeye State. Kansas, Jayhawker State. Kentucky, Corncracker State. Louisiana, Creole State. Maine, Timber and Pine Tree State. Maryland, Monumental State. Massachusetts, Old Bay State. Michigan, Wolverine and Peninsular State. Minnesota, Gopher and North Star State. Mississippi, Eagle State. Missouri, Puke State. Nebraska, Antelope State. Nevada, Sage State. New Hampshire, Old Granite State. New Jersey, Blue State and New Spain. New Mexico, Vermin State. New York, Empire State. North Carolina, Rip Van Winkle, Old North and Turpentine State. Ohio, Buckeye State. Oregon, Pacific State. 
Pennsylvania, Keystone, Iron, and Oil State. Rhode Island, Plantation State and Little Rhodey. South Carolina, Palmetto State. Tennessee, Lion's Den State. Texas, Lone Star State. Utah, Mormon State. Vermont, Green Mountain State. Virginia, Old Dominion. Wisconsin, Badger, and Copper State. Natives of States and Territories. Alabama, Lizards. Arkansas, Toothpicks. California, Gold Hunters. Colorado, Rovers. Connecticut, Wooden Nutmegs. Dakota, Squatters. Delaware, Muskrats. Florida, Fly Up the Creeks. Georgia, Buzzards. Idaho, Fortune Seekers. Illinois, Suckers. Indiana, Hoosiers. Iowa, Hawkeyes. Kansas, Jayhawkers. Kentucky, Corncrackers. Louisiana, Creoles. Maine, Foxes. Maryland, Clam Humpers. Massachusetts, Yankees. Michigan, Wolverines. Minnesota, Gophers. Mississippi, Tadpoles. Missouri, Pukes. Nebraska, Bug Eaters. Nevada, Sage Hens. New Hampshire, Granite Boys. New Jersey, Blues or Clam Catchers. New Mexico, Spanish Indians. New York, Knickerbockers. North Carolina, Tar Heels. Ohio, Buckeyes. Oregon, Hard Cases. Pennsylvania, Penamites or Leatherheads. Rhode Island, Gunflints. South Carolina, Weasels. Tennessee, Whelps. Texas, Beefheads. Utah, Polygamous. Vermont, Green Mountain Boys. Virginia, Beagles. Wisconsin, Badgers. Nicknames of Cities. Atlanta, Gate City of the South. Baltimore, Monumental City. Bangor, Lumber City. Boston, Modern Athens. Literary Emporium, City of Notions, and Hub of the Universe. Brooklyn, City of Churches. Buffalo, Queen of the Lakes. Burlington, Iowa, Orchard City. Charleston, Palmetto City. Chicago, Prairie, or Garden City. Cincinnati, Queen of the West, and Porkopolis. Cleveland, Forest City. Denver, City of the Plains. Detroit, City of the Straits. Hartford, Insurance City. Indianapolis, Railroad City. Keokuk, Gate City. Lafayette, Star City. Leavenworth, Cottonwood City. Louisville, Falls City. Lowell, Spindle City. McGregor, Pocket City. Madison, Lake City. Milwaukee, Cream City. Nashville, Rock City. New Haven, Elm City. New Orleans, Crescent City. New York, Empire City, Commercial Emporium, Gotham, and Metropolis of America. Philadelphia, City of Brotherly Love, City of Penn, Quaker City, and Centennial City. Pittsburgh, Iron City, and Smoky City. Portland, Maine, Hill City. Providence, Roger William City, and Perry Davis Painkiller. Raleigh, Oak City. Richmond, Virginia, Cockade City. Richmond, Indiana, Quaker City of the West. Rochester, Aqueduct City. Salt Lake City, Mormon City. San Francisco, Golden Gate. Savannah, Forest City of the South. Sheboygan, Evergreen City. St. Louis, Mound City. St. Paul, North Star City. Vicksburg, Key City. Washington, City of Magnificent Distances and Federal City. End of Section 9。Section 10 of the Handy Cyclopedia of Things Worth Knowing。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Caitlin Sticko. The Handy Cyclopedia of Things Worth Knowing by Joseph Trenens, published in 1911.
Section 10. Theosophy. Much is said nowadays about theosophy, which is really but another name for mysticism. It is not a philosophy, for it will have nothing to do with philosophical methods. It might be called a religion, though it has never had a following large enough to make a very strong impression on the world's religious history. The name is from the Greek word theosophia, divine wisdom, and the object of theosophical study is professedly to understand the nature of divine things. It differs, however, from both philosophy and theology, even when these have the same object of investigation. For, in seeking to learn the divine nature and attributes, philosophy employs the methods and principles of natural reasoning. Theology uses these, adding to them certain principles derived from revelation. Theosophy, on the other hand, professes to exclude all reasoning processes as imperfect, and to derive its knowledge from direct communication with God himself. It does not, therefore, accept the truths of recorded revelation as immutable, but as subject to modification by later and personal revelations. The theosophical idea has had followers from its earliest times. Since the Christian era, we may class among theosophists such sects as Neoplatonists, the Hesychasts of the Greek Church, the Mystics of medieval times, and, in later times, the disciples of Paracelsus, Thalhauser, Bohm, Swedenborg, and others. Recently, a small sect has arisen which has taken the name of Theosophists. Its leader was an English gentleman who became fascinated with the doctrine of Buddhism. Taking a few of his followers to India, they have been prosecuting their studies there, certain individuals attracting considerable attention by a claim to miraculous powers. It need hardly be said that the revelations they have claimed to receive have been, thus far, without element of benefit to the human race. THE EVOLUTION THEORY the evolution or development theory declares the universe as it now exists to be the result of a long series of changes which were so far related to each other as to form a series of growths analogous to the evolving of the parts of a growing organism. Herbert Spencer defines evolution as a progress from the homogeneous to the heterogeneous, from general to special, from the simple to the complex elements of life, and it is believed that this process can be traced in the formation of worlds in space, in the multiplication of types and species among animals and plants, in the origin and changes of languages and literature and the arts, and also in all the changes of human institutions and society. Asserting the general fact of progress in nature, the evolution theory shows that the method of this progress has been 1. by the multiplication of organs and functions, 2. according to a defined unity of plan, although with 3. intervention of transitional forms, and 4. with modifications dependent upon surrounding conditions. Ancient writers occasionally seem to have a glimmering knowledge of the fact of progress in nature. But as a theory, evolution belongs to the enlightenment of the nineteenth century. Leibniz, in the latter part of the seventeenth century, first uttered the opinion that the earth was once in a fluid condition, and Kant, about the middle of the eighteenth century, definitely propounded the nebular hypothesis, which was enlarged as a theory by the Herschels. The first writer to suggest the transmutation of species among animals was Buffon, about 1750, and other writers followed out the idea. The eccentric Lord Monboddo was the first to suggest the possible descent of man from the ape, about 1774. In 1813, Dr. W. C. Wells first proposed to apply the principle of natural selection to the natural history of man and in 1822 Professor Herbert first asserted the probable transmutation of species of plants. In 1814 a book appeared called Vestiges of Creation, which, though evidently not written by a scientific student, 
yet attracted great attention by its bold and ingenious theories. The authorship of this book was never revealed until after the death of Robert Chambers. A few years since it became known that this publisher, whom no one would ever have suspected of holding such heterodox theories, had actually written it. But the two great apostles of the evolution theory were Charles Darwin and Herbert Spencer. The latter began his great work, The First Principles of Philosophy, showing the application of evolution in facts of life, in 1852. In 1859 appeared Darwin's Origin of Species. The hypothesis of the latter was that different species originated in spontaneous variation, and the survival of the fittest through natural selection and the struggle for existence. This theory was further elaborated and applied by Spencer, Darwin, Huxley, and other writers in Europe and in America, though today by no means all the ideas upheld by these early advocates of the theory are still accepted. Evolution, as a principle, is now acknowledged by nearly all scientists. It is taken to be an established fact in nature, a valid induction from man's knowledge of natural order. THE ENGLISH SPARROW The first English sparrow was brought to the United States in 1850, but it was not until 1870 that the species can be said to have firmly established itself. Since then it has taken possession of the country. Its fecundity is amazing. In the latitude of New York and southward it hatches, as a rule, five or six broods in a season with from four to six young in a brood. Assuming the average annual product of a pair to be twenty-four young, of which half are females and half males, and assuming further, for the sake of computation, that all live, together with their offspring it will be seen that in ten years progeny of a single pair would be two hundred seventy-five billion seven hundred sixteen million nine hundred eighty three thousand six hundred and ninety eight feminine height and weight it is often asked how stout a woman ought to be in proportion to her height a very young girl may becomingly be thinner than a matron but the following table gives a fair indication of proper proportions height to pounds about five feet one hundred five feet one inch one hundred and six five feet two inches one hundred and thirteen five feet three inches one hundred nineteen five feet four inches one hundred thirty five feet five inches one hundred thirty eight five feet six inches one hundred forty four five feet seven inches one hundred fifty five feet eight inches one hundred fifty five five feet nine inches one hundred sixty three five feet five feet ten inches one hundred sixty nine five feet eleven inches one hundred seventy six six feet one hundred eighty six feet one inch one hundred eighty six when a man becomes of age the question sometimes arises whether a man is entitled to vote at an election held on the day preceding the twenty-first anniversary of his birth blackstone in his commentaries book one page four sixty three says quote, full age in male or female is twenty-one years which age is completed on the day preceding the anniversary of a person's birth who till that time is an infant and so styled in law." End quote. The late Chief Justice Sharswood, in his edition of Blackstone's Commentaries, quotes Christian's note on the above as follows, quote, If he is born on the sixteenth day of February, 1608, he is of age to do any legal act on the morning of the fifteenth of February, 1629, though he may not have lived twenty-one years by nearly forty-eight hours. The reason assigned is that in law there is no fraction of a day, and if the birth were on the last second of one day, and the act on the first second of the preceding day twenty-one years after, 
then twenty-one years would be complete, and in the law it is the same whether a thing is done upon one moment of the day or another. End of section 10 Section 11. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa Cho. The Handy Cyclopedia of Things Worth Knowing by Joseph Trenens. Published in 1911. Section 11. Dreams and Their Meaning. The Bible speaks of dreams as being sometimes prophetic or suggestive of future events. This belief has prevailed in all ages and countries, and there are numerous modern examples, apparently authenticated, which would appear to favor this hypothesis. The interpretation of dreams was a part of the business of the soothsayers at the royal courts of Egypt, Babylon, and other ancient nations. Dreams and visions have attracted the attention of mankind of every age and nation. It has been claimed by all nations, both enlightened and heathen, that dreams are spiritual revelations to men, so much so that their modes of worship have been founded upon the interpretation of dreams and visions. Why should we discard the interpretation of dreams while our mode of worship, faith, and knowledge of deity are founded upon the interpretation of the dreams and visions of the prophets and seers of old? Dreams vividly impressed upon the mind are sure to be followed by some event. We read in the Holy Scripture the revelation of the deity to his chosen people through the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. Joel chapter 2 verse 28 Hippocrates says that when the body is asleep the soul is awake, and transports itself everywhere the body would be able to go, knows and sees all that the body could see or know were it awake, that it touches all that the body could touch. In a word, it performs all the actions that the body of a sleeping man could do were he awake. A dream, to have a significance, must occur to the sleeper while in healthy and tranquil sleep. Those dreams of which we have not a vivid conception or clear remembrance have no significance. Those of which we have a clear remembrance must have formed in the mind in the latter part of the night, for up to that time the faculties of the body have been employed in digesting the events of the day. Dictionary of Dreams Note, if you do not find the word you want, look for a word of identical or closely similar meaning. A. Abundance Deceitful security Accident unexpected meeting, acorn, irreparable fault, account of possessions, bankruptcy, adultery that you commit, scandal, misfortune, and disgrace, air, clear and serene, reconciliation, air, dark and gloomy, sadness and sickness, almonds, Peace, happiness. Almond tree, success in business. Altar, prosperity, speedy marriage. Alms, giving, mediocrity. Alms, receiving, privations. Anchor, safe enterprise. Angry, that you are, many powerful enemies. Ape, enemies. Deceit. Apples. Gain. Profit. Apples to be eating. Disappointment. Apricots. Health. Contentment. Apple tree. Good news. Apple tree if dead. Ill news. Artichokes. Embarrassment. Pain. Argument. Justice done. Arm, right arm cut off, 
death of a female relative both arms cut off captivity and sickness arm broken or withered sorrows losses and widowhood arm swollen sudden fortune coming to a dear friend ashes misfortune asparagus success profit ass quarrel between friends ass when sleeping security ass when braying dishonor ass ears of one scandal ass one laden profit aunt wealth and friends angel good news ants time spent to no purpose authority to have easy times b babe happy marriage baker gain balloon literary note barley good fortune basket increase baboon affronts ball for dancing jealousy rage then harmony bank never to be rich except by saving barber a long story discontent barn full wealthy marriage bath marriage bath too cold grief bath too hot separation bath in running water disappointment bath in stagnant water misfortune beggar help when not expected bells alarm misfortune bear danger misfortune beans quarrels bed botheration unrest beer fatigue to no purpose bees profit bees to catch success bees stung by to be overworked blind person false friends blows to give forgiveness blows to receive advantage boots new success in love and business boots old quarreling and failure bonnet new flirtation bonnet old or torn rivalry boat on clear water happiness boat in muddy water disgrace bones large acquisition by small degrees book information bow and arrows love affairs bottles a feast bottles broken sickness Bottles empty, melancholy. Bouquet to carry, marriage. Bouquet to destroy, separation. Bouquet to throw away, displeasure. Brandy, depravity. Brook clear, lasting friendship. Brook troubled, domestic quarrel. Briars, disputes. Betrothal, brief pleasures. Birds, new pleasures. Birds singing, love, good fortune. Bite, mistrust, ingratitude. Billiards, hazards, dissipation. Biscuit, rejoicings, jolly feasting. Blessing or benediction, a forced marriage. Blackbird, scandal, deceit. Bridge, to pass one, success through industry. Bridge, to fall from, loss of business and disappointment in love. Bread, profit. Bread white, lasting affection. Bread black, inconstancy. 
Bugs. Enemies seeking to do injury. Bull, peaceful. Gain. Bull, onset of. Apprehension. Butcher. Death of a friend. Butterfly. Inconstancy. Butter. Surprises. Butter, to make. A legacy. C. Cabbage. Health and long life. Cage with bird. Liberty. Cage without bird. Imprisonment. Cakes. Meeting with friends. Cakes, to make or eat. Prosperity. Calf. Assured success. Camel. Riches. Candle. Favors praise. Candy. Ardent love. Cane. Correction. Cards. Married life. Carpenter. Arrangement of affairs. Cart. Sickness and disgrace. Cave. Quarrel. Loss. Carving. Business prosperity. Cat to see. Treason. Cat to kill. Family quarrels. Cellar full. Passing renown. Cellar empty. Health. Cemetery to see. Future prosperity. Cemetery to be in. News of a death. Chain. Union. Chain broken. Rupture. Challenge. Rupture. Illusion. Cherries. Health. Cherries to gather. Deception by a woman. Cherries to eat. Love. Chicken. Cooking. Good news. Cheese. Vexation and after success. Chestnuts. Home troubles. Child. Pretty. Pleasure. Child ugly. Danger. Child running. Business difficulty. Church. Heritage. Church to pray in. Deceit. Church to speak aloud in. Domestic quarrels. Chess. Affairs embarrassed. Cider. Distant heritage. Dispute. Clams. Small possessions stingily kept. Clock. Marriage. Clock striking. A competency. Coal. Persecution. Cock. Pride, power, success. Cock when crowing, sudden trouble. Cock to fighting, expensive follies. Colic, bickerings, estrangement. Corkscrew, vexatious inquiries. Corpse, long life, news of the living. Corpse one disinterred, infidelity. Cow. Prosperity, abundance. Cobbler. Long toil, ill paid. Coffee. Misfortune. Coffin. Speedy marriage. Cooking. A wedding. Corn. Riches. Corn to grind. Abundance. Crabs. Ill results of endeavor. Cradle or crib. Increase in the family. Cricket. Hospitality, home comfort. Crocodile. A catastrophe. Cross to see. Disquiet. Cross to bear. Tranquility. Crow. Disappointed expectations, humiliations. Crow to hear, disgrace. Crowd, 
many matters, much to hear. Crutches, to use, gambling losses. Crutches to break or leave, recovery. Cucumber, serious illness. Currants, red, friendship. Currants, white, satisfaction. Currants, black, infidelity. Cypress, despair, death of one cherished. D. Dancing, to engage in. Successful endeavor. Dancing to see, weariness. Debts denied. Business safety. Debts admitted, distress. Doctor, robustness. Doctor to be one, enjoyment. Dog, friendly services. Dog to play with, suffering through extravagance. Desertion, good news, permanence. Devil, temptations. Diamonds, brief elusive happiness. Diamonds to find, loss. Diamonds to sell, peril. Dice, doubt, risks. Dirt, sickness, detraction. Dispute, friendly. See argument. Dispute, not friendly. See quarrel. Dishes, possessions. Dishes breaking, family quarrels. Ditch, bankruptcy. Door, open, opportunities. Door, closed, unfruitful adventure. Door, to force, reproof. Dove, home happiness, a lover. Drafts, to play at, disappointment. Drawing, a proposal for rejection. Drowning, happiness. Drum, small difficulties, trifling loss. Duck, profit and pleasure. Duck, to kill one, misfortune. Duel, rivalries, dissension. Dumb, oneself, quarrels. Dumb, another, peace. Dwarf, feeble foes. Dire, embarrassed affairs. E. Eagle, worthy ambition. Eagle, kill one, gratified wishes. Eating, botheration. Eclipse, the sun. Loss. Eclipse, the moon. Profit. Eels, alive. Vexation. Eels dead. Vengeance satisfied. Eggs a few. Riches. Eggs many. Misadventure. Elephant. Power. Elephant feed one. Gain of a service. Embroidery. Love. Ambition. Epitaph. Indiscretion. Eyes. Bad luck. F. Face smiling. Joy. Face pale. Trouble. Fares. Sudden loss. Falling. Dangerous elevation. Falling in a hole. Calumny. Disappointment. Fan. Pride. Rivalry. Farmer. Full, good living. Fatigue. Successful enterprise. Father-in-law. Unlucky. Feast. Trouble ahead. Feathers white. Great joy, friendship. Feathers black. Hindrances. Fields. Joy, good health, domestic happiness. Fingers scalded. Envy. Fingers cut. Grief. Fingers to see more than five on one hand. New relatives. Figs dried. Festivity. 
figs green hope figs to eat transient pleasures flowers happiness flowers to gather benefit flowers to cast away quarrels flute news of a birth fire anger danger firearms to see anger firearms blaze of spite firearms to hear havoc fish success joy fish to catch deceit of friends flag contention flag to bear fame honor flame luminous good news fleas unhappiness fleas to kill triumph over enemies flies that someone is jealous of us flood misfortunes calumny fog deception forest loss shame fountain abundance health fox to be duped fox to kill to triumph over enemies frogs distrust frogs hopping vexation annoyance fruits joy prosperity gain fruits to eat be deceived by a woman fruits throw away trouble through others envy funeral inheritance news of a birth or marriage fur on the body health and long life g gallows dignities and honors proportionate to height gambling deception game live adventure garden bright future days garden well kept increase of fortune garden disorderly business losses and failure garlic deceived by a woman garments annoyance garments white innocence comfort garments black death of a friend garments torn or soiled sadness misfortune garter happy marriage gauze affected modesty ghost white consolation ghost black temptation gift from a man danger gift from a woman spite gloves friendly advances goat white prosperity goat black sickness gold profit fortune goose same as duck goose catch one ensnarement grandparents occasion for repentance grapes enjoyment rejoicing grapes scant or poor deprivations grass green long life grasshopper lost harvest or savings grave open loss of a friend grave filled up good fortune guitar deception ill conduct gypsy small troubles h Hail, trouble, sadness. Hair, orderly. Comfort, complacency. Hair, tangled, perplexities. Hair, falling out, anxieties. Ham, happiness. Harp, a handsome partner. Harvest, wealth in the country. Hay, abundance. Heart, pain or troubles, sickness, danger. Heaven, some joyful event will happen. Hell, 
you lead a bad life and should reform before it is too late. Hen, profit. Hen, hear one, consolation. Hen, one laying, joy. Herbs, prosperity. Herbs to eat, grief. Hermit, treacherous friend. Hill, up one, success. Hill down, misadventure. Hole, obstacles, see falling. Holly, annoyance. Honey, success in business. Horse, see white one, unexpected good fortune. Horse, see black one, partial success. Horse, mount or ride, success in enterprise. Horse, curry one, a speedy journey. Hotel, see one, wandering. Hotel, be in, discomfort. House, new or strange, consolation. House, many, bewilderment. Hunger, profitable employment. Hunt, snares, accusations. Husband, if a wife dreams that her husband is married to another, it betokens separation. I. Ice. Treachery, misadventure. Imps. Occasion for caution. Infants. Connubial felicity. Ink. Reconciliation. Ink upset. Separation. Insanity. Bright ideas wise thought. Iron, cruel experience. Island, solitude, loneliness. Itch, small foes. Ivory, profitable enterprise. Intoxication, oneself, pleasures. Intoxication, another, scandal. Ivy, children many and handsome. J. Jail, to enter. Safety. Jail, leaving one. Single blessedness. Jaw, riches in the family. Jew, trickery. Joy, bad news. Judge, punishment. Jug, loss through awkwardness or neglect. K. Keys. Explanations, progress in knowledge. Keys to lose, perplexity. Killing, to see, security. Killing oneself, love quarrels. Killing another, jealousy. Kids, consolation. King, satisfaction, progress in affairs. Kiss, in the light. True love. Kiss in the dark. Wrists. Kiss a stranger. A new lover. Kiss a rival. Treason. Kiss married woman kissed by a stranger. A new baby and a jealous husband. Kitchen. Arrivals. Kite. Vain glory. Knife. Inconstancy. Dissension. Knitting, mischievous talk, malice. Knots, embarrassments, difficulties. L. Labor, conjugal happiness, increase of fortune. Ladder to go up, brief glory. Ladder to go down, debasement. Lady, humiliation. Lady many, gossip. Lambs to see, peace. Lambs to have, profit. Lambs to carry, success. Lambs to buy, great surprise. Lambs to kill, secret grief. Lame person, business misfortune. Lamps unlit, neglect. Lamps lighted, love troubles. Landscape, 
Unexpected gain. Lantern lighted. Safe adventure. Lantern unlit. Blunder. Larks. Riches. Elevation. Laughter. Troubled happiness. Botheration. Leg. If sound and supple. Successful enterprise. Prosperous journey. Letter. To see. Discovery. Letter to receive. Good news from afar. Lice. Wealth. Lightning. A love quarrel. Lily. Faded. Vain hopes. Lily. Fine. Innocence. Happiness. Linen. Fortune. Abundance. Lion. Future dignity. Liver. Losses. Discomforts. Lizard. Snares of dubious origin. Laurel. Honor. Gain. Lawyer. Marriage of a friend. Lead. Accusations. Ingratitude. Leaves. Transient indisposition. Leech. Aid in trouble. Leech. Many of them. Extortion. Usury. Leeks. Labor. Lettuce. Poverty. Locksmith. Robbery. Lottery tickets. Number distinct. Success in affairs. Lottery tickets. Number indistinct. Foolish expenditure. Love. An all-round good indication. Lovers. Troubles and joys mixed. M. Macaroni. Distress. Man handsome. Love. Man ugly. Wrangles. Mantle. Victimizing. Manure. Depravity. Shame. Maps. A journey. Marble. Estrangements. Markets. A busy one. Joyous events. Markets. Empty. Deprivations. Marsh. Unfruitful endeavors. Masks. Hypocrisy. Measles. Wealth coupled with disgrace. Meat. Roast. Kind reception. Meat boiled. Melancholy. Melon. Hope. Success. Mice. Annoyances. Milestone. Desires accomplished. Milk. Love affairs. Mills. Legacy from a relative. Mire. Mistakes. Privations. Mirror. To look in. Misunderstanding. Mirror broken. Misadventure. Money. Losses in business. Money to find. Tardy discoveries. Money. Lender. Persecution. Monkey. Harmless mischief. Moon. Love. Moon bright. Continual pleasure. Moon clouded. Sickness. Danger to one beloved. Moon full. Wealth. Moon new. Awakening affection. Moon failing. Deceit. Moon red. Renown. Morning. Impending happiness. Invitation to a ball or wedding. Mouth. Closed so that cannot eat. Sudden death. Mouth wider than usual. Riches. Mud, riches. Mule, difficulty. Music, ease, pleasure. Mustard, troubles. Myrtle, love declaration. N. Nails, broken. Misadventure. Nails very long. Emoluments. Nakedness, threatened danger. Navigating. Approaching journey. Necklace. Jealousy. Annoyance. Needles. Disappointment in love. 
Negro, vexation, annoyance. Nest, good luck, profit. Newspaper, botheration, gossip. Night, walking, uneasiness, melancholy. Nightingale, happy marriage. Knows that yours is large, prosperity and acquaintance with rich people. Nurse, long life. Nuts, peace and satisfaction after trouble and difficulty. O, oak, green, health, strength. Oak, dead or fallen, heavy losses. Oars, safe enterprise. Oars to break or lose, dependence. Offer of marriage, new lovers. Office, turn out of, death or loss of property. Oil, good harvest. Old person, man, prudence, wisdom. Old person, woman. Scandal. Olives, honors and dignities. Onions, aggravation, dispute with inferiors. Opera, pleasure followed by pain. Orange blossom, a marriage. Oranges, amusement, pleasure. Oranges sour, chagrin, injury. Orchard, much of nothing. Ostrich, misadventure through vanity. Oven, ease, riches. Oven hot, feasting. Owl, secrets revealed. Oysters, satiety. P, pain, trouble and recovery. Painter, that everything will be lovely. Palm tree, Honor, power, victory. Paper, tidings. Paper colored, deceit. Paper painted, brief happiness. Parent, good news. Parrot, a bad neighbor, tail bearing. Pastry to eat, annoyance. Pastry to make, good times. Paths, straight. Happiness. Paths crooked, ill to the willful. Pawnbroker, little result of big endeavor. Peacock, peril through pride, ambition, or unwariness. Peaches, contentment, pleasure. Pearls, tears, distress. Pears, treachery. Pears to eat, tidings of death. Pairs to gather, festivities. Peas, good fortune. Pens, tidings. Peddler, you are mistaken in your estimate of a friend. Pepper, affliction, vexation. Pheasant, good fortune. Pheasant to kill one, peril. Pheasant to carry one, honor. Piano, Disputes. Pig, pork, few, avarice. Pig, pork, many, profits. Pigeon, reconciliation. Pillow, disturbance. Pills, trouble. Pine tree, danger. Pins, contradiction. Pirates, fortunate adventure. Pitch, evil companions. Pitchfork, punishment. Playing, entertainment. Plums, pleasure, happiness. Policeman, trouble. Pomegranate, power. Postman, news from the absent. Poverty, thrift, advantage. Preserves. Loss of time and money. Priest, reconciliation. Procession, happy love. Pump, if water, marriage and fortune. Pump, if dry, flirtation. 
Purchase on credit. Deprivations. Purchase for cash. Possessions. Purse. Empty. Something to get. Purse full. Pride disquiet. Puzzle. Favors pleasure. Q. Quail. Family responsibilities. Quarrel. Constancy, friendship. Queen. Prosperity. Questions. Wisdom. Quill. Particular information. Quoits. Rivalries. R. Rabbit. White. Friendship. Rabbit. Black. Trouble. Rabbit. Many. Extensive pleasures. Racing. Success in life. Radishes. That you will discover secrets. Raft. New views. Rain. Legacy or gift. Rainbow. Separation. Rat. Secret enemies. Rat. White. Triumph over enemies. Raven. Misfortune. Raven. Hear one. Grief. Reading. Venturesomeness. Reaper. A picnic party. Revenge. Repentance. Ribbons. Prodigality. Rice. Talking. Ride with men. It is a good sign. Ride with women. A bad sign. Ring. Approaching marriage. Riot. Scarcity through mischief. Rival. Quarrels. River. Success in enterprise. River to fall in. Attempts of enemies. River to throw oneself in. Confusion in affairs. Robber. Fear. Rock. Annoyance. Rock to surmount. Difficulties overcome. Roof. Adventure abroad. Roses. Always of happy omen. Roses full blown. Health, joy, abundance. Roses faded. Success with some drawbacks. Roses white. Innocence. Roses red. Satisfaction. Roses yellow. Jealousy. Ruffles. Honors. Profitable occupation. Ruins. Pleasant surprises. Rust. Idle times. Decay. Failure. S. Sailor. Tidings from abroad. Salad. Embarrassments. Salt. Wisdom. Satin or silk. Gain. Sausage. Affliction. Sickness. Saw. Satisfactory conclusion in affairs. Scissors. Enemies. Hatred. Scratches. Inconveniences. Annoyances. Screech owl. Death of near relative. Sculptor. Prophet. C. Long journey. Large affairs. Sea beach. Tranquilly. Secretary. Fortune. Serenade. News of a marriage. Sermon. Weariness. Sleeplessness. Servant, man, abuse of confidence. Servant, maid, suspicion. Sewing, plots. Shawl, a fine one, honors. Shawl, thin or old, shame. Shawl, torn, detraction. Sheep, great gain. Shell, filled, success. Shell empty, ill omen. Shepherd, malice. Ship, wishes fulfilled. Ship in danger, unexpected good fortune. Shoes, advantageous speculation. Shoes much worn, a speedy journey. Shop, to be in, pleasure denied. 
Shop to conduct. Dues withheld. Shroud. Death. Singing. Vexation. Skating. To see. Hindrances. Crosses. Skating to do. Success. Skeleton. Disgust. Sky. Clear. Happiness. Peace. Sky clouded. Misfortune. Sleep. Elusive security. Slippers. Comfort. Satisfaction. Smoke. Extravagant expectations. Snail. Infidelity. Dishonor. Snakes. Treason. Betrayal. Sneezing. Long life. Snow. In season. Good harvest. Snow unseasonable. Discouragement. Soap. Revelations. Assistance. Soldier. Quarrels. Soup. Return of health or fortune. Spectacles. Melancholy. Obstacles. Spider in the dark. Gain. Spider in the light. Contention. Spider kill one. Pleasure. Sponge. Greed. Avarice. Sports. Pleasure and after regrets. Spot on clothes. Sadness. Spot on the sun. Baseless fears. Spy to be one. Reprehension. Spy to see. Rumors. Stable. Hospitality, welcome. Stag, gain. Stag, chase one, business failure. Stammer, decision, resolution. Stars, happiness. Stars, pale, affliction. Stars, shooting, death of a relative. Stocking, to pull off, comfort. Stocking, to pull on, Discomfort. Stocking new, a visit. Stocking a hole in, deceitful fortune. Stones underfoot, trouble, suffering. Stones thrown or falling, malice. Storks, loss, robbery. Storm, contest, vexation. Stove, riches. Stranger, return of a lost friend. Strange bed, contentment. Strange room, a mystery solved. Strawberries, unexpected good fortune. Straws, poverty. Street, to walk in, a favorable reception. Sugar, privation and want. Sun, bright. Discovery of secrets. Sun clouded. Bad news. Sun rising. Success. Sun setting. Losses. Supper. News of a birth. Swallow. Successful enterprise. Swans. Private riches. Swearing. Disagreeables. Sweeping. Confidence well placed. Swimming, enjoyment. Swords, misfortune. Tea. Table, joy. Table to set, abundance. Tailor, unfaithfulness. Tea, confusion, encumbrance. Tears, joy, comfort. Teeth, handsome. Health, goodness. Teeth mean or drawn, vexation, loss. Ten pins, undesirable adventures. Tent, quarrels. Theater, sadness, loss. Thicket, evasions, apprehensions. Thief, to be one, loss. Thief, to lose by one, good speculations. Thimble, work hard to find. Thirst, affliction. 
Thistle Disputes, folly. Thorns Disappointment, pain. Thorns to be pricked by, loss of money. Thread Intrigue Thread tangled, confusion of affairs. Thread to break, failure. Thread to split, a secret betrayed. Thunder, danger. Thunder to see thunderbolt fall, death of a friend. Tiger, fierce enmity. Toads, something to disgust. Tomb, family matters, nuptials, births. Torches. Invitation to a wedding. Trap door open. A secret divulged. Trap door shut. Mystery. Travel on foot. Work. Travel on wheels. Fortune. Treasure that you find one. Disappointment. Trees in general. Green hope. Withered grief. Leafless deceit. Cut down, robbery, to climb, change of employment. Trousers, honors and responsibilities. Turkey, if you dream of a turkey you will shortly see a fool. Turnips, disappointment, annoyance. Twins, honors, riches. You, umbrella to a lady, a new lover. Umbrella to a gentleman, a breach of promise suit. Uncle, advantageous marriage. Undress oneself, rebuke. Undress another, scandal. Uniform to see, humbling. Uniform to wear, flattery. V. Vegetables, in general, weary toil. Vegetables to gather, quarrels. Vegetables to eat, business losses. Veil, marriage. Veil black, death or separation. Veins, grief. Vermin, enough and to spare. Villain, danger of losing property. Vine, fruitfulness, abundance. Vinegar to drink, wrangles. Vinegar spoiled, sickness. Violets, success of undertakings. Violin in concert, sympathy, consolation. Violin alone, bereavement. Visitors, loneliness. Virgin, joy without regret. Virgin pretended one. Sorrow, evil. Vulture, bitter enmity. Vulture, kill one, triumph over foes. Vulture, one feeding, returning fortune. W. Wagon, loaded, emolument. Wagon, empty, ease, pleasure. Wake, poverty and misery. Wall, Obstacles. Wall to be on. Prosperity. War. Misunderstandings and contention. Wardrobe. Advantage. Wash day. New friends. Good resolutions. Wasps. Annoyance. Wasps to be stung. Affronts. Watch. Time well employed. Watchman. Trifling loss. Water, see bath, drink. Water to drink, a marriage or birth. Water to fall into, reconciliation. Water carrier, gain. Wax, desirable marriage. Weasel, to be outwitted. Wedding, unexpected danger, troubled happiness. Well, draw water from. Good fortune. Well fall into. Peril. Wheat. Money. Wheelbarrow. Wheel. Disability. Infirmity. Whirlwind. 
danger, scandal. Widowhood, satisfaction, new belongings. Wife, if a man dreams he sees his wife married to another, it betokens a separation. Wolf, enmity. Wolf to kill one, gain, success. Woman, deceit. Woman fair, love. Woman ugly, scandal. Woodcutter, labor without profit. Woods, to rich, loss. Woods, to poor, profit. Work, of right hand, prosperity. Work, of left hand, impecuniosity. Worms, secret enemies, ill health. Wreck, catastrophes peril, writing, pleasant and profitable discovery. Why? Yeast, increase, abundance. Yoke, responsibilities, particularly of marriage. Youth, good time, light responsibilities. End of section 11. Section 12 of the Handy Cyclopedia of Things Worth Knowing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Caitlin Sticko. The Handy Cyclopedia of Things Worth Knowing by Joseph Trenens, published in 1911. Section 12. THE LANGUAGE OF FLOWERS Flowers may be combined and arranged so as to express even the nicest shades of sentiment. If a flower is offered reversed, its direct significance is likewise reversed, so that the flower now means its opposite. A rosebud, divested of its thorns, but retaining its leaves, conveys the sentiment, I fear no longer, I hope. Stripped of leaves and thorns, it signifies, there is nothing to hope or fear. A full-blown rose placed over two buds signifies secrecy. Yes is implied by touching the flower given to the lips. No by pinching off a petal and casting it away. I am is expressed by a laurel leaf twined around the bouquet. I have by an ivy leaf folded together. I offer you by a leaf of Virginia creeper. Combinations and their meaning. Moss, rosebud, and myrtle, a confession of love. Mignonette and colored daisy, your qualities surpass your charms of beauty. Lily of the valley and ferns, your unconscious sweetness has fascinated me. Yellow rose, broken straw, and ivy. Your jealousy has broken our friendship. Scarlet geranium, passion flower, purple hyacinth, and arbor vitae. I trust you will find consolation through faith in your sorrow. Be assured of my unchanging friendship. Columbine, day lily broken straw, witch hazel, and colored daisy. Your folly and coquetry have broken the spell of your beauty. White pink, canary grass, and laurel. Your talent and perseverance will win you glory. Goldenrod and monkshead, sweet pea and forget-me-not. Be cautious, danger is near. I depart soon, forget-me-not. Significance of single flowers. Arbor vitae, unchanging friendship. Camellia, white, loveliness. Candy tuft, indifference. Carnation, deep red. Alas for my poor heart. Carnation, white, disdain. China aster, variety. Clover, four leaf, be mine. Clover, white, 
think of me. Clover, red, industry. Columbine, folly. Columbine, purple, resolved to win. Daisy, innocence. Dead leaves, sadness. Deadly nightshade, falsehood. Fern, fascination. Forget-me-not, true love, and forget-me-not. Fuchsia, scarlet, taste. Geranium, rose, preference. Geranium, scarlet, consolation. Goldenrod, be cautious. Heliotrope, devotion. Honeyflower, love, sweet and secret. Hyacinth, white unobtrusive loveliness, ivy, fidelity, lady's slipper, win me and wear me, lily, day, coquetry, lily, white, sweetness, lily, yellow, gaiety, lily of the valley, return of happiness, mignonette, your qualities surpass your charm, monk's head, danger is near, Myrtle, love, oats, the witching soul of music, orange blossom, chastity, pansy, thoughts, passion flower, faith, peach blossom, I am your captive, pear, affection, primrose, inconstancy, quaking grass, agitation, Rose, love, rose deep red, bashful shame, rose yellow, jealousy, rose white, I am worthy of you, rosebud, moss, confession of love, shamrock, light-heartedness, straw, agreement, straw, broken, broken agreement, sweet pea, depart, Tuberose, dangerous pleasures, verbena, pray for me, witch hazel, a spell. Alphabet of advice to writers. A. A word out of place spoils the most beautiful thought. Voltaire. B. Begin humbly, labor faithfully, be patient. Elizabeth Stuart Phelps. C. Cultivate accuracy in words and things. Amass sound knowledge. Avoid all affectation. Write all topics which interest you. F. W. Newman D. Don't be afraid. Fight right along. Hope right along. S. L. Clemens E. Every good writer has much idiom. It is the life and spirit of language. W. S. Landor F. Follow this. If you write from the heart, you will write to the heart. Beaconsfield G. Genius may begin great works, but only continued labor completes them. Joubert H. Half the writer's art consists in learning what to leave in the inkpot. Stevenson I. It is by suggestion, not cumulation, that profound impressions are made on the imagination. Lowell. J. Joy in one's work is an asset beyond the valuing in mere dollars. C. D. Warner. K. Keep writing, and profit by criticism. Use for a motto Michelangelo's wise words. Genius is infinite patience. L. M. Alcott L. Let me never tag a moral to a story, nor tell a story without a meaning. Van Dyke M. More failures come from vanity than carelessness. Joseph Jefferson N. Never do a pot-boiler. Let one of your best things go to boil the pot. O. Henry O. 
originality does not mean oddity, but freshness. It means vitality, not novelty. Norman Hapgood P. Pluck feathers from the wings of your imagination, and stick them in the tail of your judgment. Horace Greeley Q. Quintessence approximates genius. Gather much thought into few words. Schopenhauer R. Revise, revise, revise. E. E. Hale S. Simplicity has been held a mark of truth. It is also a mark of genius. Carlyle T. The first principle of composition of whatever sort is that it should be natural and appear to have happened so. Frederick Macmonies U. Utilize your enthusiasm. Get the habit of happiness in your work. Beveridge V. Very few voices but sound repellent under violent exertion. Lessing W. Whatever in this world one has to say, there is a word, and just one word to express it. Seek that out and use it. De ma passant. Why? Yes, yes. Believe me, you must draw your pen, not once, not twice, but o'er and o'er again, through what you've written, if you would entice the man who reads you once to read you twice. Horace Connington, T.R. Z. Zeal with scanty capacity often accomplishes more than capacity with no zeal at all. George Eliot What different eyes indicate the long, almond-shaped eye, with thick eyelids covering nearly half of the pupil, when taken in connection with the full brow, is indicative of genius, and is often found in artists, literary, and scientific men. It is the eye of talent, or impressibility. The large, open, transparent eye, of whatever color, is indicative of elegance, of taste, of refinement, of wit, of intelligence. Weakly marked eyebrows indicate a feeble constitution and a tendency to melancholia. Deep sunken eyes are selfish, while eyes in which the whole iris shows indicate erraticism, if not lunacy. Round eyes are indicative of innocence, strongly protuberant eyes of weakness of both mind and body. Eyes small and close together typify cunning, while those far apart and open indicate frankness. The normal distance between the eyes is the width of one eye. A distance greater or less than this intensifies the character supposed to be symbolized. Sharp angles, turning down at the corners of the eyes, are seen in persons of acute judgment and penetration. Well-opened, steady eyes belong to the sincere, wide, staring eyes to the impertinent. THE MYSTERIES OF PALMISTRY The following points, upon which the science of palmistry is based, explain its mysteries, and will be found very interesting, amusing, and instructive. FORM OF THE HAND Hands are classed into seven types, each of which is illustrated by the cuts on the preceding page, and described as follows. Plate 1. The elementary or bilious hand, indicating brutal instinct instead of reason as the governing power of the character. The plate that this text refers to is of a hand showing heavy short fingers, small short nails, and a short thumb. The palm is small and square. Return to text. Plate 2. The square or Jupiter hand, indicating a practical, stubborn, methodical, and conventional character, one apt to be suspicious of strangers and radical in views. The plate that this text refers to is of a hand showing a wide square palm, a thick square wrist, squared off fingertips, and a very fat short thumb. Return to text. Plate 3. The spatulate or nervous hand, so named because of its imagined resemblance to a spatula. It is broad at the base of the fingers, 
and indicates great energy and push to discover, also courage and fearlessness. The plate that this text refers to is of a hand showing fingers and nails flattened like a spatula. The thumb is long and tapered. Return to text. Plate 4. The philosophic, or Venus hand, has a long, thin, muscular palm, with long, knotty fingers, indicates a student of nature and a searcher after truth. The plate that this text refers to is of a long, irregular-looking hand, with very knotty joints, long, bony fingers, and nails shaped like squat cones. Return to text. Plate 5. The Mercury, or Artistic Hand, indicates quick temper, impulsiveness, a character that is light-hearted, gay, and charitable today, and tomorrow sad, tearful, and uncharitable. The plate that this text refers to is of a hand with smooth fingers, a long palm, and unusually long, large thumb. Return to text. Plate 6. The lunar or idealistic hand indicates an extremely sensitive nature. The plate that this text refers to is of a small, slender hand, with tapering fingers and a sharply tapered thumb. Return to text. Plate 7. The harmonic or solar hand indicates a character of great versatility, brilliant in conversation, and an adept in diplomacy. The plate that this text refers to is a hand of ordinary proportions, somewhat squared but not thick, with a well-proportioned thumb. Return to text. The fingers. For fortune-telling, the fingers from first to fourth are designated as Jupiter, Saturn, Apollo, and Mercury. Note the cut on the preceding page, representing the different types of fingers, numbered from 1 to 11. 1. Large fingers indicate a person of vulgar tastes and a cruel selfish disposition. 2. Small, thin fingers indicate a keen, quick-acting mind and a person not very particular about personal appearance. 3. Long, lean fingers indicate an inquiring disposition, love of details and narrative. Short fingers imply simple tastes and selfishness. 4. Fat fingers, largely developed at base, indicate sensualness. If small at the base, the reverse. 5. Smooth fingers indicate artistic ability. 6. Naughty fingers indicate truthfulness and good order in business affairs. 7. Pointed fingers indicate a very magnetic and enthusiastic personality. 8. Square fingers indicate a strong mind, regularity and love of good order. 9. Spatulate fingers indicate a character of positiveness in opinions and lacking in gentleness. 10. Fingers of mixed shape indicate a harmonious disposition with the ability to easily adapt oneself to all conditions. 11. Obtuse fingers indicate coarse and cruel sensibilities. The Phalanges of the Fingers See Plate 8, 1, 2, 3, The Phalanges of the Thumb. 4, 5, 6, repeated on each finger, indicate the phalanges of the four fingers. The plate that this text refers to numbers the phalanges of the fingers and thumb from the tip to the base. Return to text. The Mounts of the Hands See Plate 9 A. Mount Venus B. Mount Jupiter C. Mount Saturn D. Mount Apollo E. Mount Mercury F. Mount Luna G. Mount Mars The plate that this text refers to marks the fleshy bases of each digit as follows. The thumb as Mount Venus the first or pointer finger as Mount Jupiter, the middle finger as Mount Saturn, the ring finger as Mount Apollo, and the pinky finger as Mount Mercury. The fleshy base opposite the thumb is marked as Mount Luna, and Mount Mars is marked as both the space between this and the pinky finger, and also the thumb mount and the pointer mount, 
In other words, Mount Mars is marked as the middle of both sides of the palm. Return to text. The shape and length of the phalanges represent certain qualities and features of the character as presented in the following. Jupiter, the first finger. If the phalange is no longer than the second, it indicates ability to control others, direct and maintain order. If the second phalange is long and well developed, it indicates leadership, if short and thin, intellectual weakness. If the third phalange is long, it indicates love of power in material things. Saturn, second finger. If the first phalange is longer than the second, it indicates ability for mastering scientific subjects. If the second phalange is long, it indicates great interest in subjects requiring deep study. If the third phalange is long, it indicates a love of metaphysics and money. Apollo, third finger. If the first phalange is longer than the second, it indicates love of arts. If the second phalange is longer, it indicates success and love of riches. If the third phalange is thick, it indicates an inherent talent of the arts. Mercury, fourth finger. If the first phalange is longer than the second, it indicates a taste for and love of research. If the second phalange is long and well developed, it indicates industrious habits. If the third phalange is long and fat, it indicates a desire for the comforts of life. The Mountains These are points or elevations on the palm. Mount Venus, if prominent, indicates a person of strong passions, great energy in business, and admiration of physical beauty and the opposite sex. It also indicates love of children, home and wife or husband. When not well developed, there is a lack of love for home, children, wife or husband, and in a man it indicates egotism and laziness, in a woman, hysteria. Mount Jupiter, if prominent, indicates a person who is generous, loves power, and is brilliant in conversation. If a woman, she desires to shine and be a social leader. When not well developed, it indicates lack of self-esteem slovenliness, and indifference to personal appearance. Mount Saturn, if prominent, indicates a serious-minded person, religiously inclined, slow to reach a conclusion, very prudent, free in the expression of opinions, but inclined to be pessimistic. Mount Apollo, if prominent, indicates ability as an artist, generosity, courageousness, and a poetical nature apt to be a spendthrift. When not well developed, it indicates cautiousness and prudence. Mount Mercury, if prominent, indicates keen perceptions, cleverness in conversation, a talent for the sciences, industry, and deceitfulness. If not well developed, it indicates a phlegmatic, stupid disposition. Mount Luna, if prominent, indicates a dreamy, changeable, capricious, enthusiastic, and inventive nature. When not well developed, it indicates constancy, love of home, and ability to imitate others. Mount Mars, if prominent, indicates self-respect, coolness, and control of self under trying circumstances, courage, venturesomeness, and confidence in one's ability for anything undertaken. When not well developed, it indicates the opposite of these characteristics. Lines on the hand If the lines on the hand are not well defined, this fact indicates poor health. Deep red lines indicate good, robust health. Yellow lines indicate excessive biliousness. Dark colored lines indicate a melancholy and reserved disposition. The lifeline extends from the outer base of Mount Jupiter entirely around the base of Mount Venus. The lifeline extends from the outer base of Mount Jupiter entirely around the base of Mount Venus. If chained under Jupiter, it indicates bad health in early life. 
Hair lines extending from it imply weakness, and if cut by small lines from Mount Venus, misplaced affections and domestic broils. If arising from Mount Jupiter, an ambition is to be wealthy and learned. If it is joined by the line of the head at its beginning, prudence and wisdom are indicated. If it joins heart and headlines at its commencement, a great catastrophe will be experienced by the person so marked. A square on it denotes success. All lines that follow give it strength. Lines that cut the lifeline extending through the heart line denote interference in a love affair. If it is crossed by small lines, illness is indicated. Short and badly drawn lines, unequal in size, imply bad blood and a tendency to fevers. The heart line, if it extends across the hand at the base of the finger mounts, and is deep and well defined, indicates purity and devotion. If well defined from the mount of Jupiter only, a jealous and tyrannical disposition is indicated. If it begins at Mount Saturn, and is without branches, it is a fatal sign. If short and well defined in the harmonic type of hand, it indicates intense affection when it is reciprocated. If short on the Mercury type of hand, it implies deep interest in intellectual pursuits. If short and deep in the elementary type hand, it implies the disposition to satisfy desire by brutal force, instead of by love. The headline is parallel to the heart line, and forms the second branch of the letter M, generally very plain in most hands. If long and deep, it indicates ability to care for oneself. If hair lines are attached to it, mental worry. If it divides toward Mount Mercury, love affairs will be first, and business secondary. If well defined its whole length, it implies a well-balanced brain. A line from it extending into a star on Mount Jupiter, great versatility, pride, and love for knowledge are indicated. If it extends to Mount Luna, great interest in occult studies is implied. Separated from the lifeline indicates aggressiveness. If it is broken, death is indicated from an injury in the head. The rassets are lines across the wrist, where the palm joins it. It is claimed they indicate length of life. If straight, it is a good sign. One rasclet indicates thirty years of life. Two lines, sixty. Three lines, ninety. The fate line commences at rassets, and if it extends straight to Mount Saturn, uninterrupted and alike in both hands, good luck and success are realized without personal exertion. If not in one hand, and interrupted in the other, Success will be experienced only by great effort. If well defined at the wrist, the early life is bright and promising. If broken in the center, misery for middle life is indicated. If this line touches Mounts Luna and Venus, it indicates a good disposition and wealth. If inclined toward any mount, it implies success in that line for which the mount stands. If it is made up of disconnected links, it indicates serious physical and moral struggles. Should it end at heartline, the life has been ruined by unrequited love. If it runs through a square, the life has been in danger and saved. Should it merge into the heartline and continue to Mount Jupiter, it denotes distinction and power secured through love. The girdle of Venus is a curved line extending from Mount Jupiter to Mercury encircling Saturn and Apollo. It appears on few hands, but it indicates superior intellect, a sensitive and capricious nature. If it extends to base of Jupiter, it denotes divorce. Ending in Mercury implies great energy. Should it be cut by parallel lines in a man, it indicates a hard drinker and gambler. Lines of reputation commencing in the middle of the hand, at the headline, Mount Luna or Mount Mars, indicate financial success from intellectual pursuits after years of struggling with adversity. If from heartline, real love of occupation and success, 
if from headline, success from selfishness. An island on this line denotes loss of character. A start on it near Apollo implies that success will be permanent, and a square, brilliant success. The absence of this line implies a struggle for recognition of one's abilities. Line of intuition, beginning at the base of Mount Mercury, extends around Mars and Luna. It is frequently found in the Venus, Mercury, and Lunar types of hands. When deeply dented with a triangle on Mount Saturn, it denotes clairvoyant power. If it forms a triangle with fate line or life line, a voyage will be taken. Health line commences at the center of the Rassets, takes an oblique course from the fate line, ending towards Mount Mercury. If straight and well defined, there is little liability to constitutional diseases. When it does not extend to head line, steady mental labor cannot be performed. When it is broad and deep on Mount Mercury, diminishing as it enters the life line, death from heart disease is indicated. Small lines cutting it denote sickness from biliousness. When joined to the heart line, health and business are neglected for love. If made up of short, fine lines, there is a suffering from stomach catarr. If it is checked by islands, there is a constitutional tendency to lung disease. Marriage lines extend straight across Mount Mercury. If short, affairs of the heart without marriage are denoted. When near heart line, early marriage is indicated. If it turns directly to heart line, marriage will occur between the ages of 16 and 21. If close to the top of the mount, marriage will not take place before the 35th year. If it curves upward, it indicates a single life. When pronged and running toward the center or to Mount Mars, divorce will occur. If at the end this line droops, the subject will outlive wife or husband. If broken, divorce is implied. If it ends in a cross, the wife or husband will die from an accident. A branch from this line upward implies a high position attained by marriage. A black spot on this line means widowhood. Children's lines are small and upright, extending from the end of marriage lines. If broad and well-defined, males. If fine and narrow, females are indicated. A line of this order that is deep and well-defined denotes prominence for that child. Small lines have a signification depending upon their position and number. A single line on Jupiter signifies success, on Saturn happiness, on Apollo fame and talent. Ascending small lines are favorable, while descending lines are unfavorable signs. Several small lines on Mars indicate warfare constantly. Cross lines, failure. End of section 12. Section 13 of 43, The Handy Cyclopedia of Things Worth Knowing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Sue Ann Dozier. The Handy Cyclopedia of Things Worth Knowing by Joseph Trenins, published 1911. Section 13 Riddles Old and New They have feet, but they walk not. Stoves Eyes they have, but they see not. Potatoes Noses have they, but they smell not. Teapots Mouths have they, but they taste not. Rivers Hands have they, but they handle not. Clocks Ears have they, but they hear not. Cornstalks. Tongues have they, but they talk not. Wagons. What thing is that which is lengthened by being cut at both ends? A ditch. Why do we all go to bed? Because the bed will not come to us. Why is Paris like the letter F? Because it is the capital of France. In which month do ladies talk least? In February. 
Why is a room full of married people like an empty room? There is not a single person in it. Why is a peach stone like a regiment? It has a colonel. Why is an island like the letter T? Because it is in the midst of water. Why is a beehive like a spectator? Because it is a bee holder. What is that which a train cannot move without, and yet is not the least use to it? A noise. When is a man over head and ears in debt? When the hat he has on is not paid for. Why is a man led astray like one governed by a girl? He is misled. Why is a Jew in a fever like a diamond? He is a jewel. Why are fixed stars like pen, ink, and paper? They are stationary. What is that which is always invisible and never out of sight? The letter I. Why is a cook like a barber? He dresses hair. Why is a waiter like a racehorse? He often runs for a plate or a cup. Why is a madman like two men? He is one beside himself. Why is a good story like a church bell? It is often told. What is the weight of the moon? Four quarters. What sea would make the best bedroom? Adriatic or Adriatic? Why is Ireland likely to become rich? because the capital is always Dublin. What two letters make a county in Massachusetts? SX or Essex. Why is a good saloon like a bad one? Both inconvenient. Why do dentists make good politicians? Because they have a great pull. Why is the Hudson like a shoe? because it is a great place for toes. Why is a race at a circus like a big conflagration? Because the heat is intense. Which is the left side of a plum pudding? The part that is not eaten. Why is a man who runs in debt like a clock? He goes on tick. Why is the wick of a candle like Athens? It is in the midst of Greece. Why are deep sighs like long stockings? Hi hoes. What occupation is the sun? A tanner. Why are your eyes like stage horses? They are always under lashes. Why are your teeth like verbs? Regular, irregular, and defective. What word makes you sick if you leave out one of its letters? Music. What word of ten letters can be spelled with five? Expediency. X -p -d -n -c. Why should red-headed men be chosen for soldiers? They carry firelocks. Why is the letter D like a sailor? It follows the C. Why is a theological student like a merchant? Both study the prophets. If the alphabet were invited out to dine, what time would U, V, W, X, Y, and Z go? After T. How can you take 1 from 19 and leave 21? Roman numeral XIX becomes XX. Last words of famous men and women. Tis well, George Washington. Tete d'armée, Napoleon. I thank God that I have done my duty, Admiral Nelson. I pray thee, see me safe up, but for my coming down I can shift for myself, were the last words of Sir Thomas More when ascending the scaffold. God bless you.
Dr. Johnson. I have finished. Hogarth. Dying, dying. Thomas Hood. Drop the curtain. The farce is played out. Rabelais. I am what I am. I am what I am. Swift. I still live. Daniel Webster. How grand these rays! They seem to beckon earth to heaven. Humboldt. It is now time that we depart. I to die, you to live. But which is the better destination is unknown. Socrates. Adieu, my dear Moran. I am dying. Voltaire. My beautiful flowers, my beautiful flowers. Richter. James, take good care of the horse. Winfield Scott. Many things are becoming clearer to me. Schiller. I feel the daisies growing over me. John Keats. What? Is there no bribing death? Cardinal Beaufort. Taking a leap in the dark. Oh, mystery. Thomas Paine. There is not a drop of blood on my hands. Frederick V. I am taking a fearful leap in the dark. Thomas Hobbes. Don't let that awkward squad fire over my grave, Burns. Here, veteran, if you think it right, strike, Cicero. My days are past as a shadow that returns not, R. Hooker. I thought that dying would be more difficult, Louis the Fourteenth. O Lord, forgive me specially my sins of omission, Usher. Let me die to the sounds of delicious music, Mirabeau. It is small, very small, alluding to her neck, and Boleyn. Let me hear those notes so long my solace and delight, Mozart. We are as near heaven by sea as by land, Sir Humphrey Gilbert. I do not sleep, I wish to meet death awake, Maria Theresa. I resign my soul to God, my daughter to my country. Jefferson Toasts and Sentiments Merit to gain a heart, and sense to keep it. Money to him that has spirit to use it. More friends and less need of them. May those who deceive us always be deceived. May the sword of justice be swayed by the hand of mercy. May the brow of the brave never want a wreath of laurel. May we be slaves to nothing but our duty, and friends to nothing but real merit. May he that turns his back on his friends fall into the hands of his enemy. May honor be the commander when love takes the field. May reason guide the helm when passion blows the gale. May those who enslave become slaves themselves. May genius and merit never want a friend. May the road of happiness be lighted by virtue. May life last as long as it is worth wearing. May we never murmur without a cause, and never have a cause to murmur. May the eye that drops for the misfortunes of others never shed a tear for its own. May the lovers of the fair sex never want means to support and spirit to defend them. May the tear of misery be dried by the hand of commiseration. May the voyage of life end in the haven of happiness. Provision to the unprovided. Peace and honest friendship with all nations, entangling alliances with none. Riches to the generous, and power to the merciful. Short shoes and long corns to the enemies of freedom. Success to the lover, and joy to the beloved. The life we love, and with whom we love. The friend we love, and the women we dare trust. The union of two fond hearts. The lovers of honor, and honorable lovers. The unity of hearts in the union of hands. The liberty of the press without licentiousness. 
the virtuous fair and the fair virtuous. The road to honor through the plains of virtue. The hero of Saratoga may his memory animate the breast of every American. The Americans triumvirate, love, honor, and liberty. The memory of Washington. May the example of the new world regenerate the old. Wit without virulence, wine without excess, and wisdom without affectation. What charms, arms and disarms. Home pleasant and our friends at home. Woman, she needs no eulogy, she speaks for herself. Friendship, may its lamp ever be supplied by the oil of truth and fidelity. The American Navy, may it ever sail on the sea of glory. May those who are discontented with their own country leave their country for their country's good. Discretion in speech is more than eloquence. May we always remember these three things, the manner, the place, and the time. Here's a sigh to those who love me, and a smile to those who hate me. And whatever skies above me, here's a heart for every fate. Wert the last drop in the well as I gasped upon the brink, ere my fainting spirit fell, tis to thee that I would drink. Byron Caddy's Toast to Hermione Ears to the health of your royal highness, and may the skin o' a gooseberry be big enough for an umbrella to cover all your enemies. Here's to the girl I love, and here's to the girl who loves me, and here's to all that love her whom I love, and all those that love her who love me. I will drink to the woman who wrought my woe in the diamond morning of long ago, to the splendor caught from orient skies that thrilled in the dark of her hazel eyes, her large eyes filled with the fire of the south, and the dewy wine of her warm red mouth. Winter. May those that are single get wives to their mind, and those that are married true happiness find. Here's a health to me and mine, not forgetting thee and thine, and when thou and thine come to see me and mine, may we and mine make thee and thine as welcome as thou and thine have ever made me and mine. Industry. The right hand of fortune, the grave of care, and the cradle of content. Here's to the prettiest, here's to the wittiest, here's to the truest of all who are true, here's to the sweetest, here's to them all in one, here's to you. Our country. May she always be in the right, but right or wrong, our country. Stephen Decatur. Here's to our sweethearts and wives. May our sweethearts soon become our wives, and our wives ever remain our sweethearts. Here's to the girls of the American shore. I love but one, I love no more. Since she's not here to drink her part, I drink her share with all my heart. Here's to the one and only one, and may that one be she, who loves but one and only one, and may that one be me. A glass is good, and a lass is good and a pipe to smoke in cold weather. The world is good, and the people are good, and we're all good fellows together. Yesterday's yesterday, while today's here. Today is today, till tomorrow appear. Tomorrow's tomorrow, until today's past, and kisses are kisses as long as they last. Our country. To her we drink, for her we pray, our voices silent never. For her we'll fight, come what may, and stars and stripes forever. Woman, the fairest work of the great author, the edition is large, and no man should be without a copy. Drink to me only with thine eyes, and I will pledge thee mine, or leave a kiss within the cup, and I'll not look for wine. The thirst that from the soul doth rise doth ask a drink divine, but might I of Jove's nectar sip. I would not change from thine. Ben Jonson Drink to-day and drown all sorrow. You shall perhaps not do it to-morrow. Best while ye have it, use your breath. There is no drinking after death. 
Beaumont and Fletcher. Home. The Father's Kingdom. The Child's Paradise. The Mother's World. Here's to those I love. Here's to those who love me. Here's to those who love those I love. And here's to those who love those who love those who love me. Weta's Favorite Toast. A little health, a little wealth, a little house and freedom, with some friends for certain ends, but little cause to need them. Here's to the lasses we've loved, my lad, here's to the lips we've pressed, for of kisses and lasses, like liquor and glasses, the last is always the best. Come in the evening, come in the morning, come when you're looked for, come without warning. Here's to a long life and a merry one, a quick death and an easy one, a pretty girl and a true one, a cold bottle and another one. The man we love, he who thinks the most and speaks the least ill of his neighbor. False friends, may we never have friends who, like shadows, keep close to us in the sunshine only to desert us on a cloudy day or in the night. Here's to those who'd love us if only we cared. Here's to those we'd love if only we dared. Here's to one another and one other, whoever he or she may be. The world is filled with flowers, and flowers are filled with dew, and dew is filled with love, and you, and you, and you. Here's to you as good as you are, and to me as bad as I am. And as good as you are, and as bad as I am, I'm as good as you are, as bad as I am. The Law The only thing certain about litigation is its uncertainty. The Lawyer Learned gentleman who rescues your estate from your enemies and keeps it for himself. A Spread Eagle Toast The Boundaries of Our Country East by the rising sun, north by the north pole, west by all creation, south by the day of judgment. When going up the bill of prosperity, may you never meet a friend coming down. May the hinges of friendship never grow rusty. Come, come, good wine is a familiar creature, if it be well used. Shakespeare Shall I ask the brave soldier who fights by my side in the cause of mankind whether our creeds agree? May all single men be married and all married men be happy. Our country's emblem. The lily of France may fade, the thistle and shamrock wither, the oak of England may decay, but the stars shine on forever. The good things of the world. Parsons are preaching for them, lawyers are pleading for them, physicians are prescribing for them, authors are writing for them, soldiers are fighting for them, but true philosophers alone are enjoying them. My life has been like sunny skies when they are fair to view, but there never yet were lives or skies clouds might not wander through. The Three Great American Generals General Peace, General Prosperity, and General Satisfaction. America. Our hearts, our hopes, are all with thee. Our hearts, our hopes, our prayers, our tears, our faith triumphant o'er our fears, are all with thee, are all with thee. Our National Birds. The American Eagle, the Thanksgiving Turkey. May one give us peace in all our states, and the other a peace for all our plates. Opportunity Master of human destinies am I. Fame, love, and fortune on my footsteps wait. Cities and fields I walk. I penetrate deserts and seas remote, and passing by hovel and mart and palace, soon or late I knock unbidden at once at every gate. If sleeping, wake. If feasting, rise before I turn away. It is the hour of fate. 
and they who follow me reach every state mortals desire, and conquer every foe condemned to failure, penury, and woe, save death. But those who doubt or hesitate, seek me in vain and uselessly implore, I answer not, and I return no more. John J. Ingalls a health to our dearest. May their purses always be heavy and their hearts always light. An Irishman's Toast Here's to the land of the shamrock so green. Here's to the lad and his colleen so green. Here's to the ones we love dearest and most. And may God save old Ireland. That's an Irishman's Toast. Here's a health to the future, a sigh to the past. We can love and remember and hope to the last. And for all the base lies that the almanacs hold, while there's love in the heart, we can never grow old. Some hay meat and cannot eat, and some what eat who want it. But we hay meat and we can eat, so let the Lord be thanked. Burns. A little health, a little wealth, a little house and freedom, with some few friends for certain ends, but little cause to need them. If I were a raindrop and you a leaf, I would burst from the cloud above you, and lie on your breast in a rapture of rest, and love you, love you, love you. If I were a brown bee and you were a rose, I would fly to you, love, nor miss you. I would sip and sip from your nectared lip, and kiss you, kiss you, kiss you. Ella Wheeler Wilcox in Three Women Strange, is it not, that the myriads who before us pass the door of darkness through, not one returns to tell us of the road, which to discover we must travel to. Omar Away with the flimsy idea that life with a past is attended. There is now, only now, and no past. There is never a past. It is ended. Away with the obsolete story and all of its yesterday sorrow. There's only today almost gone, and in front of today stands tomorrow. Eugene Ware God made man, frail as a bubble. God made love, love made trouble. God made the vine. Was it a sin that man made wine to drown trouble in? My character may be my own, but my reputation belongs to any old body that enjoys gossiping more than telling the truth. May your joy be as deep as the ocean, your trouble as light as its foam. The man that has no music in himself, nor is not moved with concord of sweet sounds, is fit for treasons, stratagems, and spoils. The motions of his spirit are dull as night, and his affections dark as Erebus. Let no man be trusted. Mark the music. Shakespeare See the mountains kiss the high heaven, and the waves clasp one another. No sister flower would be forgiven if it disdained its brother. And the sunlight clasps the earth, and the moonbeams kiss the sea. What are all these kissings worth, if thou kiss not me? Percy Bysshe Shelley Just a worryin' for you, all the time a feelin' blue, wishin' for you, wonderin' when you'll be comin' home again. Restless, don't know what to do, just a weary end for you. Frank Stanton Here's to love, the worker of miracles. He strengthens the weak and weakens the strong. He turns wise men into fools and fools into wise men. He feeds the passions and destroys reason and plays havoc among young and old. Marguerite de Valois Goodbye, God bless you. I like the Anglo-Saxon speech with its direct revealings. It takes a hold and seems to reach way down into our feelings, that some rude deem it rude, I know, and therefore they abuse it. But I have never found it so, before all else I choose it. I don't object that man should air the Gallic that they paid for, the au revoir, adieu ma chère, for that's what French was made for. But when a crony takes your hand at parting to address you, he drops all foreign lingo, and he says, Goodbye, God bless you. Eugene Field Language of Precious Stones 
The ancients attributed marvelous properties to many of the precious stones. We give in tabular form the different months and the stones sacred to them, as generally accepted, with their respective meanings. It has been customary among lovers and friends to notice the significance attached to the various stones in making birthday, engagement, and wedding presents. January. Garnet. Constancy and fidelity in every engagement. February. Amethyst. Preventive against violent passions. March. Bloodstone. Courage, wisdom, and firmness in affection. April. Sapphire. Free from enchantment denotes repentance. May. Emerald. Discovers false friends and ensures true love. June. Agate. Ensures long life, health, and prosperity. July. Ruby. Discovers poison. Corrects evils resulting from mistaken friendship. August. Sardonyx. Ensures conjugal felicity. September. Chrysolite. Free from all evil passions and sadness of the mind. October. Opal. Denotes hope. And sharpens the sight and faith of the possessor. November. Topaz. Fidelity and friendship. Prevents bad dreams. December. Turquoise. Prosperity and love. Tiffany's list of birthstones is somewhat different from the above and is given below. Birthstones as given by Tiffany and Company. January. Garnet. February. Amethyst. Hyacinth and Pearl. March. Jasper. Bloodstone. April. Diamond. Sapphire. May. Emerald. Agate. June. Cat's Eye. Turquoise. Agate. July. Turquoise and Onyx. August. Sardonyx, Carnelian, Moonstone, Topaz. September, Chrysolite. October, Beryl, Opal. November, Topaz, Pearl. December, Ruby, Bloodstone. End of section 13. Recording by Sue Ann Dozier, Kansas City, Kansas, April 12, 2007. Section 14 of The Handy Cyclopedia of Things Worth Knowing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Handy Cyclopedia of Things Worth Knowing by Joseph Trenens. Published in 1911. Section 14. Grammar, Spelling, and Pronunciation 500 Common Errors Corrected Concise Rules for the Proper Use of Words in Writing or Speaking The most objectionable errors in speaking or writing are those in which words are employed that are unsuitable to convey the meaning intended. Thus, a person wishing to express his intention of going to a given place says, I propose going, when in fact, he purposes going. The following affords an amusing illustration of this class of error. A venerable matron was speaking of her son, who, she said, was quite stage-struck. In fact, remarked the old lady, he is going to a premature performance this evening. Considering that most amateur performances are premature, it cannot be said that this word was altogether misapplied, though evidently the maternal intention was to convey quite another meaning. Other errors arise from the substitution of sounds similar to the words which should be employed, that is, spurious words, instead of genuous ones. Thus, some people say, remunerative, when they mean remunerative. A nurse, recommending her mistress to have a perambulator for her child, advised her to purchase a preamputator, other errors are occasioned by imperfect knowledge of English grammar. Thus, many people say, between you and I, instead of between you and me. And there are numerous other departures from the rules of grammar, which will be pointed out hereafter. Misuse of the adjective. What beautiful butter! What a nice landscape! They should say, 
What a beautiful landscape! What nice butter! Again, errors are frequently occasioned by the following causes. Mispronunciation of words. Many persons say pronunciation instead of pronunciation. Others say pronunciation instead of pronunciation. Misdivision of words and syllables. This defect makes the words an ambassador sound like a nambassador or an adder like a natter. Imperfect enunciation. As when a person says heaven for heaven, eber for ever, chocolate for chocolate. To correct these errors by a systematic course of study would involve a closer application than most persons could afford, but the simple and concise rules and hints here given, founded upon usage and the authority of scholars, will be of great assistance to inquirers. English Grammar in a Nutshell Who and whom are used in relation to persons, and which in relation to things? But it was once common to say, the man which. This should now be avoided. It is now usual to say, Our Father who art in heaven, instead of, which art in heaven. Whose is, however, sometimes applied to things as well as to persons. We may therefore say, the country whose inhabitants are free. Thou is employed in solemn discourse, and you in common language. Ye, plural, is also used in serious addresses, and you in familiar language. The uses of the word it are various, and very perplexing to the uneducated. It is not only used to imply persons, but things, and even ideas, and therefore, in speaking or writing, its assistance is constantly required. The perplexity respecting this word arises from the fact that in using it in the construction of a long sentence, sufficient care is not taken to ensure that when it is employed, it really points out or refers to the objects intended. For instance, it was raining when John set out in his car to go to market, and he was delayed so long that it was over before he arrived. Now, what is to be understood by this sentence? Was the rain over, or the market? Either or both might be inferred from the construction of the sentence, which, therefore, should be written thus. It was raining when John set out in his cart to go to market, and he was delayed so long that the market was over before he arrived. Rule after writing a sentence, always look through it, and see that wherever the word it is employed, it refers to or carries the mind back to the object which it is intended to point out. The general distinction between this and that may be thus defined. This denotes an object present or near, in time or place, that something which is absent. These refers in the same manner to present objects, while those refers to things that are remote who changes, under certain conditions, into whose and whom, but that and which always remained the same, with the exception of the possessive case, as noted above. That may be applied to nouns or subjects of all sorts, as the girl that went to school, the dog that bit me, the opinion that he entertains. The misuse of these pronouns gives rise to more errors in speaking and writing than any other cause. When you wish to distinguish between two or more persons, say, Which is the happy man? Not who. Which of these ladies do you admire? Instead of, Whom do you think him to be? Say, Who do you think him to be? Whom should I see? To whom do you speak? Who said so? Who gave it to you? Of whom did you procure them? Who was he? Who do men say that I am? Self should never be added to his, their, mine, or thine. Each is used to denote every individual of a number. Every denotes all the individuals of a number. Either and or denote an alternative. I will take either road, at your pleasure. I will take this or that. Neither means not either, and nor means not the other. Either is sometimes used for each. Two thieves were crucified, on either side one. Let each esteem others as good as themselves, should be, let each esteem others as good as himself. 
There are bodies, each of which are so small, should be, each of which is so small. Do not use double superlatives, such as most straightest, most highest, most finest. The term worser has gone out of use, but lesser is still retained. The use of such word as chiefest, extremist, etc., has become obsolete, because they do not give any superior force to the meanings of the primary words, chief, extreme, etc. Such expressions as more impossible, more indispensable, more universal, more uncontrollable, more unlimited, etc., are objectionable, as they really enfeeble the meaning which it is the object of the speaker or writer to strengthen. For instance, impossible gains no strength by rendering it more impossible. This class of error is common with persons who say, a great large house, a great big animal, a little small foot, a tiny little hand. Here, there, and where, originally denoting place, may now, by common consent, be used to denote other meanings, such as, there I agree with you, where we differ, we find pain where we expected pleasure, here you mistake me. Hence, whence, and thence, denoting departure, etc., may be used without the word from. The idea of from is included in the word whence, therefore it is unnecessary to say from whence. Hither, thither, and whither, denoting to a place, have generally been superseded by here, there, and where but there is no good reason why they should not be employed. If, however, they are used, it is unnecessary to add the word to, because that is implied. Whither are you going? Where are you going? Each of these sentences is complete. To say, where are you going to, is redundant. Two negatives destroy each other, and produce an affirmative. Nor did he not observe them, conveys the idea that he did observe them but negative assertions are allowable. His manners are not impolite, which implies that his manners are in some degree marked by politeness. Instead of, let you and I, say, let you and me. Instead of, I am not so tall as him, say, I am not so tall as he. When asked, who is there, do not answer, me, but I. Instead of, for you and I, say, for you and me. Instead of, says I, say, I said. Instead of, you are taller than me, say, you are taller than I. Instead of, I ain't, or I amn't, say, I am not. Instead of, whether I be present or no, say, whether I be present or not. For, not that I know on, say, not that I know. Instead of, was I to do so, say, were I to do so. Instead of, I would do the same if I was him, say, I would do the same if I were he. Instead of, I had as lief go myself, say, I would as soon go myself, or I would rather. It is better to say, six weeks ago, than six weeks back. It is better to say, since which time, than since when. It is better to say, I repeated it, than I said so over again. Instead of, he was too young to have suffered much, say, he was too young to suffer much. Instead of, less friends, say, fewer friends, less refers to quantity. Instead of, a quantity of people, say, a number of people. Instead of, he and they we know, say, him and them. Instead of, as far as I can see, say, so far as I can see. Instead of, a new pair of gloves, say, a pair of new gloves. Instead of, I hope you'll think nothing on it, say, I hope you'll think nothing of it. Instead of, restore it back to me, say, restore it to me. Instead of, I suspect the veracity of his story, say, I doubt the truth of his story. Instead of, I seldom or ever see him, say, I seldom see him. 
Instead of, I expected to have found him, say, I expected to find him. Instead of, who learns you music, say, who teaches you music. Instead of, I never sing whenever I can help it, say, I never sing when I can help it. Instead of, before I do that, I must first ask leave, say, before I do that, I must ask leave. Instead of saying, the observation of the rule, say, the observance of the rule. Instead of, a man of eighty years of age, say, a man eighty years old. Instead of, here lays his honoured head, say, here lies his honoured head. Instead of, he died from negligence, say, he died through neglect, or in consequence of neglect. Instead of, apples are plenty, say, apples are plentiful. Instead of, the latter end of the year, say, the end or the close of the year. Instead of, the then government, say, the government of that age, or century, or year, or time. Instead of, a couple of chairs, say, two chairs. Instead of, they are united together in the bonds of matrimony, say, they are united in matrimony, or they are married. Instead of, we travel slow, say, we travel slowly. Instead of, he plunged down into the river, say, he plunged into the river. Instead of, he jumped from off the scaffolding, say, he jumped off the scaffolding. Instead of, he came the last of all, say, he came the last. Instead of, universal, with reference to things that have any limit, say, general, generally approved, instead of, universally approved, generally beloved, instead of, universally beloved. Instead of, they ruined one another, say, they ruined each other. Instead of, if in case I succeed, say, if I succeed. Instead of, a large enough room, say, a room large enough. Instead of, I am slight in comparison to you, say, I am slight in comparison with you. Instead of, I went for to see him, say, I went to see him. Instead of, the cake is all eat up, say, the cake is all eaten. Instead of, handsome is as handsome does, say, handsome is who handsome does. Instead of, the book fell on the floor, say, the book fell to the floor. Instead of, his opinions are approved of by all, say, his opinions are approved by all. Instead of, I will add one more argument, say, I will add one argument more, or another argument. Instead of, a sad curse is war, say, war is a sad curse. Instead of, he stands six foot high, say, he measures six feet, or his height is six feet. Instead of, I go every now and then, say, I go sometimes, or often. Instead of, who finds him in clothes, say, who provides him with clothes. Say, the first two, and the last two, instead of the two first, the two last. Instead of, his health was drank with enthusiasm, say, his health was drunk enthusiastically. Instead of, except I am prevented, say, unless I am prevented. Instead of, in its primary sense, say, in its primitive sense. Instead of, it grieves me to see you, say, I am grieved to see you. Instead of, give me them papers, say, give me those papers. Instead of, those papers I hold in my hand, say, these papers I hold in my hand. Instead of, I could scarcely imagine but what, say, I could scarcely imagine that. Instead of, he was a man notorious for his benevolence, say, he was noted for his benevolence. Instead of, she was a woman celebrated for her crimes, say, she was notorious on account of her crimes. Instead of, what may your name be? Say, what is your name? Instead of, I lifted it up, say, I lifted it. Instead of, it is equally of the same value, say, it is of the same value, or equal value. Instead of, I knew it previous to your telling me, 
say, I knew it previously to your telling me. Instead of, you was out when I called, say, you were out when I called. Instead of, I thought I should have won this game, say, I thought I should win this game. Instead of, this much is certain, say, thus much is certain, or so much is certain. Instead of, he went away as it may be yesterday week, say, he went away yesterday week. Instead of, he came the Saturday as it may be before the Monday, specify the Saturday on which he came. Instead of, put your watch in your pocket, say, put your watch into your pocket. Instead of, he has got riches, say, he has riches. Instead of, will you set down, say, will you sit down. Instead of, no thank ye, say, no thank you. Instead of, I cannot do it without farther means, say, I cannot do it without further means. Instead of, no sooner but, or no other but, say, than. Instead of, nobody else but her, say, nobody but her. Instead of, he fell down from the balloon, say, he fell from the balloon. Instead of, he rose up from the ground, say, he rose from the ground. Instead of, these kind of oranges are not good, say, this kind of oranges is not good. Instead of, somehow or another, say, somehow or other. Instead of, will I give you some more tea, say, shall I give you some more tea. Instead of, oh, dear, what will I do, say, oh, dear, what shall I do. Instead of, I think indifferent of it, say, I think indifferently of it. Instead of, I will send it conformable to your orders, say, I will send it conformably to your orders. Instead of, to be given away gratis, say, to be given away. Instead of, will you enter in, say, will you enter. Instead of, this three days or more, say, these three days or more. Instead of, he is a bad grammarian, say, he is not a grammarian. Instead of, we accuse him for, say, we accuse him of. Instead of, we acquit him from, say, we acquit him of. Instead of, I am averse from that, say, I am averse to that. Instead of, I confide on you, say, I confide in you. Instead of, as soon as ever, say, as soon as. Instead of, the very best, or the very worst, say, the best, or the worst. Avoid such phrases as, no great shakes, nothing to boast of, down in my boots, suffering from the blues. All such sentences indicate vulgarity. Instead of, no one hasn't called, say, no one has called. Instead of, you have a right to pay me, say, it is right that you should pay me. Instead of, I'm going over the bridge, say, I'm going across the bridge. Instead of, I should just think I could, say, I think I can. Instead of, there has been a good deal, say, there has been much. Instead of, the effort you are making for meeting the bill, say, the effort you are making to meet the bill. To say, do not give him no more of your money, is equivalent to saying, give him some of your money. Say, do not give him any of your money. Instead of saying, they are not what nature designed them, say, they are not what nature designed them to be. Instead of saying, I had not the pleasure of hearing his sentiments when I wrote that letter, say, I had not the pleasure of having heard, etc. Instead of, the quality of the apples were good, say, the quality of the apples was good. Instead of, the want of learning, courage, and energy are more visible, say, is more visible. Instead of, we die for want, say, we die of want. Instead of, he died by fever, say, he died of fever. Instead of, I enjoy bad health, say, my health is not good. Instead of, either of the three, say, any one of the three. Instead of, better nor that, say, better than that. Instead of, we often think on you, say, we often think of you. 
Instead of, mine is so good as yours, say, mine is as good as yours. Instead of, this town is not as large as we thought, say, this town is not so large as we thought. Instead of, because why, say, why. Instead of, that there boy, say, that boy. Instead of, the subject matter of debate, say, the subject of debate. Instead of saying, when he was come back, say, when he had come back. Instead of saying, his health has been shook, say, his health has been shaken. Instead of saying, it was spoke in my presence, say, it was spoken in my presence. Instead of, very right, or very wrong, say, right, or wrong. Instead of, the mortgager paid him the money, say, the mortgagee paid him the money. The mortgagee lends, the mortgagor borrows. Instead of, I took you to be another person, say, I mistook you for another person. Instead of, on either side of the river, say, on each side of the river. Instead of, there's fifty, say, there are fifty. Instead of, the best of the two, say, the better of the two. Instead of, my clothes have become too small for me, say, I have grown too stout for my clothes. Instead of, two spoonsful of physic, say, two spoonfuls of physic. Instead of, she said, says she, say, she said. Avoid such phrases as, I said, says I, thinks I to myself, etc. Instead of, I don't think so, say, I think not. Instead of, he was in eminent danger, say, he was in imminent danger. Instead of, the weather is hot, say, the weather is very warm. Instead of, I sweat, say, I perspire. Instead of, I only want two dollars, say, I want only two dollars. Instead of, whatsomever, say, whatever, or whatsoever. Avoid such exclamations as, God bless me! God deliver me, by God, by gosh, holy Lord, upon my soul, etc., which are vulgar on the one hand, and savour of impiety on the other, for thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. End of section 14「The Handy Cyclopedia of Things Worth Knowing」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Robin Cotter, Toronto, Ontario, January 2007 The Handy Cyclopedia of Things Worth Knowing by Joseph Trenans, published in 1911. Section 15. Accent and Pronunciation. Accent is a particular stress or force of the voice upon certain syllables or words. This mark in printing denotes the syllable upon which the stress or force of the voice should be placed. A word may have more than one accent. Take as an instance, aspiration. In uttering the word, we give a marked emphasis of the voice upon the first and third syllables, and therefore those syllables are said to be accented. The first of these accents is less distinguishable than the second, upon which we dwell longer. Therefore, the second accent in point of order is called the primary, or chief, accent of the word. When the full accent falls on a vowel, that vowel should have a long sound, as in vocal. But when it falls on or after a consonant, the preceding vowel has a short sound, as in habit. To obtain a good knowledge of pronunciation, it is advisable for the reader to listen to the examples given by good speakers and by educated persons. We learn the pronunciation of words, to a great extent, by imitation, just as birds acquire the notes of other birds which may be near them. But it will be very important to bear in mind that there are many words having a double meaning or application, 
and that the difference of meaning is indicated by the difference of the accent. Among these words, nouns are distinguished from verbs by this means. Nouns are mostly accented on the first syllabic, and verbs on the last. Noun signifies name. Nouns are the names of persons and things, as well as of things not material and palpable, but of which we have a conception and knowledge, such as courage, firmness, goodness, strength, and verbs express actions, movements, etc. If the word used signifies has been done, or is being done, or is, or is to be done, then that word is a verb. Thus, when we say that anything is an insult, that word is a noun, and is accented all the first syllable. But when we say he did it to insult another person, that word insult implies acting, and becomes a verb, and should be accented on the last syllable. Simple Rules of Pronunciation C before A, O, and U, and in some other situations, is a close articulation, like K. Before E, I, and Y, C is precisely equivalent to S in same, this as in cedar, civil, cypress, capacity. E final indicates that the preceding vowel is long, as in hate, meet, sire, robe, lyre, abate, recede, invite, remote, intrude. E final indicates that C preceding has the sound of S, as in lace, lance, and that G preceding has the sound of J, as in charge, page, challenge. E final in proper English words never forms a syllable, and in the most used words, in the terminating unaccented syllables, it is silent. Thus, motive, genuine, examine, granite, are pronounced motive, genuine, examine, granite. E final, in a few words of foreign origin, forms a syllable, as syncope, simile. E final is silent after L in the following terminations. BLE, CLE, DLE, FLE, GLE, KLE, PLE, TLE, ZLE, as in able, manacle, cradle, ruffle, mangle, wrinkle, supple, rattle, puzzle, which are pronounced able, manacle, cradle, ruffle, mangle, wrinkle, supple, rattle, puzzle. E is usually silent in the termination en, as in taken, broken, pronounced taken, broken. Ous is the termination of adjectives and their derivatives, is pronounced us, as in gracious, pious, pompously. Ce, ci, ti, before a vowel, have the sound of sh, as in cetaceous, gracious, motion, partial, ingratiate, pronounced cetaceous, gracious, motion, partial, ingratiate. Si, after an accented vowel, is pronounced like zh, as in Ephesian, confusion, pronounced Ephesian, confusion. Gh, both in the middle and at the end of words, is silent, as in caught, bought, fright, nigh, sigh, pronounced caught, bought, fright, nigh, sigh. In the following exceptions, however, gh is pronounced as a f, cough, chaff, cloth, enough, laugh, rough, slough, tough, trough. When wh begins a word, the aspirate h precedes w in pronunciation, as in what, with, whale, pronounced what, with, whale, w having precisely the sound of oo, French, O-U. In the following words, W is silent. Who, whom, whose, hoop, whole. H after R has no sound or use, as in room, rhyme, pronounced room, rhyme. 
H should be sounded in the middle of words, as in forehead, abhor, behold, exhaust, inhabit, unhorse. H should always be sounded except in the following words, air, herb, honest, honor, hour, humor, and umble, and all their derivatives, such as humorously, derived from humor. K and G are silent before N, as no, gnaw, pronounced no, gnaw. W before R is silent, as in ring, wreath, pronounced ring, wreath. B after M is silent, as in dumb, numb, pronounced dumb, numb. L before K is silent, as in balk, walk, talk, pronounced balk, walk, talk. PH has the sound of F, as in philosophy, pronounced philosophy. NG has two sounds, one as in singer, the other as in finger. N after M, and closing a syllable, is silent, as in him, condemn. P before S and T is mute, as in psalm, pseudo, ptarmigan, pronounced psalm, pseudo, ptarmigan. R has two sounds, one strong and vibrating, as at the beginning of words and syllables, such as robber, reckon, error. The other is at the termination of the words, or when succeeded by a consonant, as farmer, mourn. Common Errors in Pronunciation A-C-E is not is, as furnace, not furnace. A-G-E, not idge, as cabbage, courage, postage, village. A-I-N, A-N-E, not in, as certain, certain, not certain. A-T-E, not it, as moderate, not moderate. E-C-T, not E-C, as aspect, not aspect. Subject, not subject. E-D, not I-D, or U-D, as wicked, not wicked, or wicked. E-L, not L. Model, not Model. Novel, not novel. En, not n, as sudden, not sudden. Burden, burthen, garden, lengthen, seven, strengthen, often, and a few others, have the e silent. Ence, not unce, as influence, not influence. ES, not IS, as pleases, not pleases. ILE should be pronounced IL as fertile, not fertile, in all words except chamomile, exile, gentile, infantile, reconcile, and senile, which should be pronounced ILE. IN, not N, as Latin, not Latin. ND, not N, as husband, not husband. Thousand, not thousand. NESS, not NISS, as carefulness, not carefulness. NG, not N, as singing, not singin. Speaking, not speakin. N-G-T-H, not N-T-H, as strength, not strength. S-O-N, the O should be silent, as in treason, not treason. T-A-L, not T-L-E, as capital, not capital. Metal, not metal. Mortal, not mortal. Periodical, not periodical. XT, not X, as next, not next. Short rules for spelling. 
Words ending in E drop that letter on taking a suffix beginning with a vowel. Exceptions, words ending in GE, CE, or OE. Final E of a primitive word is retained on taking a suffix beginning with a consonant. Exceptions, words ending in DGE, and truly, duly, etc. Final Y of a primitive word, when preceded by a consonant, is generally changed into I on the addition of a suffix. Exceptions, retained before ING and ISH, as pitying, words ending in IE, and dropping the E by rule 1, change the I to Y, as lying. Final Y is sometimes changed to E, as duteous. Nouns ending in Y, preceded by a vowel, form their plural by adding S. O as money, monies. Y, preceded by a consonant, is changed to IES, in the plural, as bounty, bounties. Final Y of a primitive vowel, preceded by a vowel, should not be changed into I before a suffix, as joyless. In words containing EI or IE, EI is used after the sound S, as sealing, seize, except in siege, and in a few words ending in seer. In vigil, neither, leisure, and weird also have EI. In other cases, IE is used, as in believe, achieve. Words ending in C-E-O-U-S or C-I-O-U-S when relating to matter end in C-E-O-U-S, all others in C-I-O-U-S. Words of one syllable ending in a consonant with a single vowel before it double the consonant in derivatives, as ship, shipping, etc. But if ending in a consonant with a double vowel before it, they do not double the consonant in derivatives, as troop, trooper, etc. Words of more than one syllable, ending in a consonant preceded by a single vowel, and accented on the last syllable, double that consonant in derivatives, as commit, committed, but except chagrin, chagrined, kidnap, kidnapped. All words of one syllable ending in L, with a single vowel before it, have LL at the close, as mill, cell. All words of one syllable ending in L, with a double vowel before it, have only one L at the close, as mail, sail. The words foretell, distill, instill, and fulfill retain the double L of their primitives. Derivatives of dull, skill, will, and full also retain the double L when the accent falls on these words, as dullness, skillful, willful, fullness. Punctuation. A period, after every declarative and every imperative sentence, as, it is true, do right. A period is also used after every abbreviation, as, doctor, dr period. Mr. M. R. Period. Captain. C. A. P. T. Period. An interrogation point, question mark, after every question. The exclamation point, after exclamations, as, alas, exclamation point, oh, how lovely, exclamation point. Quotation marks, enclose quoted expressions, as Socrates said, quote, I believe the soul is immortal. Unquote. A colon is used between parts of a sentence that are subdivided by semicolons. A colon is used before a quotation, enumeration, or observation that is introduced by as follows, the following, or any similar expression, as send me the following, colon, ten dozen, quote, Armstrong's Treasury, unquote. 25 Schultz Manual, etc. A semicolon between parts that are subdivided by commas. The semicolon is used also between clauses or members that are disconnected in sense, as man grows old, semicolon, he passes away, semicolon, all is uncertain. 
when as namely, that is, is used to introduce an example or enumeration, a semicolon is put before it and a comma after it, as, the night was cold, semicolon, that is, comma, for the time of year. A comma is used to set off interposed words, phrases, and subordinate clauses, not restrictive, as, comma, good deeds are never lost, comma, though sometimes forgotten. A comma is used to set off transposed phrases and clauses as, quote, when the wicked entice thee, comma, consent thou not, unquote. A comma is used to set off interposed words, phrases, and clauses as, let us, comma, if we can, comma, make others happy. A comma is used between similar or repeated words or phrases, as, the sky, comma, the water, comma, the trees, comma, were illumined with sunlight. A comma is used to mark an ellipsis, or the omission of a verb or other important word. A comma is used to set off a short quotation, informally introduced, as, who said, comma, quote, the good die young, Unquote. Question mark. A comma is used whenever necessary to prevent ambiguity. The marks of parentheses are used to enclose an interpolation where such interpolation is by the writer or speaker of the sentence in which it occurs. Interpolations by an editor or by anyone other than the author of the sentence should be enclosed in brackets. Dashes may be used to set off a parenthetical expression, also to denote an interruption or a sudden change of thought or a significant pause. The Use of Capitals 1. Every entire sentence should begin with a capital. 2. Proper names and adjectives derived from these should begin with a capital. 3. All appellations of the deity should begin with a capital. 4. Official and honorary titles begin with a capital. 5. Every line of poetry should begin with a capital. 6. Titles of books and the heads of their chapters and divisions are printed in capitals. 7. The pronoun I and the exclamation O are always capitals. 8. The days of the week and the months of the year begin with capitals. 9. Every quotation should begin with a capital letter. 10. Names of religious denominations begin with capitals. 11. In preparing accounts, each item should begin with a capital. 12. Any word of special importance may begin with a capital. End of section 15. Section 16 of the Handy Cyclopedia of Things Worth Knowing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Corrie Samuel. The Handy Cyclopedia of Things Worth Knowing by Joseph Trinens, published in 1911. Section 16 The Name of God in Fifty Languages Hebrew, Eleah, Jehovah, Chaldaic, Eliah, Assyrian, Eleah, Syrian and Turkish, Allah, Malay, Allah, Arabic, Allah. Languages of the Magi, Orsi, Old Egyptian, Tut, Modern Egyptian, Tun, Armenian, Tuti, Greek, Theos, Cretan, Theos, Idian and Dorian, Ilos, Latin, Deus, Low Latin, Dieu, Celtic Gaelic, Dieu, French, Dieu, Spanish, Dios, Portuguese, Deus, Old German, Diet, Provençal, 
Dior. Le Breton, Don. Italian, Dio. Irish, Dia. Olutu, Deu. German and Swiss, Gott. Flemish, God. Dutch, God. English, God. Teutonic, Goth. Danish and Swedish, Good. Norwegian, Good. Slav, Buch. Polish, Bog. Polacca, Bung. Lap, Juvenile. Finnish, Jumala. Runic, As. Zembilian, As. Penanlian, Istu. Tartar, Magatai. Coromandel, Brahma. Persian, Sire. Chinese, Prussa. Japanese, Gerza. Madagascar, Zana. Peruvian, Pukikamai. Facts about sponges by Albert Hart. Sponges belong to the animal kingdom, and the principal varieties used commercially are obtained off the coasts of Florida and the West Indies. The higher grades are from the Mediterranean Sea, and are numerous in variety. A sponge in its natural state is a different-looking object from what we see in commerce, resembling somewhat the appearance of the jellyfish, or a mass of liver, the entire surface being covered with a thin, slimy skin, usually of a dark colour, and perforated to correspond with the apertures of the canals, commonly called holes of the sponge. The sponge of commerce is, in reality, only the skeleton of a sponge. The composition of this skeleton varies in the different kinds of sponges, but in the commercial grades it consists of interwoven horny fibres, among and supporting which are epiculi of Sicilius matter, in greater or less numbers, and having a variety of forms. The fibres consist of a network of fibrils whose softness and elasticity determine the commercial quality of a given sponge. The horny framework is perforated externally by very minute pores, and by a less number of larger openings. These are parts of an interesting double canal system, an external and an internal, or a centripetal and a centrifugal. At the smaller openings on the sponge's surface channels begin, which lead into dilated spaces. In these, in turn, channels arise, which eventually terminate in the large openings. Through these channels, or canals, definite currents are constantly maintained, which are essential to the life of the sponge. The currents enter through the small apertures, and emerge through the large ones. The active part of the sponge, that is, the part concerned in nutrition and growth, is a soft, fleshy mass partly filling the meshes and lining the canals. It consists largely of cells having different functions, some utilised in the formation of the framework, some in digestion, and others in reproduction. Lining the dilated spaces into which different canals lead are cells surmounted by whip-like processes. The motion of these processes produces and maintains the water currents, which carry the minute food products to the digestive cells in the same cavities. Sponges multiply by the union of sexual product. Certain cells of the fleshy pulp assume the character of ova, and others that of spermatozoa. Fertilization takes place within the sponge. The fertilized eggs, which are called larvae, pass out into the currents of the water, and, in the course of twenty-four to forty-eight hours, they settle and become attached to rocks and other hard substances, and in time develop into mature sponges. The depth of the water in which sponges grow varies from ten to fifty feet in Florida, but considerably more in the Mediterranean Sea, the finer grades being found in the deepest water, having a temperature of fifty to fifty-seven degrees. Don't be buried alive. From time to time we are horrified, by learning that some person has been buried alive, after assurances have been given of death. 
Under these circumstances, the opinion of a rising French physician upon the subject becomes of worldwide interest, for since the tests which have been in use for years have been found unreliable, no means should be left untried to prove beyond a doubt that life is actually extinct before conveying our loved ones to the grave. Dr. Martineau, as reported in the New York Journal, asserts that an unfailing test may be made by producing a blister on the hand or foot of the body, by holding the flame of a candle to the same for a few seconds, or until the blister is formed which will always occur. If the blister contains any fluid, it is evidence of life, and the blister only that produced by an ordinary burn. If, on the contrary, the blister contains only steam, it may be asserted that life is extinct. The explanation is as follows. A corpse, says Dr. Martineau, is nothing more than inert matter, under the immediate control of physical laws, which cause all liquid heating to a certain temperature to become steam. The epidermis is raised, the blister produced. It breaks with a little noise, and the steam escapes. But if, in spite of all appearances, there is any remnant of life, the organic mechanism continues to be governed by physiological laws, and the blister will contain serous matter, as in the case of any ordinary burns. The test is as simple as the proof is conclusive. Dry blister, death. Liquid blister, life. Any one may try it. There is no error possible. How to serve wine A fine dinner may be spoiled by not serving the proper wine at the proper time and at the proper temperature. A white wine, Sauterne, Riesling, Moselle, etc., should be used from the beginning of the meal to the time the roast or game comes on. With the roast, serve red wine, either claret or burgundy. Use sparkling wines after the roast. With dessert, serve apricot cordial. Never serve red wine with soup or fish, and never a white wine with game. Storage, temperature, etc. Store your wines in the cellar at 50 to 60 degrees. All bottles should lie flat, so that the cork is continually moist. This rule should be specially observed with sparkling wines. Sparkling wine should be served ice-cold. Put the wine on the ice, not ice in the wine. Serve red wine at only about five degrees cooler than a dining room. White wine should be about fifteen degrees cooler than the temperature of the room. End of section sixteen. Section seventeen of The Handy Cyclopedia of Things Worth Knowing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Handy Cyclopedia of Things Worth Knowing by Joseph Trenans. Section 17 The Steps in the Growth of American Liberty. Magna Carta. About seven hundred years ago there was organized a movement which resulted in the Great Charter of English Liberty, a movement which foreshadowed the battle of our American forefathers for political independence. On the 25th of August, 1213, the prelates and barons, tiring of the tyranny and vacillation of King John, formed a council and passed measures to secure their rights. After two years of contest, with many vicissitudes, the barons entered London, and the king fled into Hampshire. By agreement both parties met at Runnymede on the ninth of June, 1215, and after several days' debate, on June fifteenth, Magna Carta, the Great Charter, the glory of England, was signed and sealed by the sovereign. The Magna Carta is a comprehensive bill of rights, and— Though crude in form, and with many clauses of merely local value, its spirit still lives, and will live. Clear and prominent we find the motto, No tax without representation. The original document is in Latin, and contains sixty-one articles, of which the thirty-ninth and fortieth, 
embodying the very marrow of our own state constitutions, are here given as translated in the English statutes. 39. No freeman shall be taken, or imprisoned, or be diseased of his freehold, or liberties or free customs, or be otherwise distroped, damaged, nor will be press upon him, nor seize upon him, condemn him, but by lawful judgment of his peers, or by the law of the land. 40. We will sell to no man, we will not deny or defer to any man, either right or justice. The Great Charter recognizes a popular tribunal as a check on the official judges, and may be looked upon as the foundation of the writ of habeas corpus. It provides that no one is to be condemned on rumor or suspicion, but only on the evidence of witnesses. It affords protection against excessive immersements, illegal distresses, and various processes for debts and service due to the Crown. Fines are in all cases to be proportionate to the magnitude of the offence, and even the villain or rustic is not to be deprived of his necessary chattels. There are provisions regarding the forfeiture of land for felony. The testamentary power of the subject is recognized over part of his personal estate, and the rest to be divided between his widow and children. The independence of the church is also provided for. These are the most important features of the Great Charter, which, exacted by men with arms in their hands from a resisting king, occupies so conspicuous a place in history, which establishes the supremacy of the law of England over the will of the monarch, and which still forms the basis of English liberties. THE MECKLENBURG DECLARATION more than a year before the signing of the Declaration of Independence, a document was drawn up that was almost a model in phraseology and sentiment of the Great Charter of American Freedom. There are various accounts of this matter, but the most trustworthy is this. At a public meeting of the residents of Mecklenburg County, North Carolina, held at Charlotte on the 20th of May, 1775, it was, quote, Resolved, that whenever directly or indirectly abetted, or in any way, form, or manner countenanced, the unchartered and undangerous invasion of our rights, as claimed by Great Britain, is an enemy to our country, to America, and to the inherent and inalienable rights of man. Resolved, that we, the citizens of Mecklenburg County, do hereby dissolve the political bonds which have connected us to the mother country, and hereby absolve ourselves from all allegiance to the British crown, and abjure all political connection, contract, or association with that nation, which has wantonly trampled on our rights and liberties, and inhumanely shed the blood of American patriots at Lexington. Resolved, that we do hereby declare ourselves a free and independent people, are and of right ought to be a sovereign and self-governing association, under the control of no power other than that of our God, and the general government of the Congress. To the maintenance of which independence we solemnly pledge to each other our mutual cooperation, our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. End quote. There are two other resolutions concerning the militia and the administration of the law, but these, having no present value, are here omitted. THE DECLARATION OF INDEPENDENCE IN CONGRESS, JULY 4th, 1776 When, in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bonds which have connected them with another, and to assume, among the powers of the earth, the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature, and nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. 
that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it, and to institute a new government, laying its foundation on such principles, and organizing its powers in such form, as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes, and accordingly all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer, while evils are sufferable, than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty, to throw off such government, and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. He has refused his assent to laws the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. He has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance, unless suspended in their operation till his assent should be obtained, and when so suspended, he has utterly neglected to attend to them. He has refused to pass other laws for the accommodation of large districts of people, unless those people would relinquish the right of representation in the legislature, a right inestimable to them, formidable to tyrants only. He has called together legislative bodies, at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the depository of their public records, for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with his measures. He has dissolved representative houses repeatedly, for opposing with manly firmness his invasions on the rights of the people. He has refused, for a long time after such dissolutions, to cause others to be elected, whereby the legislative powers, incapable of annihilation, have returned to the people at large, for their exercise, the state remaining, in the meantime, exposed to all the dangers of invasion from without, and convulsions within. He has endeavoured to prevent the population of these states, for that purpose obstructing the laws for naturalization of foreigners, refusing to pass others to encourage their migration hither, and raising conditions of new appropriation of lands. He has obstructed the administration of justice by refusing his assent to laws establishing judiciary powers. He has made judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their offices, and the amount and payment of their salaries. He has erected a multitude of new offices, and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people, and to eat out their substance. He has kept among us, in times of peace, standing armies, without the consent of our legislatures. He has affected to render the military independent of, and superior to, the civil power. He has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our constitution, and unacknowledged by our laws, giving his assent to their acts of pretended legislation for quartering large bodies of armed troops among us, for protecting them by mock trial from punishment for any murders which they should commit on the inhabitants of these states, for cutting off our trade with all parts of the world, for imposing taxes on us without our consent, for depriving us, in many cases, of the benefits of trial by jury, for transporting us beyond the seas to be tried for pretended offences for abolishing the free system of English laws in a neighbouring province, establishing therein an arbitrary government, and enlarging its boundaries, so as to render it at once an example and fit instrument for introducing the same absolute rule into these colonies. For taking away our charters, abolishing our most valuable laws, and altering, fundamentally, the forms of our governments 
for suspending our own legislatures and declaring themselves invested with power to legislate for us, in all cases whatsoever. He has abdicated government here, by declaring us out of his protection, and waging war against us. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burnt our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. He is at this time transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries, to complete the works of death, desolation, and tyranny, already begun with circumstances of cruelty and perfidy scarcely paralleled in the most barbarous ages, and totally unworthy the head of a civilized nation. He has constrained our fellow-citizens, taken captive on the high seas, to bear arms against their country, to become the executioners of their friends and brethren, or to fall themselves by their hands. He has excited domestic insurrection among us, and has endeavoured to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers the merciless Indian savages, whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. In every stage of these oppressions we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant, is unfit to be ruler of a free people. Nor have we been wanting in attention to our British brethren. We have warned them, from time to time, of attempts by their legislature to extend an unwarrantable jurisdiction over us. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our immigration and settlement here. We have appealed to their native justice and magnanimity and have conjured them, by the ties of our common kindred, to disavow these usurpations, which would inevitably interrupt our connection and correspondence. They, too, have been deaf to the voice of justice and of consanguinity. We must, therefore, acquiesce in the necessity which denounces our separation, and hold them, as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies in war, in peace friends. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, in general Congress assembled, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do, in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are, and of right ought to be, free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is, and ought to be, totally dissolved, and that, as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and to do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do and for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honour. The foregoing declaration was, by order of the Congress, engrossed, and signed by the following members. John Hancock New Hampshire, Josiah Bartlett, William Whipple, Matthew Thornton Massachusetts Bay, Samuel Adams, John Adams, Robert Treat Payne, Elbridge Jerry. Rhode Island, Stephen Hopkins, William Ellery. Connecticut, Roger Sherman, Samuel Huntington, William Williams, Oliver Wolcott. New York, William Floyd, Philip Livingston, Francis Lewis, Lewis Morris. New Jersey, Richard Stockton, John Witherspoon, Francis Hopkinson, John Hart, Abraham Clark. Pennsylvania, Robert Morris, Benjamin Rush, Benjamin Franklin, John Morton, George Clymer, James Smith, George Taylor, James Wilson, George Ross. Delaware, Caesar Rodney, George Reed. Thomas McKean, Maryland, Samuel Chase, William Paco, Thomas Stone, Charles Carroll of Carrollton, Virginia, George Wythe, Richard Henry Lee, 
Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Harrison, Thomas Nelson, Jr., Francis Lightfoot Lee, Carter Braxton, North Carolina, William Hooper, Joseph Hughes, John Penn, South Carolina, Edward Rutledge, Thomas Hayward, Jr., Thomas Lynch, Jr., Arthur Middleton, Georgia, Button Gwinnett, Lyman Hall, George Walton. The following clause formed part of the original Declaration of Independence as signed, but was finally left out of the printed copies, out of respect to South Carolina. He, King George III, has waged cruel war against human nature itself, violating its most sacred rights of life and liberty, in the persons of a distant people who never offended him, captivating and carrying them into slavery, in another hemisphere, or to incur miserable death in their transportation thither. End of section 17「Section 18 of The Handy Cyclopedia of Things Worth Knowing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Handy Cyclopedia of Things Worth Knowing by Joseph Trenans. Published in 1911. Section 18. THE UNITED STATES CONSTITUTION ARTICLES 1 AND 2 THE CONSTITUTION OF THE UNITED STATES We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquillity, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Article 1 Section 1 All legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States, which shall consist of a Senate and a House of Representatives. Section 2 1 the House of Representatives shall be composed of members chosen every second year by the people of the several states, and the electors in each state shall have the qualifications requisite for electors of the most numerous branch of the state legislature. 2. No person shall be a representative who shall not have attained to the age of twenty-five years, and have been seven years a citizen of the United States, and who shall not when elected, be an inhabitant of that state in which he shall be chosen. 3. Representative and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states which may be included within this union, according to their respective numbers, which shall be determined by adding to the whole number of free persons, including those bound to service for a term of years, and excluding Indians not taxed, three-fifths of all other persons. The actual enumeration shall be made within three years after the first meeting of the Congress of the United States, and within every subsequent term of ten years, in such manner as they shall by law direct. The number of representatives shall not exceed one for every thirty thousand, but each state shall have at least one representative. And until such enumeration shall be made, the state of New Hampshire shall be entitled to choose three, Massachusetts eight, Rhode Island and Providence Plantations 1, Connecticut 5, New York 6, New Jersey 4, Pennsylvania 8, Delaware 1, Maryland 6, Virginia 10, North Carolina 5, South Carolina 5, and Georgia 3. 4. When vacancies happen in the representation from any state, the executive authority thereof shall issue writs of election to fill such vacancies. 5. The House of Representatives shall choose their Speaker and other officers, and shall have the sole power of impeachment. Section 3 
The Senate of the United States shall be composed of two senators from each state, chosen by the legislature thereof, for six years, and each senator shall have one vote. 2. Immediately after they shall be assembled in consequence of the first election, they shall be divided as equally as may be into three classes. The seats of the senators of the first class shall be vacated at the expiration of the second year, of the second class at the expiration of the fourth year, and of the third class at the expiration of the sixth year, so that one third may be chosen every second year, and if vacancies happen by resignation, or otherwise, during the recess of the legislature of any state, the executive thereof may make temporary appointments until the next meeting of the legislature, which shall then fill such vacancies. 3. No person shall be a senator who shall not have attained to the age of thirty years, and been nine years a citizen of the United States, and who shall not, when elected, be an inhabitant of that state for which he shall be chosen. 4. The Vice-President of the United States shall be President of the Senate, but shall have no vote unless they be equally divided. 5. The Senate shall choose their other officers, and also a President pro tempore, in the absence of the Vice-President, or when he shall exercise the office of the President of the United States. 6. The Senate shall have the sole power to try all impeachments. When sitting for that purpose, they shall be on oath or affirmation. When the President of the United States is tried, the Chief Justice shall preside, and no person shall be convicted without the concurrence of two-thirds of the members present. 7. Judgment, in cases of impeachment, shall not extend further than to removal from office, disqualification to hold and enjoy any office of honor, trust, or profit under the United States, but the party convicted shall nevertheless be liable and subject to indictment, trial, judgment, and punishment, according to law. Section 4. The times, places, and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof, but the Congress may at any time by law make or alter such regulations, except as to the places of choosing senators. 2. The Congress shall assemble at least once in every year, and such meeting shall be on the first Monday in December, unless they shall by law appoint a different day. Section 5. 1. Each house shall be the judge of the election, returns, and qualifications of its own members, and a majority of each shall constitute a quorum to do business, but a smaller number may adjourn from day to day, and may be authorized to compel the attendance of absent members, in such manner and under such penalties as each house may provide. 2. Each house may determine the rules of its proceedings, punish its members for disorderly behavior, and, with the concurrence of two-thirds, expel a member. 3. Each house shall keep a journal of its proceedings, and from time to time publish the same, excepting such parts as in their judgment require secrecy, and the yeas and nays of the members of either house, on any question, shall, at the desire of one-fifth of those present, be entered on the journal. 4. Neither house, during the session of Congress, shall, without the consent of the other, adjourn for more than three days, nor to any other place than that in which the two houses shall be sitting. Section 6. 1. The senators and representatives shall receive a compensation for their services, to be ascertained by law, and paid out of the treasury of the United States. They shall, in all cases, except treason, felony, and breach of peace, be privileged from arrest during their attendance at the session of their respective houses, and in going to and returning from the same, and for any speech or debate in either house they shall not be questioned in any other place. 2. 
No senator or representative shall, during the time for which he was elected, be appointed to any civil office under the authority of the United States, which shall have been created, or the emoluments whereof shall have been increased, during such time, and no person holding any office under the United States shall be a member of either House during his continuance in office. Section 7 1. All bills for raising revenue shall originate in the House of Representatives, but the Senate may propose or concur with amendments as on other bills. 2. Every bill which shall have passed the House of Representatives and the Senate shall, before it becomes a law, be presented to the President of the United States. If he approve, he shall sign it but if not he shall return it, with his objections, to that house in which it shall have originated, who shall enter the objections at large on their journal, and proceed to reconsider it. If, after such reconsideration, two-thirds of that house shall agree to pass the bill, it shall be sent, together with the objections, to the other house, by which it shall likewise be reconsidered, and if approved by two-thirds of that house, it shall become a law." but in all such cases the votes of both houses shall be determined by yeas and nays, and the names of the persons voting for or against the bill be entered on the journal of each house, respectively. If any bill shall not be returned by the President within ten days, Sundays excepted, after it shall have been presented to him, the same shall be a law, in like manner as if he had signed it, unless the Congress, by their adjournment, prevent its return, in which case it shall not be a law. 3. Every order, resolution, or vote, to which the concurrence of the Senate and the House of Representatives may be necessary, except on a question of adjournment, shall be presented to the President of the United States, and before the same shall take effect, shall be approved by him, or, being disapproved by him, shall be repassed by two-thirds of the Senate and House of Representatives, according to the rules and limitations prescribed in the case of a bill. Section 8. The Congress shall have power. 1. To lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises, to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. But all duties, imposts, and excises shall be uniform throughout the United States. 2. To borrow money on the credit of the United States. 3. To regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. 4. To establish a uniform rule of naturalization, and uniform laws on the subject of bankruptcies, throughout the United States. 5. To coin money, regulate the value thereof, and of foreign coin, and fix the standard of weights and measures. 6 to provide for the punishment of counterfeiting the securities and current coin of the United States. 7. To establish post offices and post roads. 8. To promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. 9. To constitute tribunals inferior to the Supreme Court. 10. To define and punish piracies and felonies committed on the high seas, and offenses against the law of nations. 11. To declare war, grant letters of mark and reprisal, and make rules concerning captures on land and water. 12. To raise and support armies but no appropriation of money to that use shall be for a longer term than two years. 13. To provide and maintain a navy. 14. To make rules for the government and regulation of the land and naval forces. 15. To provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions. 16. To provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia, 
and for governing such part of them as may be employed in the service of the United States, reserving to the States, respectively, the appointment of the officers, and the authority of training the militia, according to the discipline prescribed by Congress. 17. To exercise exclusive legislation, in all cases whatsoever, over such district, not exceeding ten miles square, as may, by session of particular states, and the acceptance of Congress, become the seat of the government of the United States, and to exercise like authority over all places purchased by the consent of the legislature of the state in which the same shall be, for the erection of forts, magazines, arsenals, dockyards, and other needful buildings." and to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers, and all other powers vested by the Constitution in the government of the United States, or in any department or officer thereof. Section 9. 1 the migration or importation of such persons as any of the states now existing shall think proper to admit, shall not be prohibited by the Congress prior to the year 1808, but a tax or duty may be imposed on such importation, not exceeding ten dollars for each person. 2. The privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended, unless when, in cases of rebellion or invasion, the public safety may require it. 3. No bill of attainder or ex post facto law shall be passed. 4. No capitation or other direct tax shall be laid, unless in proportion to the census or enumeration herein before directed to be taken. 5. No tax or duty shall be laid on articles exported from any state. 6. No preference shall be given by any regulation of commerce or revenue to the ports of one state over those of another, nor shall vessels bound to or from one state be obliged to enter, clear, or pay duties in another. 7. No money shall be drawn from the treasury but in consequence of appropriations made by law, and a regular statement and account of the receipts and expenditures of all public monies shall be published from time to time. 8. No title of nobility shall be granted by the United States, and no person holding any office of profit or trust under them shall, without the consent of the Congress, accept of any present, emolument, office, or title of any kind whatever, from any king, prince, or foreign state. Section 10. No state shall enter into any treaty, alliance, or confederation, grant letters of mark and reprisal, coin money, emit bills of credit, make anything but gold and silver coin a tender in payment of debts, pass any bill of attainder, ex post facto law, or law impairing the obligation of contracts, or grant any title of nobility. 2. No state shall, without the consent of the Congress, lay any impost or duties on imports or exports, except what may be absolutely necessary for executing its inspection laws and the net produce of any duties and imposts laid by any state on imports or exports shall be for the use of the Treasury of the United States, and all such laws shall be subject to the revision and control of the Congress. No state shall, without the consent of the Congress, lay any duty of tonnage, keep troops or ships of war in time of peace, enter into any agreement or compact with another state, or with a foreign power, or engage in war, unless actually invaded, or in such imminent danger as will not admit of delay. Article 2. Section 1. The executive power shall be vested in a President of the United States of America. He shall hold his office during the term of four years, and, together with the Vice President chosen for the same term, be elected as follows. 2. Each State shall appoint, in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct, 
a number of electors, equal to the whole number of senators and representatives to which the state may be entitled in the Congress. But no senator or representative, or person holding an office of trust or profit under the United States, shall be appointed an elector. 3. The electors shall meet in their respective states, and vote by ballot for two persons, of whom one at least shall not be an inhabitant of the same state with themselves. And they shall make a list of all the persons voted for, and of the number of votes for each, which list they shall sign and certify, and transmit sealed to the seat of government of the United States, directed to the President of the Senate. The President of the Senate shall in the presence of the Senate and House of Representatives, open all the certificates, and the votes shall then be counted. The person having the greatest number of votes shall be the President, if such number be a majority of the whole number of electors appointed. And if there be more than one who have such a majority, and have an equal number of votes, then the House of Representatives shall immediately choose, by ballot, one of them for President, and if no person have a majority, then, from the five highest on the list, the said House shall, in like manner, choose the President. But in choosing the President the votes shall be taken by States, the representation from each State having one vote. A quorum for this purpose shall consist of a member or members from two-thirds of all the States, and a majority of all the States shall be necessary to a choice. In every case, after the choice of the President, the person having the greatest number of votes of the electors shall be the vice-president. But if there should remain two or more who have equal votes, the Senate shall choose from them, by ballot, the vice-president. The Congress may determine the time of choosing the electors, and the day on which they shall give their votes, which day shall be the same throughout the United States. No person, except a natural-born citizen, or a citizen of the United States at the time of the adoption of this Constitution, shall be eligible to the office of President. Neither shall any person be eligible to that office who shall not have attained the age of thirty-five years, and been fourteen years a resident within the United States. 6. In case of the removal of the President from office, or of his death, resignation, or inability to discharge the powers and duties of said office, the same shall devolve on the vice-president, and the Congress may, by law, provide for the case of removal, death, resignation, or inability, both of the president and the vice-president, declaring what officer shall then act as president, and such officer shall act accordingly, until the disability be removed, or a president shall be elected." 7. The President shall, at stated times, receive for his services a compensation, which shall neither be increased nor diminished during the period for which he shall have been elected, and he shall not receive within that period any other emoluments from the United States, or any of them. 8. Before he enter on the execution of his office, he shall take the following oath or affirmation. I do solemnly swear, or affirm, that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States, and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Section 2. 1. The President shall be Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy of the United States, and of the Militia of the several States, when called into the actual service of the United States. He may require the opinion, in writing, of the principal officer in each of the executive departments, upon any subject relating to the duties of their respective offices, and he shall have power to grant reprieves and pardons for offences against the United States, except in cases of impeachment. 2. He shall have power, by and with the advice and consent of the Senate, to make treaties, provided two-thirds of the senators present concur, and he shall nominate, and, by and with the advice and consent of the Senate, shall appoint ambassadors, other public ministers and consuls, judges of the Supreme Court, and all other officers of the United States whose appointments are not herein otherwise provided for, and which shall be established by law. 
But the Congress may, by law, vest the appointment of such inferior officers as they think proper, in the President alone, in the courts of law, or in the heads of departments. 3. The President shall have power to fill all vacancies that may happen during the recess of the Senate, by granting commissions which shall expire at the end of their next session. Section 3. He shall, from time to time, give to the Congress information of the State of the Union, and recommend to their consideration such measures as he shall judge necessary and expedient. He may, on extraordinary occasions, convene both houses, or either of them, and in case of disagreement between them, with respect to the time of adjournment, he may adjourn them to such time as he shall think proper. He shall receive ambassadors and other public ministers. He shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed, and shall commission all officers of the United States. Section 4. The President, Vice-President, and all civil officers of the United States shall be removed from office on impeachment for, and conviction of, treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. End of section 18. Section 19 of The Handy Cyclopedia of Things Worth Knowing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Handy Cyclopedia of Things Worth Knowing by Joseph Trenans. Published in 1911. Section 19. The U.S. Constitution, Articles 3 through 7. Article 3. Section 1. 1. The judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court, and in such inferior courts as Congress may, from time to time, ordain and establish. The judges, both of the supreme and inferior courts, shall hold their offices during good behavior, and shall, at stated times, receive for their services a compensation which shall not be diminished during their continuance of office. Section 2. 1. The judicial power shall extend to all cases in law and equity arising under this Constitution, the laws of the United States, and treaties made, or which shall be made, under their authority, to all cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers and consuls, to all cases of admiralty and maritime jurisdiction, to controversies to which the United States shall be a party, to controversies between two or more states, between a state and citizens of another state, between citizens of different states, between citizens of the same state claiming lands under grants of different states, and between a state, or the citizens thereof, and foreign states, citizens or subjects. 2. In all cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers and consuls, and those in which a state shall be a party, the Supreme Court shall have original jurisdiction. In all the other cases mentioned, the Supreme Court shall have appellate jurisdiction, both as to law and fact, with such exceptions and under such regulations as the Congress shall make. 3. The trial of all crimes, except in cases of impeachment, shall be by jury, and such trial shall be held in the state where the said crime shall have been committed, but when not committed within any state, the trial shall be at such place or places as the Congress may by law have directed. Section 3 1. Treason against the United States shall consist only in levying war against them, or in adhering to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort. No person shall be convicted of treason unless on the testimony of two witnesses to the same overt act, or on confession in open court. 2. The Congress shall have power to declare the punishment of treason, but no attainder of treason shall work corruption of blood, or forfeiture, except during the life of the person attained. Article 4. Section 1. 1. 
full faith and credit shall be given in each state to the public acts records and judicial proceedings of every other state and the congress may by general laws prescribe the manner in which such acts records and proceedings shall be proved and the effect thereof section two one the citizens of each state shall be entitled to all privileges and immunities of citizens in the several states two a person charged in any state with treason felony or other crime who shall flee from justice and be found in another state shall on demand of the executive authority of the state from which he fled be delivered up to be removed to the state having jurisdiction of the crime three no person held to service or labor in one state under the laws thereof escaping into another shall in consequence of any laws or regulations therein be discharged from such service or labor but shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due section three one new states may be admitted by the congress into this union but no new state shall be formed or erected within the jurisdiction of any other state nor any state be formed by the junction of two or more states or parts of states without the consent of the legislatures of the states concerned as well as of congress two the congress shall have the power to dispose of and make all needful rules and regulations respecting the territory or other property belonging to the united states and nothing in this Constitution shall be so construed as to prejudice any claim of the United States, or of any particular State. Section 4. 1. The United States shall guarantee to every State in this Union a republican form of government, and shall protect each of them against invasion, and, on application of the legislature, or of the executive, when the legislature cannot be convened, against domestic violence article five one the congress whenever two-thirds of both houses shall deem it necessary shall propose amendments to this constitution or on the application of the legislatures of two-thirds of the several states shall call a convention for proposing amendments which in either case shall be valid to all intents and purposes as part of this constitution when ratified by the legislatures of three-fourths of the several states or by conventions in three-fourths thereof as the one or the other mode of ratification may be proposed by the congress provided that no amendment which may be made prior to the year one thousand eight hundred and eight shall in any manner affect the first and fourth clauses in the ninth section of the fifth article and that no state without its consent, shall be deprived of its equal suffrage in the Senate. Article six. All debts contracted and engagements entered into before the adoption of this Constitution shall be as valid against the United States under this Constitution as under the Confederation. Two. This Constitution, and the laws of the United States which shall be made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made, or which shall be made, under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land, and the judges of every State shall be bound thereby, anything in the Constitution or laws of any State, to the contrary notwithstanding. 3. The senators and representatives before mentioned, and the members of the several state legislatures, and all executive and judicial officers, both of the United States and the several states, shall be bound by oath or affirmation to support this Constitution, but no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. Article 7 the ratification of the convention of nine states shall be sufficient for the establishment of this constitution between the states so ratifying the same done in convention by the unanimous consent of the states present the seventeenth day of december in the year of our lord one thousand seven hundred and eighty seven and of independence of the united states of america the twelfth in witness whereof we have hereunto subscribed our names george washington President and Deputy from Virginia. 
Amendments. Article One. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble, and to petition the government for a redress of grievance. Article Two. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Article Three, No soldier shall, in time of peace, be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner, nor in time of war, but in a manner to be prescribed by law. Article Four, The rights of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects, against unreasonable searches and seizures, shall not be violated and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched, and the persons or things to be seized. Article 5. No person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime, unless on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury, except in cases arising in the land or naval forces, or in the militia, when in actual service, in time of war, or public danger. Nor shall any person be subject for the same offence to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb. Nor shall be compelled, in any criminal case, to be a witness against himself. Nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property, without due process of law. Nor shall private property be taken for public use, without just compensation. Article 6. In all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial, by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed, which district shall have been previously ascertained by law, and to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation, to be confronted with the witnesses against him, to have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in his favour, and to have the assistance of counsel for his defence. Article 7. In suits at common law, where the value in controversy shall exceed twenty dollars, the right of trial by jury shall be preserved, and no fact tried by a jury shall be otherwise re-examined in any court of the United States than according to the rules of the common law. Article 8. Excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishment inflicted. Article 9. The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. Article 10. The powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the States, are reserved to the States respectively, or to the people. The preceding ten amendatory articles were proposed to the legislatures of the States by the First Congress, September 25, 1789, and notification of ratification received from all the States except Connecticut, Georgia, and Massachusetts. Article 11. The judicial power of the United States shall not be construed to extend to any suit in law or equity commenced or prosecuted against one of the United States by citizens or subjects of any foreign state. Proposed by the Third Congress, and Congress notified of its adoption January 8, 1798. Article 12. 1. The electors shall meet in their respective states, and vote by ballot for President and Vice-President, one of whom, at least, shall not be an inhabitant of the same state with themselves. They shall name in their ballots the person voted for as President, and in distinct ballots the person voted for as Vice-President, and they shall make distinct lists of all persons voted for as President, and of all persons voted for as Vice-President, and of the number of votes for each, which lists they shall sign and certify, and transmit sealed to the seat of government of the United States, directed to the President of the Senate. 
the President of the Senate shall, in the presence of the Senate and House of Representatives, open the certificates, and the votes shall then be counted. The person having the greatest number of votes for President shall be the President, if such number be a majority of the whole number of electors appointed. And if no person have such majority, then, from the persons having the highest numbers, not exceeding three, on the list of those voted for as President, the House of Representatives shall choose immediately, by ballot, the President. But in choosing the President, the votes shall be taken by States, the representation from each State having one vote. A quorum for this purpose shall consist of a member or members from two-thirds of the States, and a majority of all States shall be necessary to a choice. And if the House of Representatives shall not choose a President, whenever the right of choice shall devolve upon them, before the fourth day of March next following, then the Vice-President shall act as President, as in the case of the death or other constitutional disability of the President. 2. The person having the greatest number of votes as Vice-President shall be the Vice-President, if such number be a majority of the whole number of electors appointed, and if no person have a majority, then from the two highest numbers on the list the Senate shall choose the Vice-President. A quorum for this purpose shall consist of two-thirds of the whole number of Senators, and a majority of the whole number shall be necessary to a choice. 3. But no person constitutionally ineligible to the office of President shall be eligible to that of Vice-President of the United States. Proposed by the Eighth Congress, and declared adopted September 23, 1804, by proclamation of the Secretary of State. Article 13. 1. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States, or any place subject to their jurisdiction. 2. Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Proposed by the 38th Congress, and declared adopted December 18, 1865, by proclamation of the Secretary of State. Article 14. Section 1. All persons born or naturalized in the United States, and subject to the jurisdiction thereof, are citizens of the United States, and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property, without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Section 2. Representatives shall be apportioned among the several states according to their respective numbers, counting the whole number of persons in each state, excluding Indians not taxed. But when the right to vote at any election for the choice of electors for President and Vice-President of the United States, representatives in Congress, the executive and judicial officers of a state, or the members of the legislature thereof, is denied to any of the male inhabitants of such state, being twenty-one years of age, and citizens of the United States, or in any way abridged, except for participation in rebellion or other crime, the basis of representation therein shall be reduced, in the proportion which the number of such male citizens shall bear to the whole number of male citizens twenty-one years of age in such state. Section 3 no person shall be a senator or representative in Congress, or elector of President and Vice-President, or hold any office, civil or military, under the United States, or under any State, who, having previously taken an oath as member of Congress, or as an officer of the United States, or as a member of any State legislature, or as an executive or judicial officer of any State, to support the Constitution of the United States, shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the same, or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof. But Congress may, by a vote of two-thirds of each House, remove such disability. Section 4. The validity of the public debt of the United States, authorized by law, including debts incurred for payment of pensions and bounties for services in suppressing insurrection and rebellion, shall not be questioned. 
but neither the United States, nor any State, shall assume or pay any debt or obligation incurred in aid of insurrection or rebellion against the United States, or any claim for the loss or emancipation of any slave, but all such debts, obligations, and claims shall be held illegal and void. Section 5. The Congress shall have power to enforce, by appropriate legislation, the provisions of this article. Proposed by the Thirty-Ninth Congress, and declared adopted by Concurrent Resolution of Congress, July 21st, 1868. Article 15. Section 1. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States, or any state, on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Section 2. The Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Proposed by the Fortieth Congress, and declared adopted by proclamation of the Secretary of State, March 30th, 1870. End of Section 19 Section 20 of the Handy Cyclopedia of Things Worth Knowing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Julian Jameson. The Handy Cyclopedia of Things Worth Knowing by Joseph Trianons. Published in 1911. Working men easily gulled. Who fought for King George in 1776? Working people. What interest did they have in being ruled by him? None. Why, then, did they risk their lives for him? Because he hired them. Where did the king get the money to pay them? By taxing them. Then they really paid themselves for fighting. Certainly. In every war ever fought, the working people paid the expenses. Quote, what constitutes a state? Men who their duties know, but know their rights, and, knowing, dare maintain. Unquote. Jones. Jefferson's Political Policy 1. Legal Equality of All Human Beings Two, the people, the only source of power. Three, no hereditary offices, nor order of nobility, nor title. Four, no unnecessary taxation. Five, no national banks or bonds. Six, no costly splendor of administration. Seven, freedom of thought and discussion. 8. Civil authority superior to the military. 9. No favored classes, no special privileges, no monopolies. 10. Free and fair elections, universal suffrage. 11. No public money spent without warrant of law. 12. No mysteries in government hidden from the public eye. 13. Representatives bound by the instructions of their constituents. 14. The Constitution of the United States, a special grant of powers, limited and definite. 15. Freedom, sovereignty, and independence of the respective states. 16. Absolute severance of church and state. 17. The Union a compact, not a consolidation, nor a centralization. 18. Moderate salaries, economy, and strict accountability. 19. Gold and silver currency, supplemented by treasury notes bearing no interest and bottomed on taxes. 20. No state banks of issue. 21. No expensive navy or diplomatic establishment. 22 a progressive or graduated tax laid upon wealth. 23. No internal revenue system, 
a complete separation of public monies from bank funds. Presidents of the United States Declaration of Independence, July 4th, 1776 General Washington, First President, 1789 and 1793 John Adams, 1797 Thomas Jefferson, 1801 and 1805 James Madison, 1809 and 1813 James Monroe, 1817 and 1821 John Quincy Adams, 1825 General Andrew Jackson, 1829 and 1833 Martin Van Buren, 1837 General William Henry Harrison, died 4th April, 1841 John Tyler, elected as Vice President, 1841 James Knox Polk, 1845 General Zachary Taylor, died 9th July, 1850, 1849 Millard Fillmore, elected as Vice President, 1850 General Franklin Pierce, 1853 James Buchanan, 1857 Abraham Lincoln, assassinated 14th April, 1865 1861 and 1865 Andrew Johnson, elected as Vice President, 1865 General Ulysses S. Grant, 1869 and 1873 Rutherford B. Hayes, 1877. General J. Abram Garfield, died 19th September, 1881. 1881. General Chester A. Arthur, elected as V. Prez, 1881. Grover Cleveland, 1885. Benjamin H. Harrison, 1889. Grover Cleveland, 1893. William McKinley, elected, 1897, re-elected, 1901, assassinated September 14, 1901. Theodore Roosevelt, elected vice president, 1901, became president September 14, 1901. Theodore Roosevelt, elected, 1905. William H. Taft, 1909. Facts about the Liberty Bell Cast by Thomas Lester, Whitechapel, London Arrived in Philadelphia in August 1752 First used in State House, Philadelphia, August 27, 1752 Twice recast by Pass and Snow, Philadelphia, to repair crack, September 1752 Muffled and told October 5th, 1765, on arrival of ship Royal Charlotte, with stamps. Muffled and told October 31st, 1765, when Stamp Act was put in operation. Summoned meeting to prevent landing of cargo of tea from the ship Polly, December 27th, 1774. Summoned meeting of Patriots, April 25th, 1775, after Battle of Lexington. Proclaimed Declaration of Independence and the Birth of a New Nation at Great Ratification Meeting, July 8, 1776. First journey from Philadelphia made in September 1777 to Allentown, Pennsylvania, to escape capture by the British. Returned June 27, 1778. Proclaimed Treaty of Peace, April 16, 1783 told for the death of Washington, December 26, 1799, rung on the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, July 4, 1826, last used in tolling for the death of John Marshall, July 8, 1835, principal tours to New Orleans in 1885, Chicago, 1893, Atlanta, 1895, Boston, 1902, St. Louis, 1904. 
How the Presidents Died George Washington's death was the result of a severe cold, contracted while riding around his farm in a rain and sleet storm on December 10, 1799. The cold increased and was followed by a chill, which brought on acute laryngitis. He died at the age of sixty-eight, on December 14, 1799. John Adams died from old age, having reached his ninety-first milestone. Though active mentally, he was nearly blind and unable to hold a pen steadily enough to write. He passed away without pain on July 4, 1826. Thomas Jefferson died at the age of eighty-three, a few hours before Adams, on July 4, 1826. His disease was chronic diarrhea, superinduced by old age, and his physician said the too free use of the waters of the white sulphur springs. James Madison also died of old age, and peacefully, on June 28, 1836. His faculties were undimmed to the last. He was eighty-five. James Monroe's demise, which occurred in the seventy-third year of his age, on July 4, 1831, was assigned to enfeebled health. John Quincy Adams was stricken with paralysis on February 21, 1848, while addressing the Speaker of the House of Representatives, being at the time a member of Congress. He died in the rotunda of the Capitol. He was eighty-one years of age. Andrew Jackson died on June 8, 1845, seventy-eight years old. He suffered from consumption and finally dropsy, which made its appearance about six months before his death. Martin Van Buren died on July 24, 1862, from a violent attack of asthma, followed by catarrhal affections of the throat and lungs. He was eighty years of age. William Henry Harrison's death was caused by pleurisy, the result of a cold, which he caught on the day of his inauguration. This was accompanied with severe diarrhea, which would not yield to medical treatment. He died on April 4, 1841, a month after his inauguration. He was sixty-eight years of age. John Tyler died on January 17, 1862, at the age of seventy-two. Cause of death? Bilious colic. James K. Polk was stricken with a slight attack of cholera in the spring of 1849, while on a boat going up the Mississippi River. Though temporarily relieved, he had a relapse on his return home, and died on June 15, 1849, aged fifty-four years. Zachary Taylor was the second president to die in office. He is said to have partaken immoderately of ice water and iced milk, and then later of a large quantity of cherries. The result was an attack of cholera morbus. He was sixty-six years old. Millard Fillmore died from a stroke of paralysis on March 8, 1874, in his seventy-fourth year. Franklin Pierce's death was due to abdominal dropsy, and occurred on October 8, 1869, in the 65th year of his age. James Buchanan's death occurred on June 1, 1868, and was caused by rheumatic gout. He was 77 years of age. Abraham Lincoln was shot by J. Wilkes Booth at Ford's Theater, Washington, D.C., on April 14, 1865, and died the following day, aged 56. Andrew Johnson died from a stroke of paralysis, July 31, 1875, aged 67. U.S. Grant died of cancer of the tongue at Mount McGregor, New York, July 3, 1885. James A. Garfield was shot by Charles J. Guiteau on July 2, 1881, died September 19, 1881. Chester A. Arthur, who succeeded Garfield, died suddenly of apoplexy in New York City, November 18, 1886. Rutherford B. Hayes died January 17, 1803, the result of a severe cold contracted in Cleveland, Ohio. Benjamin Harrison died March 13, 1901. Cause of death? Pneumonia. William McKinley was assassinated September 14, 1901. Grover Cleveland died on June 24, 1908, of debility, aged 71. End of section 20. Section 21 of the Handy Cyclopedia of Things Worth Knowing, 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Handy Cyclopedia of Things Worth Knowing by Joseph Trennans, published in 1911. Who is the author? The following literary curiosity found its way recently into the query column of a Boston newspaper. Nobody seems to know who wrote it. Oh, I wish I was in Eden, where all the beasts is feedin, the pigs and cows and osses, and the long-tail bull what tosses, the bulldog and the rabbit, a cause it is his habit, where lions, tigers, monkeys, and them long-eared things called donkeys, meet all together daily, with crocodiles all scaly, where sparrows on the bushes sing to their mates the thrushes, and hawks and little wrens walks about like cocks and ends, one looking at t'other, for all the world like a brother, where no quarrelin is or fightin, it's true what I'm a-writin, oh, for a walk at even, somewhere about six or seven, when the sun be gone to bed, with his face all fiery red, Oh, for the grapes and raisins, what ripens at all seasons, the apples and the plums, as big as my two thumbs, the haypricocks and peaches, what all within our reaches, and we mought pick and eat, payin' nothing for the treat. Oh, for the pooty flowers, a bloomin' at all hours, so that a large bouquet you may gather any day, of every flower that blows, from cauliflower to rose. The Art of Not Forgetting a brief but comprehensive treatise based on Loess's famous system of memory culture. So much has been said about Loess's memory system, the art has been so widely advertised and so carefully guarded from all the profane who do not send five or many dollars to the professor, that a few pages showing how man may be his own Loisette may be both interesting and valuable. In the first place, the system is a good one, and well worth the labor of mastering. And if the directions are implicitly followed, there can be no doubt that the memory will be greatly strengthened and improved, and that the mnemonic feats otherwise impossible may be easily performed. Loisette, however, is not an inventor, but an introducer. He stands in the same relation to Dr. Pick that the retail dealer holds to the manufacturer. The one produced the article, the other brings it to the public. Even this statement is not quite fair to Loisette, for he has brought much practical common sense to bear upon Pick's system, and in preparing the new art of mnemonics for the market, in many ways he has made it his own. If each man would reflect upon the method by which he himself remembers things, he would find his hand upon the key of the whole mystery. For instance, I was once trying to remember the word blithe. There occurred to my mind the words bellman, bell, and the verse, The peasant upward climbing hears the bells of bullish chiming. Bercarol, Barrack, and so on, until finally the word blithe presented itself with a strange insistence long after I had ceased trying to recall it. On another occasion, when trying to recall the name Richardson, I got the words Hayrick, Robertson, Randallstown, and finally Wealthy, from which naturally I got Rich, and Richardson almost in a breath. Still another example. Trying to recall the name of an old schoolmate, Grady, I got Brady, Grave, Gaseous, Gastronome, Gracious, and I finally abandoned the attempt, simply saying to myself that it began with a G and there was an A sound after it. The next morning, when thinking of something entirely different, this name Grady came up in my mind with as much distinctiveness as though someone had whispered it in my ear. This remembering was done without any conscious effort on my part, and was evidently the result of the exertion made the day before when the mnemonic processes were put to work. Every reader must have had a similar experience which he can recall, and which will fall in line with the examples given. It follows, then, that when we endeavor, without the aid of any system, to recall a forgotten fact or name, our memory presents to us words of similar sound or meaning in its journey toward the goal to which we have started it. This goes to show that our ideas are arranged in groups in whatever secret cavity or recess of the brain they occupy, and that the arrangement is not an alphabetical one exactly, and not entirely by meaning, but after some fashion partaking of both. If you are looking for the word meadow, you may reach middle before you come to it, or Mexico, or many words beginning with the M sound, or containing the Dow as window or doe, or you may get field or farm, but you are on the right track, and if you do not interfere with your intellectual processes, you will finally come to the idea which you are seeking. How often have you heard people say, I forgot his name, it is something like beetle or beagle, at any rate it begins with a B. Each and all of these were unconscious Loisettians, and they were practicing blindly and without proper method or direction, the excellent system which he teaches. The thing then to do, and it is the final and simple truth which Loisette teaches, is to travel over this ground in the other direction, to cement the fact which you wish to remember to some other fact or word which you know will be brought out by the implied conditions, and thus you will always be able to travel from your given starting point to the thing which you wish to call to mind.
It seems as though a channel were cut in our mind stuff along which the memory flows. How to construct an easy channel for any event or series of events or facts which one wishes to remember along which the mind will ever afterward travel is the secret of mnemonics. Loisette, in common with all the mnemonic teachers, uses the old device of representing numbers by letters, and as this is the first and easiest step in the art, this seems to be the most logical place to introduce the accepted equivalents of the Arabic numerals. Zero is always represented by S, Z, or a C soft. One is always represented by T, TH, or D. Two is always represented by N. Three is always represented by M. Four is always represented by R. Five is always represented by L. Six is always represented by SH, J, CH soft, or G soft. Seven is always represented by G hard, K, C hard, Q, or final NG. Eight is always represented by F or V. Nine is always represented by P or B. All the other letters are used simply to fill up. Double letters in a word count only as one. In fact, the system goes by sound, not by spelling. For instance, this or dizzy would stand for ten. Catch or gush would stand for seventy-six. And the only difficulty is to make some word or phrase which will contain only the significant letters in the proper order filled out with the non-significance into some guise of meaning or intelligibility. You can remember the equivalence given above by noting that Z is the first letter of zero, and C of cipher. T has but one stroke, N has two, M three, the script F is very like eight, the script P like nine, R is the last letter of four, L is the Roman numeral for fifty, which suggests five. The others may be retained by memorizing these nonsense lines. Six shy Jewesses chase George. Seven great kings came quarreling. Suppose you wish to get some phrase or word that would express the number 3,685. You arrange the letters this way. Three, six, eight, five. A-M, A-S-H, A-F, A-1. E, E, J, E, V, E. I, I, C, H, I, I. O O G O O U U U U H H H H W W W W X X X X Y Y Y Y You can make out image of law, my shuffle, matchville, etc., etc., as far as you like to work it out. Now suppose you wish to memorize the fact that one million dollars in gold weighs 3,685 pounds. You could go about it in this way, and here is the kernel and crux of Loisette's system. How much does one million dollars in gold weigh? Weigh scales, scales, statute of justice, statute of justice, image of law. The process is simplicity itself. The thing you wish to recall, and that you fear to forget, is the weight. Consequently, you submit your chain of suggestion to the idea which is most prominent in your mental question. What do you weigh with? Scales. What does the mental picture of scales suggest? The statue of justice, blindfolded and weighing out award and punishment to man. Finally, what is the statute of justice but the image of law? And the words image of law, translated back from the significant letters of M, G soft, F, and 1, give you 3685, the number of pounds in $1 billion in gold. You bind together in your mind each separate step in the journey, the one suggests the other, and you will find a year from now that the fact will be as fresh in your memory as it is today. You cannot lose it. It is chained to you by an unbreakable mnemonic tie. Mark that it is not claimed that weight will of itself suggest scales, and scales statue of justice, etc., but that having once passed your attention up and down the ladder of ideas, your mental tendency will be to take the same route, and get to the same goal again and again. Indeed, beginning with the weight of one million dollars, image of law, will turn up in your mind without your consciousness of any intermediate station on the way, after some iteration and reiteration of the original chain. Again, so as to fasten the process in the reader's mind even more firmly, suppose that it were desired to fix the date of the Battle of Hastings, A.D. 1066, in the memory. 1066 may be represented by the words, The Wise Judge, TH1, S0, J6, DG6. The others are non-significance. A chain might be made thus. Battle of Hastings, Arbitratement of War, Arbitratement of War, Arbitration, Arbitration Judgment, Judgment the Wise Judge. 
Make mental pictures, connect ideas, repeat words and sounds, go about it any way you please, so that you will form a mental habit of connecting the Battle of Hastings with the idea of arbitrament of war, and so on for the other links in the chain, and the work is done. Loisette makes the beginning of his system unnecessarily difficult, to say nothing of his illogical arrangement in the grammar of the art of memory, which he makes the first of his lessons. He analyzes suggestion into 1. Inclusion, 2. Exclusion, 3. Concurrence, all of which looks very scientific and orderly, but is really misleading and badly named. The truth is that one idea will suggest another. 1. By likeness or opposition of meaning, as house suggests room or door, etc., or white suggests black, cruel, kind, etc., 2. By likeness of sound, as harrow and barrow, henry and hennepin. 3. By mental juxtaposition, a peculiarity different in each person, and depending upon each one's own experiences. Thus, St. Charles suggests railway bridge to me, because I was vividly impressed by the breaking of the Wabash Bridge at that point. Stable and broken leg come near each other in my experience, as do cow and shotgun and licking. Out of these three sorts of suggestions, it is possible to get from any one fact to another in a chain certain and safe, along which the mind may be depended upon afterwards always to follow. The chain is, of course, by no means all. Its making and its binding must be accompanied by a vivid, methodically directed attention, which turns all the mental light gettable in a focus upon the subject passing across the mind's screen. Before Loisette was thought of this was known. In the old times in England, in order to impress upon the mind of the rising generation the parish boundaries in the rural districts, the boys were taken to each of the landmarks in succession, the position and bearing of each pointed out carefully, and in order to deepen the impression the young people were then and there vigorously thrashed, a mechanical method of attracting the attention which was said never to have failed. The system has had its supporters in many of the old-fashioned schools, and there are men who will read these lines who can recall, with an itching sense of vivid impression, the 144 lickings which were said to go with the multiplication table. In default of a thrashing, however, the student must cultivate as best he can an intense fixity of perception upon every fact or word or date that he wishes to make permanently his own. It is easy. It is a matter of habit. If you will, you can photograph an idea upon your cerebral gelatine, so that neither years nor events will blot it out or overlay it. You must be clearly and distinctly aware of the thing you are putting into your mental treasure house, and drastically certain of the cord by which you have tied it to some other thing of which you are sure. Unless it is worth your while to do this, you might as well abandon any hope of mnemonic improvement, which will not come without the hardest kind of work, although it is work that will grow constantly easier with practice and reiteration. You need, then, 1. Methodic Suggestion, 2. Methodic Attention, 3. Methodic Reiteration. And this is all there is to Loisette, and a great deal it is. Two of them will not do without the third. You do not know how many steps there are from your hall door to your bedroom, though you have attended to and often reiterated the journey. But if there are twenty of them, and you have once bound the word nice or nose or news or hyenas to the fact of the stairway, you can never forget it. The professor makes a point, and very wisely, of the importance of working through some established chain, so that the whole may be carried away in the mind, not alone for the value of the facts so bound together, but for the mental discipline so afforded. Here, then, is the President series, which contains the name and date of inauguration of each president from Washington to Cleveland. The manner in which it is to be mastered is this. Beginning at the top, try to find in your mind some connection between each word and the one following it. See how you can at some future time make one suggest the next, either by suggestion of sound or sense, or by mental juxtaposition. When you have found this, dwell on it attentively for a moment or two. Pass it backward and forward before you, and then go on to the next step. The chain runs thus, the name of the president being in capitals, the date words or date phrases being enclosed in parentheses. President, chosen for the first word, is the one most apt to occur to the mind of anyone wishing to repeat the names of presidents. Dentist, president and dentist. Draw, what does a dentist do? When something is drawn from one, it is given up. This is a date phrase meaning 1789. Washington, associate the quality of self-sacrifice with Washington character. Morning wash, Washington and wash. Dew, early wetness and dew. Flower beds, dew and flowers. Took a bouquet, flowers and bouquet, date phrase 1797. Garden, bouquet and garden. Eden, the first garden. Adam, juxtaposition of thought. Adams, suggestion by sound. Fall, juxtaposition in thought. Failure, fall and failure. Deficit, upon failure there is usually a deficit, date word 1801. Debt, the consequence of a deficit. 
Confederate bonds, suggestion by meaning. Jefferson Davis, juxtaposition of thought. Jefferson. Now follow out the rest for yourself, taking about ten at a time, and binding those you do last to those you have done before, each time before attacking the next bunch. Jefferson. Judge Jeffreys. Bloody a size. Bereavement. Too heavy a sob. Parental grief. Mad son. Madison. Madeira. Frustrating. First-rate wine. Defeating. Feet. Toe the line. Row. Munro. Row. Boat. Steamer. Side splitting. Divert. Annoy. Harassing. Harrison. Old Harry. The tempter. The fraud. Painted clay. Baked clay. Tiles. Tyler. Watt Tyler. Poll tax. Compulsory. Free will. Free offering. Burnt offering. Poker. Poke. End of dance. Termination. L-Y. Adverb. Part of speech. Part of a man. Taylor. Measurer. Theodolite. Theophilus. Billus. Fillmore. More fuel. The flame. Flambeau. Bow. Arrow. Pierce. Hurt. Feeling. Wound. Soldier. Cannon. Buchanan. Rebuke. Official censor. To officiate. Wedding. Linked. Lincoln. Civil service. Ward politician. Stop em. Stop procession. Tough boy. Little Ben. Harry. Harrison. Tip a canoe. Tariff two. Knapsack. Warfield. The funnel. Windpipe. Throat. Quincy. Quincy Adams. Quince. Fine fruit. The fine boy. Sailor boy. Sailor. Jack Tar. Jackson. Stonewall. Indomitable. Tough make. Oaken furniture. Bureau. Van Buren. Rent. Link. Stroll. Seashore. Take. Give. Grant. Award. School premium. Examination. Cramming. Fagging. Laborer. Hayfield. Hayes. Hazy. Clear. Vivid. Brightly lighted. Campfire. Warfield. Garfield. Gutow. Murderer. Prisoner. Prison fair. Half fed. Well fed. Well read. Author. Arthur. Round table. Teacup. Half full. Divide. Cleave. Cleveland. City of Cleveland. Two. Twice. The heavy shell. Mollusk. Unfamiliar word. Dictionary. Johnson's. Johnson. Sun. Bad son. Thievish bay. Dishonest boy. Back. Mac. McKinley. Kill. Salgaz. Z's. C's. Ruffian. Rough rider. Ruse. Roosevelt. Size. Heavy. Fat. Taft. It will be noted that some of the date words as free will only give three figures of the date, 845, but it is to be supposed that if the student knows that many figures in the date of Polk's inauguration, he can guess the other one. The curious thing about this system will now become apparent. If the reader has learned the series so that he can say it down from President to Taft, he can do with no effort, and without any further preparation, say it backwards from Taft up to the commencement. There could be no better proof that this is the natural mnemonic system. It proves itself by its works. The series should be repeated backward and forward every day for a month, and should be supplemented by a series of the reader's own making, and by this one which gives the numbers 0 to 100 and which must be chained together before they can be learned. 0. Hose. 1. Wheat. 2. Hen. 3. Home. 4. Hair. 5. Oil. 6. Shoe. 7. Hook. 8. Off. 9. Bee. 10. Daisy. 11. Tooth. 12. Dine. 13. Time. 14. Tower. 15. Dell. 16. Ditch. 17. Duck. 18. Dove. 21. Hand. 19. Tabby. 20. Hyenas. 22. None. 23. Name. 24. Owner. 25. Nail. 26. Hinge. 27. Ink. 28. Knife. 29. Knob. 30. Muse. 31. Mayday. 32. Hymen. 33. Mama. 34. Mare. 35 mil, 36 image, 37 mug, 38 muff, 39 mob, 40 race, 41 heart, 42 horn, 43 army, 44 warrior, 45 royal, 46 arch, 47 rock, 48 wharf, 49 rope, 
fifty wheels, fifty one lad, fifty two lion, fifty three lamb, fifty four lair, fifty five lily, fifty six lodge, fifty seven lake, fifty eight leaf, fifty nine elbow, sixty chess, sixty one cheat, sixty two chain, sixty three sham, sixty four chair, sixty five jail, sixty six judge, sixty seven jockey, sixty eight shaves, sixty nine ship, seventy eggs, seventy one gate, seventy two gun, seventy three comb, seventy four hawker, seventy five coal, seventy six cage, seventy seven cake, seventy eight coffee, seventy nine cube, eighty vase, eighty one feet, eighty two vein, eighty three fame, eighty four fire, eighty five vile, eighty six fish, eighty seven fig, eighty eight fife, eighty nine fib, ninety piles, ninety one putty, ninety two pain, ninety three bomb, ninety four beer, ninety five bell, ninety six peach, ninety eight beef, ninety seven book, ninety nine pope, one hundred dioceses. By the use of this table, which should be committed as thoroughly as the President series, so that it can be repeated backward and forward, any date, figure, or number can be at once constructed and bound by the usual chain to the fact which you wish it to accompany. When the student wishes to go farther and attack larger problems than the simple binding of two facts together, there is little in Loisette's system that is new, although there is much that is good. If it is a book that is to be learned as one would prepare for an examination, each chapter is to be considered separately. Of each an epitome is to be written in which the writer must exercise all of his ingenuity to reduce the matter in hand to its final skeleton of fact. This he is to commit to memory both by the use of the chain and the old system of interrogation. Suppose after much labor through a wide space of language one boils a chapter or an event down to the final irreducible sediment. Magna Carta was exacted by the barons from King John at Runnymede. You must now turn the statement this way and that way, asking yourself about it every possible and impossible question, gravely considering the answers, and if you find any part of it especially difficult to remember, chaining it to the question which will bring it about. Thus, what was exacted by the barons from King John at Runnymede? Magna Carta. By whom was Magna Carta extracted from King John at Runnymede? By the barons. From whom was, etc., etc., King John? From what king, etc., etc., King John? Where was Magna Carta, etc., etc., at Runnymede? And so on and so on, as long as your ingenuity can suggest questions to ask or points of view from which to consider the statement, your mind will finally saturate with the information and prepare to spill it out at the first squeeze of the examiner. This, however, is not new. It was taught in the schools hundreds of years before Loisette was born. Old newspaper men will recall in connection with it Horace Greeley's statement that the test of a news item was the clear and satisfactory manner in which a report answers the inter interrogatories, what, when, where, who, and why. In the same way, Loisette advises the learning of poetry. For example, the Assyrian came down like the wolf on the fold. Who came down? How did the Assyrian come down? Like what animal did? Etc. And so on and so on until the verses are exhausted of every scrap of information to be had out of them by the most assiduous cross-examination. Whatever the reader may think of the availability or value of this part of the system, there are so many easily applicable tests of the worth of much that Loisette has done that it may be taken with the rest. For example, to give an easy example, can remember the value of the ratio between the circumference and the diameter of the circle beyond four places of decimals, or at most six, 3.141592. Here is the value to 108 decimal places. 3.141592654338.4626435.10592394198.6402861976.7982001786.7982001786.7982001786.7982001786.7982001786.7982001786.7982001786.7982001786.7982001786.7982001786.7982001786.7982001786.7982001786.7982001786.7982001786.7982001786
Now translate each significant into its proper value and you have the task accomplished. Mother Day M3 THL R4 D1 and so on. Learn the lines one at a time by the method of interrogatories. Who will buy any shawl? Which Mrs. Day will buy a shawl? Is Mother Day particular about the sort of shawl she will buy? Has she bought a shawl? Etc. Etc. Then cement the end of each line to the beginning of the next one. Thus, shawl, warm garment, warmth, love, my love, and go on as before. Stupid as the work may seem to you, you can memorize the figures in 15 minutes this way so that you will not forget them in 15 years. Similarly, you can take Hayden's Dictionary of Dates and turn fact after fact into nonsense lines like these which you cannot lose. And this ought to be enough to show anybody the whole art. If you look back across the sands of time and find out that it is that ridiculous old 30 days past September which comes to you when you are trying to think of the length of October, if you can quote your old prosody, O dater ambiguous, etc., with much more certainty than you can serve up your Horace, if in fine jingles and alliterations, wise and otherwise, have stayed with you, while solid and serviceable information has faded away, you may be certain that here is the key to the enigma of memory. You can apply it yourself in a hundred ways. If you wish to clinch in your mind the fact that Mr. Love lives at 485 Dearborn Street, what is more easy than to turn 485 into the word rifle and chain the ideas together? Say thus, love, happiness, good time, picnic, forest, wood, rangers, range, rifle range, rifle fine, weapon, costly weapon, dearly bought, Dearborn. Or if you wish to remember Mr. Bowman's name and you notice he has a mole on his face which is apt to attract your attention when you next see him, cement the ideas thus. Mole, Mark, Target, Archer, Bowman. End of section 21.